Preface and Chapter One of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bria Snow. The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. Preface. This work was begun soon after the appearance of the Young Man's Guide and was partly announced to the public. For reasons, however, which I have not room to give in this place, it was thought proper to defer its publication till the appearance of several other volumes in the same spirit, involving more particularly the other relative duties. I wish to have it distinctly understood that I do not propose to give a complete manual of the social and moral duties of young women. Each one has his own way of looking at things, and I have mine. Some of the duties of young women have appeared to me to receive from other writers less attention than their comparative importance demands and others especially those which are connected with the great subject of temperance in all things i believe to be treated in several respects erroneously permit me however to say that while i have not intended to follow the path or repeat the ideas of any other writer i have not attempted to avoid either the one or the other for i have presented here and there a thought which had already come before the public like for my own pen i can only say that i did not intend it although i did not take special pains to avoid it the sum is this i have presented my thoughts without so much reference to what has already been said by myself or others as to what i have supposed to be the necessities of those for whom i write i have gone straight forward asking no questions and i trust i shall be dealt with in a manner equally direct chapter one explanation of terms it has been said and with no little truth that a large proportion of the disputes in the world might have been avoided had the disputants first settled the meaning of the terms they respectively used in like manner might a large share of the misapprehension and error in the world be avoided if those who attempt to teach would first explain their terms this work is called the young woman's guide to excellence because it is believed that excellence rather than happiness should be the leading aim of every human being i am not ignorant that happiness present and future is proposed as our being's end and aim not only as a distinguished a poet as alexander pope but also by as distinguished a philosopher as william paley but these men did not learn in the school of christ that our being's end and aim is happiness present or future the christian religion no less than christian philosophy and sound common sense teaches that holiness or excellence should be the leading aim of mankind not that the recompense of reward to which the best men of the world have had regard in all their conduct is to be wholly overlooked but only that it should not be too prominent in the mind's eye and too exclusively the soul's aim since it would thus be a more refined and more elevated selfishness real excellence brings happiness along with it like godliness which indeed is the same thing it has the promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come and that happiness which is attainable without personal excellence or holiness is either undeserved or spurious the world i know very generally seek after it whether deserved or undeserved whether willing or not to pay the price my object is to assist, if I can, in removing from our world the error of seeking happiness as a primary object. Let us but pursue excellence, and happiness will almost inevitably follow. I address the exhortation to young women in particular for reasons which will be seen when I come in the next chapter to speak of female responsibilities. Let every young woman aspire to high degrees of purity and excellence. Let her great aim be to be personally holy, like God her Saviour. To this end, and with this aim, let her be ready to set aside, if necessary, father and mother, and brother and sister, yes, and her own life also, assured that if she does it with a sacred regard to God and duty, all will be well. Let her but follow Christ according to the gospel plan, if it leads her to prison and death. But it will not thus lead her, for every self-denial or self-sacrifice involves she will secure as a general rule manifold more in this present life and in the world to come life everlasting this book is not called the young woman's guide with the expectation that she will consider it her only or even a principal guide 
the bible should be the principal guide of every person young or old male or female parents also are invaluable as guides i offer it only as the best guide which my reflections upon those subjects connected with the welfare of young women that come within the department of my study and observation enable me to give may it prove a good guide indeed i have called it the young woman's guide because there are many who are accustomed to associate with the word lady the idea of exemption from labour and of entire devotion to something supposed to be above it as fashionable company or fashionable dress and equipage and not a few can hardly hear the word mentioned without disgust miss sedgwick has illustrated this part of my subject very happily in the first and fifteenth chapters of her means and ends she says she does not write exclusively for those who are termed young ladies because she does not believe in any such fixed class in the country the term lady she also says is too indefinite for any valuable use we not only apply it to those who are or would be above labour but in a great many other ways as that old lady meaning perhaps some beggar at the door in short she does not like the use of the phrase young lady at all neither do i besides i like best the good old-fashioned term young woman this exactly represents the class for whom i write and that too without either explanation or qualification it will be mistaken by no one nor will it be likely to give or cause any offence finally i call the work the young woman's guide because i design it for those single persons of the female sex to whom the term young is usually applied viz those who are from twelve or fourteen to eighteen or twenty years of age and to those in general who are single i hope nevertheless that it will contain some thoughts which may be useful to those individuals who are in married life as well as those who are below the age of twelve years many of its suggestions and principles will indeed be applicable so far as they are just or true to all mankind end of chapter one chapter two of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain female responsibilities much has been said within a few years of the duties responsibilities of young men especially the young men of our republic a great deal that has been said has in my view been appropriate and well timed my own attention has been frequently turned to the same class of individuals nor do i regret it my only regret is that what i have said has not been said to better purpose counsels and cautions to young men standing on slippery places as they confessedly do can hardly be too numerous provided those who give them use discretion and remember their responsibility not only to the tribunal of public opinion but to a tribunal still higher the snares the dangers the difficulties the influence the responsibilities of young men at least in the united states can hardly be overrated would that they could be so trained and directed as to fully understand them and govern themselves accordingly would that they could be made to exert that moral influence in the salvation of our race politically no less than morally nationally no less than individually of which they are so capable yet after every concession of this kind i am compelled to believe that responsibilities and influence of young women to say nothing at present of their dangers are much more weighty than those of young men i am decidedly of the opinion that the future holiness and happiness of the world in which we live depends much more on the character of the rising generation of the female sex than on the character of our young men it was said by dr rush long ago that mothers and schoolmasters plant the seeds of nearly all the good and evil in our world presuming that by schoolmasters he meant teachers of both sexes will any one doubt the truth of his assertion will any one doubt the justness of remark in the late western review that if this world is ever to become a better and happier world woman must be foremost if not the principal agent in rendering it so but as mothers are never mothers till they have been daughters is it not obvious that the right education of these last is as great a work as any to which human mind and human effort have ever been called if woman moves the world intellectually morally and even in effect politically as no doubt she does is it not of primary importance that she should be taught as well as teach herself to move it right 
can it be necessary to advert in this place to the well-known and acknowledged fact that almost every man of extensive influence for good or for evil whom the world has produced became what he was through maternal influence caesar and caligula and talleyrand and napoleon became what they were in consequence of their mothers no less than alfred and doddridge and howard and washington for let it not be forgotten that mothers and teachers according to dr rush and in fact according to common observation too plant the seeds of the world of evil no less than of the world of good how exceedingly important then that they should be well educated from whom in the language of another writer our virtues are and from whom our vices may be we would add must be derived at least in no small proportion but i am using the term education without explaining it let me then ere i proceed to say more on the subject of female responsibility explain what i mean by education especially female education mere instruction in the sciences is indeed education it is however but a very small part of it to educate is to train up in this view all are of course educated and everything which has an influence in developing mind or body and in training up either for good or for evil is entitled justly to the name of education but if the above definition be just if whatever concerns our development or the formation of any part of our character physical intellectual social or moral is education then it must follow that there are two kinds of education bad and good all persons places and things which affect us and what does not affect us and influence us for good or for evil must educate us i am aware that this definition is not new still it is not generally received or if received not generally acted upon there is still an almost universal cling to the old inadequate incorrect idea that the principal part of education consists in the cultivation of the intellect and that too by set lessons received for the most part at the schools the true idea of education therefore must be continually enforced till it becomes common property and until mankind act as if they believe what they profess in regard to it when solomon says train up a child in the way he should go he is talking of what i call education and the kind of education which he is recommending is good education i don't believe he had the schools in his mind the infant school the sabbath school the common school the high school or the university far be it from me to attempt to detract from the value of our schools on the contrary i regard them as of inestimable worth when duly attended to what i insist on is that they are not the all in all of education and that in fact the influence in training up or forming good character is so trifling that is comparatively they scarcely deserve to be thought of when speaking of education as a whole especially the education of daughters and though one of the tribes of the nation to which solomon belonged over which he reigned and for whom in particular he wrote is said to have been schoolmasters by profession and another priest i can hardly conceive that when he was inspired to give the educational advice just alluded to he ever turned so much as a thought to the little corner of palestine allotted to simeon or to the levites in their respective but more scattered station solomon was in all probability addressing himself chiefly to the fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers and all other relatives of israel the class who by their united influence make the son and daughter and grandson and granddaughter what they are a blessing or a curse to the world in which they are to live for according as children are brought up by these teachers or by the influences which are shed upon them from day to day and from hour to hour so are they well or ill-educated if i have been successful in presenting the meaning of a term which is not frequently used in this book but almost everywhere else it will follow as a matter of course that i do not attach too much importance to the education of daughters themselves nor to their education as the teachers of others for if to educate is to form character what young woman can be found of any age or in any family who is not a teacher have young women often considered daughters especially how much they influence younger brothers and sisters if any such there are in the family where they dwell have they considered how much they sometimes influence the character and how much more they might do it 
not only of their schoolmates and playmates but also of their more aged friends and companions their parents grandparents and others i could tell them were this the place for it many a true story of reading daughters who have been the means of awakening in their aged parents or grandparents or other friends a taste for reading which they might otherwise have gone down to the grave without acquiring it i could tell them of many a father and mother and grandfather and grandmother grown grey in vice hardened even by intemperance as well as other vices who have been reformed by the prattle or the reproof or the prayers of a good daughter is not such a daughter a teacher but i am most anxious to convince young women of their responsibilities in regard to the rising generation especially their own brothers and companions i am anxious if i can to convince all who read this volume that god has by his providence committed to their charge in no small degree the bodies and minds and the souls of those with whom in this world they are associated that according to their own contact good or ill will be in no small measure the health and knowledge and excellence of their friends and companions that according to their efforts attended either by the blessing of god or the tokens of his displeasure will be the condition of millions for time and for eternity but is it so are daughters of daughters merely to say nothing as yet of maternal influence are daughters thus influential is it true that the destiny of millions is thus committed to their keeping i have seen the conduct of a whole school i speak now of the common or district school graduated by the conduct of a single virtuous and amiable and intelligent young woman not twelve years old who attended it i have seen a whole sabbath school not a little less affected by the prompt attention to chorus behaviour and pious example of some elder member of an older class to whom the younger members of classes male and female looked up as to a sort of monitor or i know not what to call it for the impression thus made is better seen and felt than described the bad behaviour of a young woman in these circumstances is indeed equally influentially nay more so inasmuch as the current of human nature sets more readily downward than upward still a good example is influential greatly so would that it were generally known how much so suppose now that by your good behaviour and pious example in the sabbath school you are the means of turning the attention of one younger companion male or female to serious things and of bringing down upon that young person the blessing of almighty god suppose that individual should live to teach or to preach or in some other form to bless the world by bringing numbers to the knowledge and love and inculcation of the very truth which has saved his own soul and these last in their turn should become apostles or missionaries to others and so on is there any end at least till the world comes to an end of the good influence to which a good sabbath school pupil may exert but this is something more than a supposed case is it not in effect just what is actually taking place around us in the world continually indeed that a long train of good influences has been frequently set a going in the sabbath school for sabbath schools are but of recent origin but people have always been led along to virtue or vice to piety or impiety to bless the world or to prove a curse to it by one another a word or look from a relative or friend or acquaintance in the school or somewhere else has often given a turn to the whole character a word it is said may move a continent something less than a word a look or smile of approbation may move more than a continent it may move not merely a west but an alexander a caesar a napoleon a washington and a howard men who in their turn moved a world i have spoken of the influence which a young woman may have on millions through the medium of the sabbath school but if she may influence in this way the millions of those who are to come after her how much more may she do in forming character for the great future in the family her presence in the sabbath school is only once a week an hour or two a day once in seven days whereas her influence in the family is going on perpetually the clothes of alexander the great are said to have been made to a great extent by his sisters and those of augustus caesar were made for many years by his can we doubt that these young females were influential in a great many respects in the education of these conquerors what could the latter have done but for the assistance and influence of mothers and sisters and can we have any alexanders 
and caesars at the present day to carry on the moral and intellectual conquests which are so necessary in the world without the age and cooperation of mothers and sisters sisters little know it is almost impossible for them to know how much they do to bring about results to educate their brothers and friends for the work which they perform whether good or evil the sisters of franklin little knew what they were doing for young benny as they called him while they assisted their mother in taking care of his clothes in preparing his food and in ministering to his other physical wants yes and to the wants of his mind too who can say that benjamin franklin would ever have been what benjamin franklin was without their aid joined to the efforts of their mother many a young female having caught in some degree the spirit of doing good has sighed for opportunities what can i do she has seemed to say here at home if i could be a missionary at ceylon or south africa or the sandwich islands or even if i could be a teacher i could perhaps do something but as it is i must remain a mere cipher in the world i would do good but i have no opportunities she who says this is undoubtedly sincere she is however greatly mistaken her opportunities for doing good for exerting an influence to bless her race are neither few nor small there is indeed a difference a very great difference in human conditions and circumstances and yet i am persuaded no female is so secluded as not to be able to fulfil towards her race a most important mission i know of an excellent female who is often heard lamenting her want of opportunities for usefulness she has the spirit of doing good as she supposes and as i fully believe and yet she is miserable she makes herself so by repining continually as her want of ability to perform the good work which her heart meditates she would rejoice to devote herself to the elevation of her race she would gladly go to india or the south seas if her aged and uncultivated intellect did not exclude her from being a candidate now without saying a word in disparagement of foreign missions the success of which i would gladly contribute largely not only by prayers but by pecuniary contributions truth compels me to say of this female that i am by no means sure that she could do more for humanity or more in fact for the cause of christ by a foreign mission than she is doing by a domestic one the domestic mission hers indeed is in the fullest sense of the term she is an ordinary domestic and no more in the family to which she belongs but what is the condition of that family the head of it is the distinguished teacher of a private female seminary here he has prepared hundreds of young women so far i mean as the mere instruction of what he calls a family school is concerned for usefulness as teachers as sisters as ministered to the age and as mothers to the young suppose he has instructed in his comparative excellent way two hundred females suppose again one half of the females he has instructed and counselled and lived among should in their turn each form as much character as he has already done and he is yet but a middle-aged man and suppose half the disciples of each of these pupils should do the same and thus on till the year of our lord two thousand only which is as we have reason to believe but a little way towards the end of the world suppose one hundred only of each two hundred should live to have influence seventy-five of them as the mothers of families of the usual size and twenty-five only as teachers there will then be five generations in one hundred and sixty years and the number of children which will come under the influence of this line or succession of mothers and teachers will be no less than ninety millions a number equal to six times the present population of the united states now what i have here supposed is by no means beyond the pale of possibility two hundred pupils is not a large number for one teacher to instruct during his whole life nor is twenty-five a large proportion of two hundred to become teachers nor is seventy-five a large number in two hundred to live to have families nor two children in each family upon an average a very large number to come to maturity and have families in their turn besides i have reckoned but four generations in one hundred and sixty years exclusive of that now educating so that i have kept my estimates within due bounds in every respect do you ask what the domestic of whom i have spoken has to do with all this i answer very much very much indeed has she not vented to the teacher in whose employ she has been that kind of services without which he could not have followed his occupation 
and if ninety millions or even one tenth that number of citizens should in the course of the next two centuries reap the benefit of his labours and become lights in the world is it too much to say that she has been an important aid in accomplishing the work nay it is even too much to affirm that unless the part which she has acted had been performed by her or somebody else the school could not have gone on and two hundred young women could not have received the teacher's instructions why then is not this humble domestic to whom i allude a benefactor to her race if a benefaction it is to raise up and qualify for usefulness two hundred females as well as he who has the credit of it i will not indeed say that any thing like as much credit is due to her as to him but i may say and with truth that she was an important auxiliary in producing the results which have been mentioned but if a humble domestic one who imagines herself so obscure as to be of little service to a world which perhaps estimates her services almost as low as she does herself if such an individual may besides the general influence of her character upon a family be an indispensable aid on the work of sending forth to the world a host of female missionaries equal in the progress of less than two centuries centuries at the dawn of the millennium to ninety millions what may not be done by a sister in a well-ordered family one who is not only well educated and governed herself but who educates and governs others as well it may indeed be said that a domestic in the family of a distinguished teacher may directly influence by her labours in the way i have mentioned a far greater number of her race than most sisters are able to do it may indeed be so there is however another consideration it is chiefly the externals of education which can receive attention even in our best private schools little can be done at the best to form character deep permanent and abiding character blessings indeed great blessings such schools are but in proportion as their numbers are increased beyond those of our larger families in the same proportion is the influence which might be exerted by the teacher scattered and weakened whereas if the number be small the influence of those who teach by example and by precept is concentrated and rendered efficient there is no certainty that the feeble uh, influence which is exerted on ninety millions might do more good by being concentrated on one tenth or one twentieth that number in other words if the same amount of pains were taken by mothers and sisters and the same amount of labour bestowed for the purpose there is no certainty that the world might not as soon be rendered what it should be through the medium of family education alone as with the aid of other influences christianity when brought to bear upon the family by the united exertions father mother brothers and sisters will probably have an influence on the regeneration of the world of which no human mind uninspired at least has ever yet conceived would that our young females sisters especially had but an imperfect conception of the power they possessed to labour in the cause of human improvement would that they had an, but an imperfect idea of female responsibility my remarks are applicable to all young women but they are particularly so to elder sisters to them is given in special charge the happiness and the destiny of all younger brothers and sisters be they ever so numerous as the desires of abel were to be expressed to cain and the latter was appointed to rule over the former so is the elder daughter appointed to rule over those whom god has in the same manner committed to her trust happy is she who has right views of her weighty responsibilities but thrice happy is she who not only understands her duty but does it but if the moral character much more than the physical and intellectual well-being of the family is given in charge to elder sisters and even to all sisters it is scarcely possible for them to form a correct idea of the weight of their influence in this respect at least till they are past the age when that influence is most necessary most persuasive and most effectual i have seldom found a young man who had strayed long and widely from the path of virtue who had enjoyed the society and influence of a wise and virtuous and attentive sister on the contrary i have almost uniformly found such individuals to have been in families where there were no sisters or where the sisters were not what they ought to have been or have been kept in schools where there were none but our sex i beseech every young female reader to make herself acquainted as far as she possibly can 
with the nature of her influence and the consequent responsibilities which devolve upon her let her understand that the day has gone by in which physical force was supposed to rule the world moral influence is now the order of the day and they whose moral influence is most weighty and powerful are they who most effectually bear rule but as it is reserved for women when sensible enlightened virtuous and pious to exercise the most weighty moral influence consequently it is her province to most effectually bear rule kings and emperors and presidents parliaments and congresses and assemblies and courts and legislators and judges may labour in vain to influence or to reform mankind so long as female influence is not what it should be but let females be rightly educated and let them do what a good education will enable them to do and vice will ere long hang her head virtue and piety which alone exalt a nation or the individuals that compose it will resume their sway then will the wilderness and solitary place be glad and the desert rejoice and blossom as the rose end of chapter two Chapter Three of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Self-education. Woman, though now so often miseducated, must be trained in the way she should go. But let us consider a little more in detail what this education or training of woman should be and what it should accomplish. When Agesilaus, king of Sparta, was asked what things he thought most proper for boys to learn, he replied those which they ought to practise when they come to be men nor does this essentially differ from the direction of solomon which has been quoted if females do in effect rule the world they ought as i have said before to be trained to sway the sceptre of moral rule in the right manner if they now stand in the same position as regards the world and the world's happiness with that which boys were supposed to occupy in the days of Agesilaus and if this thing was correct in his opinion then it follows that a proper answer to the question what things are most proper for girls to learn would be those which they ought to practise when they come to be women but it will not be forgotten that the definition i have given of the term education includes much more than merely direct efforts to teach whatever affects the health or the progress of body mind or soul even though it were that in which the individual is mostly passive as in sleep is a part of our education there is one point in which the views of agesilaus concerning education if not incorrect are at least defective he appears to countenance an idea still very prevalent that children and youth are not only in a state of preparation for the future but in a state of preparation merely they are taught what they ought to practise when they come to be men according to agesilaus but according to the views of one who was wiser than he they are to be trained in the way they ought to go the latter view comes nearer the truth of the case than the former it requires or at least permits us to train the child to-day for the enjoyments of to-day as well as for those of to-morrow a point which the maxim of agesilaus does not seem to include young people are taught almost universally by example if not by precept to consider merit if not virtue and happiness as belonging exclusively to maturity they are not enough assured that youth though a state of preparation and trial is also a state of reward and that neither usefulness nor happiness is confined to place age or circumstances i wish to see the day arrive when the young young woman especially will not look forward so much to a distant day and to distant circumstances for theatre of action and for the rewards of action as they are accustomed to do for they thus deprive themselves of a vast amount of happiness which is due them in the present without at least enhancing the value or the pleasures of the future i wish to see them so educated that they will not only be what they should be when they come to adult age but also what they should be now they have or should have a character to acquire now a reputation to secure and maintain now a sphere of personal usefulness and happiness to occupy now it is true indeed that childhood and youth are more specially seasons of preparation and less specially seasons of reward than maturer and later life but it is also equally true that every stage of life not excepting its very evening 
is little more than a preparation for a still higher state where reward will predominate in a degree which will make all previous preparations seem to dwindle almost to nothing existence in short is a state of progress having at each step so far as we know its trials and rewards the rewards always however predominating and the trials diminishing in proportion as personal holiness renders the latter unnecessary it will happen unavoidably that many young women to whom this little volume may come will have been trained up to the time of their casting their eyes on these pages in the old-fashioned belief to which i have alluded viz that they can neither do nor be much in the world except to submit passively to certain processes which have received the name of education till their arrival at a certain size or age the fault reader if such should be the case is not chargeable solely on your parents they followed a custom which they found they did not make it but however this may be it is clear that your great object should be now to see what you can do for yourself now then here you are twelve fourteen perhaps sixteen years of age your parents have brought you up according to the existing customs for the future they have not sought to make you feel your present responsibilities your present power to do good your present capacity for communicating and securing happiness so much as to make you believe there are responsibilities and powers and capacities and rewards to be yours when you become to be large enough and old enough to appreciate or receive them but whatever your parents may have left undone in regard to the formation of your character it is yours to do need i urge the necessity of the case the present is a, an exceedingly important period in your life and what is to be done must be done quickly but what your parents have hitherto left undone they will be likely to continue to live undone the less you apply yourself therefore and that immediately to the finishing of a work that owing to the circumstances in which they have been and still are placed and the views they have entertained they have left unfinished your education is not likely to be by any means so perfect as it should be you must take it up therefore where they have left it and do for yourself what they have not done for you in other words you must engage at once in the great work of self-education it may indeed be the case that you are the child of parents who have done their best and who have done it intelligently blessed is the young woman who has such parents but thrice blessed are the parents themselves if in the performance of their work they have the cooperation of the daughter there must be self-education even where they are the best of parents in fact the work of parental training and that of self-education should go on together they cannot well be separated parental effort will produce but half its legitimate results when not seconded by the efforts of infancy and childhood and especially of youth the reasons for this are so obvious that they hardly need to be repeated no young woman can be constantly in the company of her mother no mother can constantly watch over her daughter in the best families there are hours of each day when the child of every age especially of youthful age and capacity must be left to herself or to the influence of others what then is to become of her is she to yield to that current of the world to which everywhere sets downward you will say perhaps that she has good habit on her side together with the counsels of good and kind parents if so i say again she is highly favoured what if it happens to be otherwise what if the parents happen not to be wise and discriminating or seem unable to find time in the bustle of a busy world to do that which they know it were desirable to do what then i repeat the sentiment then if you have the best of parents you are liable at your age to be thrown day after day into new and untried circumstances such as it were next to impossible for parents to foresee new feelings will arise unknown to yourselves and undiscoverable by them new passions will make their appearance new temptations will solicit new trials will be allotted you in spite of the best parental efforts to education there will still remain to you a great work of self-effort to assist you in it is the leading object of this little volume it is not a substitute for parental counsels it is not a substitute for your own reflections if it proved not an aid to parents in their task and if it encouraged not the reflection and the self-efforts of the young it will not accomplish its object in the preceding chapter i have endeavoured to give a general idea of education as i understand and use the term in this i have shown that no small part of the great work of education devolves in the best circumstances 
and much more in circumstances which are unfavourable upon the daughter i have shown that her whole life is a state of preparation indeed but also in some measure a state of reward you perceive your own character and happiness for time and for eternity to be placed in no small degree and measure in your own hands the efforts of parents friends and teachers to the contrary notwithstanding you perceive the formation of that character by the combined efforts of your parents and others yourself to constitute the work of your education you perceive yourself capable at least i hope you do of everlasting progress of approaching the great source of light and truth and knowledge and excellence for ever and ever though without the possibility of attaining it you perceive that though allied on the one side the dust you tread on you are allied on the other side to heaven that though connected by ties of consanguinity to the worm you are also connected or may be with angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim in the glorious work of unceasing progress upwards towards the throne of god will you not then hail with joy every effort of every being who would assist your spirit in its upward flight to educate yourself to make progress to ascend toward the eternal throne you must know yourself the laws within and without you your relations by means of those laws to other things and other beings your powers your capacities your prerogatives you must moreover know how to govern yourself in accordance with your knowledge End of chapter three chapter four of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain love of improvement i have already said that you are capable of never-ending progress in knowledge and education and that it is alike your interest and your duty to aspire to that perfection for which god has given you capabilities the object of the present chapter is to kindle within you a desire to make progress in everything you do to go on as the scripture expresses it to perfection whatever is worth doing is worth doing well is an old but true maxim more than even this might be affirmed whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing in the best possible manner no matter how well you have done the same thing heretofore no matter how much more perfectly you already do it than your neighbours you are not to make the past of your own experience or the present of your neighbours the measure of your conduct the question is how well can i perform this particular act now perhaps no person who reads this paragraph will doubt the truth of the general principle i have laid down thus far it may be said all seems to be correct we are indeed bound to do everything we do to the glory of god and he can hardly be glorified in the doing of a thing in a manner which is short the best in our power yet when we come to apply the principle and say in what particulars we should strive to make progress and do better from day to day and from hour to hour if the thing is to be performed so often many an individual will be found i fear to stand back and among those who thus shrink from the just application of admitted principle will be found not a few who till now suppose they had within them a strong desire for perpetual improvement it is my young friends no trifling matter to have burning within a hearty desire for eternal progress it is no small thing to do whatever our hands find to do which is fit that an intelligent being one who belongs to the family of christ should do in such a manner that it will contribute to the glory of god and the good of mankind and yet less than this as christians or even rational and immortal beings we cannot do i know indeed that many who profess to be the disciples of christ actually do less than this i know there are hundreds and thousands who are called by his worthy name and who seem to be almost above the liability to do that which could be regarded as positively wrong who nevertheless are very far from striving to do everything which their hands find to do with all their might or in other words as well as they possibly can but it is to be hoped that the standard of christian character will ere long be much higher than it is now it is of far less consequence what we do in the world my young friends than how well we do it there is hardly a useful occupation among us in which a person may not be eminently serviceable to himself and to mankind 
there is hardly one in which we may not constantly improve ourselves there is hardly one which will not afford us the means and opportunities of improving others there is hardly an occupation which may not itself be essentially improved i do not mean to say there is no choice in occupations as either regards pleasantness or usefulness nor do i mean to say that neither parents themselves nor their children are ever to consult their own natural preferences their own likes and dislikes all i aim at is to convince the young and especially the young woman that the old couplet honour and shame from no condition rise act well your part there all the honour lies is not so very far from the truth as many suppose and that happiness even usefulness and excellence are as little dependent on place and condition as honour and shame a mercantile man with whom i was once acquainted gave me in few words a very important lesson he said he made it the rule of his life to do in the best possible manner whatever at any time seemed as a subject of duty to devolve upon him no matter about his own likes or dislikes what appeared to be in the course of the dispensations of providence allotted him for the day he performed with all his heart if he should conclude to pursue his present business for life as the means of procuring a livelihood this would be the very best course on preparation if otherwise it was the best under the circumstances and especially it was the best state of mental and moral discipline with which he could be furnished to neglect the business before us because we are unhappy in it or at least not so happy as we fancy we might be in some other employment is to oppose the plans of providence nay even to defeat our own purpose it is to disqualify ourselves as fast as we can for faithfulness and consequently for usefulness in the employment we desire should we ever attain to it the wisest course is to do what our hands find before them to do provided it is lawful to do at all with all our might the best possible preparation a young woman can have for a sphere of action more congenial to her present feelings is the one she now occupies she has at least duties to herself to perform let these as they recur be performed in the best possible manner and let the utmost effort always be made to perform everything a little better than she ever performed it before if it be but the washing of a few cups or the making of a bed whatever her personal duties are generally need not now be said first because many of them are obvious secondly because they will be treated of in their respective places but it should ever be borne in mind that there is nothing ever so trifling which is worth doing at all that may not be done better and better at every repetition of the act and that there is no occupation which may not in itself be improved indefinitely rising in the morning devotion personal ablutions dressing breakfasting exercise employments recreation dining conversation reading reflections all these and a thousand other things which every one as a general rule attends to may be performed in a manner to correspond more and more with the scripture direction which has been illustrated there are in respect to what i am now mentioning two classes of persons in the world females as well as males and they differ from each other as widely almost as the world of happiness from the world of misery one of these classes lives to receive is selfish supremely so the other lives to communicate more or less to do good to make the world around it better the last class is benevolent a person of either class is not necessarily indolent or inactive but the end and aim of the labours of one are herself while the other labours for god and mankind the one procures honey from every flower formed by our hands but not a flower does she ever raise by the labour of her own hands if she can possibly avoid it the one lives only to enjoy the other to be the continual cause of joy like her creator the latter has a source of happiness within the former depends for happiness on others leave her alone or amid a frowning or even an indifferent world and she is miserable would that i could reach the ears of that numerous class who are dependent on the world around them for their happiness who never originated any good and are becoming more and more useless every day would that i could make them believe that true happiness is not to be found externally unless it first exists in their own bosoms would that i could convince them that the royal road to happiness if there be one 
is that which has been alluded to in the preceding paragraphs in making all persons and things around us better in transmuting as it were under the influence of the gospel all coarser things around us to apples of gold in pitchers of silver i long exceedingly to see our young women filled with the desire of improvement physical social intellectual and moral i long to see their souls glowing with the desire to go about doing good like the lord and master not indeed literally as i shall have occasion to say in another place but i long to have their hearts expand to overflowing with love to the world for whom christ died and i wish to have some of the tears of their compassion fall on those over whom god has given them an amazing and often an unlimited influence could i hope to reach a dozen minds and warm a dozen hearts which had otherwise remained congealed or at most received passively the little stream of happiness which a naked external world affords them without any corresponding efforts to form a world of their own could i be the means of enkindling in them that love for everlasting progress towards perfection which is so essential to the world's true happiness and their own could i thus aid in setting in motion an undercurrent which should in due time restore us to eden in all its primitive unfallen beauty and excellence how should i be repaid for these labours i will dare to hope for the best if i have the sacred fire burning in my own bosom i will hope to be the means of enkindling it in the bosom of a few readers if my own soul glows with love to a fallen world i will dare to hope that a few at least of those souls who are more particularly made for love and sympathy will be led to the same source of blessedness end of chapter four chapter five of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain self-knowledge self-knowledge is of the utmost importance to every human being to no person however is it more important than to the young woman it is the more necessary to urge the importance of self-knowledge than the fact that it is a species of knowledge which every one claims and which she would deem it almost a reflection upon her character to be supposed not to possess while it is that very knowledge of which almost every one of both sexes is exceedingly ignorant such a one understands himself is deemed quite a compliment among our sex nor is it wholly disregarded by the other but this expression is too often meant no more than a knowledge of the petty acts and shifts and i might say tricks by means of which men and women contrive to pass current in the fashionable world how much this kind of self-acquaintance is worth is too obvious to need illustration i have represented a just self-knowledge as of very great importance but it is a science of vast extent as well as of vast importance a thorough knowledge of oneself includes first knowledge of man in general in his whole character compounded as it is and in all his relations to surrounding beings and things and secondly a knowledge of the peculiarities produced by particular circumstances condition mode of life education and habits she who merely understands all the little arts to which i have alluded which enable us to pass current for fashionable and grossly wicked world find her self-knowledge exceedingly small when she comes to compare it with the standard of self-acquaintance set up by such writers as mason berg watts etc and above all when she comes to compare it with the standard of the bible how little nay how contemptible will all mere worldly arts and shifts appear things which at most belong to the department of manners when she comes to understand her threefold nature as exhibited by the natural and revealed laws of jehovah the subjects of anatomy physiology and hygiene alone and they teach us little more than the laws and relations of the mere body or shell of the human being are almost sufficient for the study of a long life and yet no individual can ever thoroughly understand herself without them it is impossible anatomy shows the structure of the body which the psalmist long ago taught us was fearfully and wonderfully made physiology teaches us the laws by which the living machine operates is kept in play for seventy eighty or a hundred years and hygiene teaches us the relations of the living moving body to surrounding beings and objects this indeed is a knowledge which few young women possess 
and yet it is a knowledge to which no young woman who would do her utmost in the work of self-education can dispense with she wishes perhaps to improve her voice by conversation reading and singing but is she qualified to do this in the best possible manner while she is wholly ignorant of the structure of the lungs the windpipe and the forces as they are called part so intimately concerned in the production of voice and speech she wishes perhaps to develop and invigorate her muscular system in the highest possible degree but how can she do this while she knows almost nothing of the nature or power of the muscular fibre she wishes to develop and cultivate her intellectual powers to acquire firmness of nerve and energy of thought but how can she do it if she is ignorant of the situation and functions of the cerebral and nervous system that wonderful organ of the intellect she would train her eye in the best possible manner but how can she do it if she is ignorant of the nature and powers of that wonderful little organ she would educate properly all her senses but how can she do it without a knowledge of their structure functions and relations perhaps she would study the philosophy of dress and of eating and drinking how can she do so till she understands intimately the relation of the human system to air heat the various kinds of food and drink etc she would know still further the relation of body to mind and of mind to body of body and mind to spirit and of spirit to body and mind she would study the particular effect of one passion or faculty or affection upon the body or upon particular functions of the bodily system and the more remote or more immediate effects of diseases of a bodily organ on mind and spirit she must know all this if a thousand times yea ten thousand times as much before she is qualified to go far in the work of self-knowledge but she must go beyond even all this and study her own peculiarities it is not sufficient to understand the general laws and relations of the human economy she must understand herself in her own individual character physically intellectually and morally she must understand the peculiarities of her physical frame of her mental structure and of her spiritual condition her relation to other spirits particularly to the father of spirits how amazing how extensive i repeat the science of self-knowledge to be perfect in it we need the life of a methuselah but something may be done even in a short period of seventy years and if it be but little that we can do in a lifetime this consideration only enhances the value of that little something i have said may be done in a short period of seventy years but i might say more something may be done in a single day and years are made up of days a little done every day amounts to much in a whole year let not the individual despair she can get but one new idea respecting herself in a day if she can sit down a quiet evening and say i know something respecting myself which i did not know last night at this time let her be assured that the day is not lost one idea a day is three hundred and sixty five a year and three hundred and sixty five a year amount in seventy years to twenty five thousand five hundred and fifty there are those who can hardly be said at seventy years of age to have twenty five thousand five hundred and fifty ideas in their head it is a matter of joy to every friend of self-knowledge that so many means have been of late years devised to facilitate the study of this science the lectures which have been given to both sexes on the structure laws and relations of their bodily constitution and the books which have been written have made a considerable change in the state of the public sentiment respecting this new species of knowledge for it is not they alone who have heard or read that have reaped the benefit of hearing and reading on this subject many a parent or teacher aware that such instructions and books were abroad has been encouraged to the performance of that which he might not have dared to do had nothing been said or done to encourage her every young woman should therefore study these subjects for herself such books as those of mrs sedgwick her poor rich man and rich poor man and her means and ends will prepare the way or will at least enkindle the desire for the kind of knowledge of which i am speaking she will then desire to read the works of the combers and perhaps along some of the other popular books of our days which treat of physiology and hygiene may i not venture to hope that at an early stage of her progress some of the chapters of this book will be found serviceable 
as well as several other works i have prepared especially the little volume called the house i live in she who having a hearty desire for improvement in self-knowledge on an extended scale lets her years pass without looking into any of the volumes or treatises to which i have referred can hardly be said to act up to the dignity of a christian of the nineteenth century but it is not the physical department of her nature alone that she who has had the desire for self-knowledge and self-progress should study such works as those of mason on self-knowledge berg on the dignity of human nature watts on the mind opie on detraction scandal wayland on moral science skinner on the religion of the bible etc etc should not only be perused but carefully studied it is to little purpose that is comparative that our physical nature is attentively and assiduously studied and cultivated if it lead not to the more intimate and more earnest study of the immortal spirit in this better department the spiritual permit me once more to direct your attention to the bible it should be studied chiefly without note or comment your own good sense brought to bear upon its simple unstudied unscholastic pages accompanied by that light from on high which is ever vouchsafed to the simple humble inquirer or learner will be of more value to you than all the notes and commentaries and dictionaries in the world without it it is a book which is most admirably adapted to the progress of all grades of mind those which are but little developed no less than those which are more highly cultivated other books speak to the intellect to the head this speaks to the heart other books often plead for human nature this presents it just as it is its perversity and deformity on the one side its susceptibilities to improvements its capability of excellence on the other though it reveals to us our humble origin the brotherhood of worms on the other side it unveils to us our relation to angels and archangels on the other nay more it not only shows us our relation to the celestial hosts and to him who presides in their midst but it points out to the penitent and the humble the road which through divine grace will conduct them thither i have spoken of the study of the bible without note or comment notes and comments indeed after you have made diligent use of all your own faculties and powers and sought thereon the blessing of god's spirit have their use i am exceedingly fond of them and i would not wholly deny to you what i am so fond myself the danger is of leaning upon them too much scott and clark and henry and jenks and clamet and barnes and bush may help to show the true way of finding out and interpreting scripture for myself but if i go farther and either indolently or superstitiously suffer them to interpret it for me it were almost better than if i had not sought their aid but the bible with or without notes is i repeat it the greatest volume of self-knowledge which i urge you to study and which in comparison with all the books written by man and even the great volume of nature herself is alone able to make you wise to salvation it seems to me to have been too seldom observed and still more seldom insisted on how up the love and study of the bible are to awaken the dormant intellectual faculties and to enkindle even in the aged a desire for general improvement on this point mr foster on his essay on popular ignorance has some very striking remarks in alluding to that great moral change which it is one object of the bible to produce and to the consequences which often immediately follow he thus remarks it is exceedingly striking to observe how the contracted rigid soul seems to soften and grow warm and expand and quiver with life with a new energy infused it painfully struggles to work itself into freedom from the wretched contortion in which it has been so long fixed as by the impressed spell of infernal magic this change in the moral and religious man has been often observed and mr foster therefore tells us nothing very new however striking it may be but now for the secondary effect which is produced on the intellect and indeed on the whole character it the soul has been filled with a painful and indignant emotion at its own ignorance actuated with a restless desire to be informed acquiring an unwanted applicableness of its faculties to thought attaining a perception combined of intelligence and moral sensibility 
to which numerous things are becoming discernible and affecting that were as non-existent before we have known instances in which the change the intellectual change has been so conspicuous within a brief space of time that even an infidel observer must have forfeited all claim to a man of sense if he would not make the acknowledgments this that you call divine grace whatever it may really be is the strangest awakener of faculties after all i have made this quotation chiefly to confirm the sentiment i have advanced that the love of the bible and the religion of the bible actuates the soul with a restless desire to be informed and stimulates its faculties to thought fills it with pain and indignation at its own ignorance this is the state of mind and heart which i would gladly encourage in the reader it is the truest and best foundation of all progress not only in self-knowledge but in every other sort of knowledge which is valuable give me but this trait of character in a young woman and i will not despair of her however low may be her present condition or however degraded soever may have been her former life give me but a hearty desire a hungering and thirsting for improvement physical moral intellectual social and religious and i will dare to believe that the most debased and depressed soul may be restored at least in some good measure to that likeness to jehovah in which it was originally created one thing more however should be remembered not a few who really have within them the desire of improvement and who mean to make the bible and its doctrines their standard fail of accomplishing much after all the reason is they measure themselves continually by their neighbours if they are no more ignorant or no more vicious than their neighbours mrs s and l perhaps or on the other hand if they are as wise and as virtuous as miss r they seem to rest satisfied or at any rate if they make as much progress in the great path of self-knowledge or do as much good in the world as the latter they are anxious for no more and settle down in inaction now every individual ought to know that the habit of measuring herself by others in this way will hang like a millstone about her neck and if it do not drown her in the depths of ignorance and imbecility it will at least make her forever a child in comparison with what she should be it will keep her grovelling on the earth's surfaces when she ought to be exploring the highest heaven it will keep her a near neighbour to the sisterhood of worms on which she treads when she ought to be soaring towards those lofty heights which gabriel once traversed nay which she even now traverses fast by the throne of the eternal let her not stop then to demean and embarrass and fetter herself by comparisons of herself with anything finer she has no right to do this the perfection which the word of god requires is a standard or measure by which she should compare herself she may indeed sometimes compare herself with herself her present self with her past self provided it be done with due humility but let her beware of measuring herself by others such a course is as perilous as it is ignoble and unprofitable. End of chapter 5chapter six of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bria snow chapter six conscientiousness there is such a want of conscientiousness among mankind even among those who are professedly good people that one might almost be pardoned for concluding that there is either no conscience in the world or that the heavenly monitor is at least nowhere fully obeyed for is there not too much foundation for such a conclusion while well, truth compels it to admit that christianity has already done much to awaken the consciences of men we shall gain nothing by shutting our eyes to the vast influence it has yet to exert before mankind will become what they ought to be most people are conscientious in some things they may have been so trained for instance that they are quite tender in regard to the feelings of others and even those of animals there are many who with cowper would not enter on their list of friends the man who needlessly sets foot upon a worm who were yet very far from possessing much real conscientiousness their feeling is better entitled to the name of sympathy i grant that many of these people possess something more than mere tenderness or sympathy not a few of them are truly conscientious in what may be called the larger concerns of life especially in external religion they not only feel the force of conscience but they obey her voice in some things 
they would not fail to attend to all the outward rites of religion in the most faithful manner on any account whatever and if a failure should occur would find their consciences reproaching them in the severest manner for their departures from a known standard of duty these persons regard with a considerable degree of conscientiousness the law of the land and the law of public opinion or at least the law of fashion in respect to anything which would subject them to the severity of public remark or which would even be regarded by the coarse public eye as glaringly inconsistent with their religious character they are never wanting in sensibility their consciences reproach them when they have done or said anything which may cause them to be spoken ill of thus far it cannot be denied that there is a great deal of conscientiousness in the world but beyond limits something like these it is much more rare than many suppose to say that it does not exist beyond such narrow limits would be unjust but it must be admitted that taking the world at large its existence is so rare as hardly to entitle it to the name of a living moving breathing principle of action i do not suppose that young women are less conscientious than young men or that the young of either sex are less conscientious than their seniors it would be a novel if not unheard of thing to find the youth without conscience merging in due time into the conscientious octogenarian the contrary is the more common cause and yet how few are the young women who make it a matter of conscience to perform everything they do the smaller no less than the larger matters of life in such a way as to meet the approbation of an internal monitor do they not generally bow to the tribunal of a fashionable world do they generally care sufficiently in the everyday actions words thoughts and feelings of their lives what god's vicegerent in the soul says about their conduct or if they do care is it because it is right or wrong in the sight of god or of man a due regard to the authority of conscience would lead people as it seems to me to yield obedience to her dictates on every occasion they who disregard her voice in one thing are likely to do so in others who does not know the power of habit who will deny that the individual who habitually disregards the voice speaking within on a particular subject will be likely or long to extend the same habit of disregard to something else and thus on to the end of the chapter if there be any end to it no one it is believed will doubt that i have rightly described the tendency of habit in large matters he who would allow himself to steal from day to day unmindful of the voice within which bids him beware would not only ere long if unmolested come to a point at which conscience would cease to reproach him but would be likely to venture upon other kinds of wrong i have seen those who would habitually steal small things and yet would not tell a lie for the world but i have also known the habit of stealing continue until lying also gradually came to be a habit was scarcely thought of as offensive in the sight of god or as positively wrong in the nature of things any more than picking up a basket of pebbles from lying the natural transition is to profanity and so on until conscience chased up and down like the last lonely deer of a forest at length exhausted faints and dies few i say will deny the tendency and power of habit in regard to the larger matters of life but is it sufficiently known that every act which can possibly be regarded as fraudulent even in the smallest degree has the same tendency there are a thousand things that people do which cannot be set down as absolutely criminal in the view of human law or human court and which are not forbidden in any particular chapter or verse of the divine law which notwithstanding are forbidden by the spirit of both human law no less than divine law requires us to love our neighbour as ourself is the law obeyed when we make the smallest approach to taking that advantage of a neighbour which we would not like to have taken of us in similar circumstances those who admit and seem to understand the power of habit in large matters are yet prone to forget the tendency of habitual disregard of right and wrong in small matters they are by no means ignorant that large rivers are made up of springs and rills and brooks but they do not seem to consider that the larger stream of conscientiousness must also be fed by its thousand tributaries or it will never flow or once flowing will be likely soon to cease in other words to be conscientious truly so in the larger 
and more important concerns of life, we must be habitually, and I had almost said religiously so, in smaller matters, in our most common and everyday concerns. Would that nothing worse were true than that people of all ranks and professions and of all ages and conditions habitually and with less and less compunction or regret do that which they know they ought not to do and leave undone that which they very well know ought to be done for they even seem to justify themselves in it i know the right and i approve it too i know the wrong and yet the wrong pursue is the language of many an individual even of some from whom we could hope better things, and not a few charge yet upon the frailty of fallen nature, as that nature now is, independent of, and in spite of their own efforts. Strange infatuation. One way of solving this great riddle in human life and conduct, this incessant doing by mankind of that which they know they ought not to do, and neglecting to do that which they know ought to be done, may be found in the fact that so few are trained to regard in everything the sacred rights of conscience they are referred to other and more questionable standards of authority if you do so and so you will never be a lady says a mother who wishes to dissuade her young daughter from doing something to which she is inclined if you behave so everybody will laugh at you says another if you do not obey me i shall punish you says a third if you don't do that i shall tell mother says a younger brother or sister if you do not do it father will give you no sugar toys when he comes home the child is again told if you don't mind me the bears will come and eat you up says the petulant nurse or maid-servant thus in one way or another and at one time or another every motive love fear selfishness pleasure etc is appealed to in the education of the young except that which should be chiefly appealed to viz self-approbation or the approbation of conscience this is not all there is with many of these people no settled rule as to what sort of actions are to be the subjects of praise or of blame a thing which must not be done to-day on penalty of the loss of the forthcoming sugar toys is connived at perhaps with a kiss to-morrow all in the child's mind is confusion she knows not what to do where she is docile and obedient as an angel of light there is a long series of actions words thoughts and feelings connected with right and wrong of which nothing is ever said except to forbid them by stern and absolute authority that one is good and another bad except according to the whim or fancy of the parent or teacher the child never suspects of this last class are almost all the actions of everyday life the child alluded to is scolded at times for default in matters which pertain to rising dressing saying prayers eating drinking playing speaking running teasing or soiling its clothes and, or books and a thousand things too familiar to every one to render it necessary to repeat perhaps she eats too much or eats greedily or she inclines to be slovenly or indolent or fretful now all these things are in general merely forbidden or rated or at most shown to be contrary to the will of the parent they are seldom or never shown to be right or wrong in their own nature nor is the child assured upon the authority of the parent that there is a natural right or wrong to them thus that which is not implanted does not of course grow all the little actions and concerns of life or almost all and these by their number and frequent recurrence make up almost the whole of a child's existence are as it were left wholly without the domain of conscience and the young woman goes up to maturity without a distinct conviction that conscience has anything to do with them and what is bred in the bone according to a vulgar maxim stays long in the flesh as is the child so is the adult it has been one of the most difficult things in the world to make a person conscientious in all things who has not been trained to be so hence the great difficulty in the way of making everyday christians our religion is thought by some to have nothing to do with these ever-recurring small matters and when we are told that we should do everything to the honour and glory of god although we may assent to the proposition it is hard to put it into practice there is a sort of moral plausi prevailing in the community and that too very extensively no fatal error of early education could have seized more firmly or palsied more effectually the moral sensibilities of the whole community than this and therefore it is certain that this 
is at least one principal reason why there is so little conscience in the world and why it is so often a starveling wherever it is found to exist i have heard an eminent teacher contend with much earnestness that there is a great multitude of smaller actions of human life which are destitute of character wholly so they are he says neither right nor wrong but if so then there is no responsibility attached to them and co consequently no conscientiousness required in connection with their due performance but what in that case is to become of the injunction of a distinguished apostle when he says whatever you do do all to the glory of god if everything we do should be done to the glory of god and not thus to do it is to disobey a righteous precept then there is a right and wrong in everything now which shall we believe the human teacher or the divine this origin of a common error i have deemed it necessary for every young woman to understand that she may know how to apply the correction and where to begin she should love and respect her parents even if they belong to the class which has been described she should consider the present imperfect state of human nature and be thankful for the thousand benefits she has received at their hands and the various means of improvement within her reach if she has drunk deeply of the desire for improvement and if she wishes to know and reform herself as far as possible let her begin by cultivating to the highest possible degree a sense of right and wrong and an implicit and unwavering obedience to the right before closing this chapter however i wish to present a few illustrations of my meaning when i say that everything should be done in a conscientious manner perhaps indeed i am already sufficiently understood but lest i should not be by all i subjoin the following suppose a young woman is in the habit of lying in bed late in the morning in view of her varied responsibilities and of the vast importance of rising early and with a strong desire for continual improvement she sets herself to change the habit now to aid her in the task for it is no light one let her endeavour to consider the whole matter god gives us sleep she will perhaps say to herself for the restoration of our bodies and minds and all the time really necessary for this is well employed but i have found that i feel better and actually enjoy myself better for the whole day following when by accident or by other means i have slept an hour less than i am accustomed to do so i usually sleep nine hours or more whereas i am quite sure eight are sufficient for every reasonable purpose moreover if i sleep an hour too much that hour is wasted have i a right to waste it it is god's gift is it not slighting his gift to spend it in sleep is it not a sin and to do so day after day and year after year is it not to make myself exceedingly guilty in his sight one hour daily saved for the purpose of reading or study after the, a person has really slept enough is equal in sixteen years to the addition of a full year to one's life can it be that i waste in sleep in fifteen or sixteen years a whole year of time i must do so no longer it injures my complexion it injures my health it is an indolent practice but above all it is a sin against god i am resolved to redeem my time and to aid me in this work i am determined if i fail in any instance to remember this decision and the grounds on which it was made she carries out her decision she finds herself waking too late occasionally it is true however she not only hurries out of the bed the instant she wakes but recalls her former view of the sinfulness of her conduct she is no sooner dressed than she asks pardon for her transgression and prays that she may transgress no more this course she continues and thus her convictions of the sinfulness of her former indolent habit and waste of time are deepened at length by her persevering efforts and the assistance of god she gains the victory and a new and better habit is completely established just so it should be with any other bad habit every young woman should consider it as a sin against god and should begin the work of reformation as a duty not only to herself and to others but also and more especially to god if it be nothing but the error of eating too much which by the way is not so small an error as many seem to suppose let her try to regard it in its true light as a transgression against the laws of god let it be so regarded not merely once or twice but habitually in this way it will soon become 
as in the case of early rising, a matter of conscience. The close of the day, however, is an especially important season for cultivating the habit of conscientiousness. Sleep is the image of death, as some have said, and if so, we may consider ourselves at bedtime as standing on the borders of the grave, for all things should look serious. The cool of the day is peculiarly adapted to reflection. Let every one at this time recall the circumstances of the day and consider wherein things have been wrong. It was a sacred rule among the Pythagoreans every evening to run thrice over in their minds the events of the day, and shall Christians do less than heathen? The Pythagoreans did more than cultivate a habit of recalling their errors. They asked themselves what good they had done so should we we should remember that it is not only sinful to do wrong but it is also sinful to admit to do right the young woman who fears that she has said something in regard to a fellow-being in a certain place or in certain company which she ought not to have said as it may do that person injury should remember that not to have said something when a favourable opportunity offered which might have been done a companion or neighbour good was also equally wrong and above all she should remember that both the commission and the omission were sins against that god who gave her a tongue to do good with and not to do harm and not only to do good with but to do the greatest possible amount of good in short it should be the constant practice of every one who has the love of eternal improvement strongly implanted in her bosom to consider every action performed during the day as sinful when it has not been done in the best possible manner whether it may have been one thing or another as i have stated repeatedly elsewhere there is nothing worth doing at all which should not be done to the honour and glory of god and she who would attain to the highest measure of perfection should regard nothing as done in this manner which is not done exactly as god her saviour would have done it it is desirable not only to avoid benumbing or searing over the conscience but that we should cultivate it to the highest possible tenderness. True, these tender consciences are rather troublesome, but is it not better that they should torture us a little now than a great deal hereafter? I have said that some good people, that is, those who are comparatively good, fall short in this matter. A young woman is a teacher, perhaps, in a Sabbath school. She knows full well the importance of attending promptly at the appointed hour. She makes it a point thus to attend. At last she fails on a single occasion, not from necessity, but from negligence, or at least from want of due care, and her conscience at once reproaches her for the conduct, but ere long the offence is repeated, the reproaches of her conscience, though still felt, have become less keen. The offence is repeated again and again, the conscience is almost seared over, and the omission of what had at first given pain almost ceases to be troublesome and thus the conscience having been blunted in one respect is more liable to be so in others alas for the individual who is thus from day to day growing worse and yet from day to day becoming less sensible of it but there is a worse case than i have yet mentioned a young woman who has risen rather late on sunday morning and having risen late other things are liable to relate the hour for church is at length near the bell is even ringing something in the way of dress not very necessary except to comply with fashions and yet on the whole desirable still remains to be done during the remaining five minutes but what is more important still the habit of secret prayer for five minutes before going to church is uncomplied with one of these the closet or the dress must be neglected for want of time does any one doubt which it will be does any one doubt that the dress will receive the desired attention and the closet will be neglected but does any one suppose that conscientiousness can live and flourish where it is not only not cultivated but habitually violated in regard to the most sacred matters secret prayer is one of the most sacred duties and they who habitually neglect or violate it for the self of doing that which is of secondary importance knowing it to be so and not only taking the sure course to eradicate all conscientiousness from their bosoms but are more manifestly preferring the world to god and the love and service of the world to the love and service of its glorious creator and redeemer let me say in concluding this chapter that if the conscience is cultivated from day to day it will in time acquire a degree of tenderness and accuracy to which most of the world are entire strangers 
there is however one more thing conscience will not only become more tender and faithful but her domain will be much enlarged by the study of the bible and in many cases in which this heavenly monitor was once silent she will now utter her warning voice conscience is not unalterable as some suppose she is susceptible of elevation as long as we live and happy is the individual who elevates her to her rightful throne happy is the individual who sees things most nearly as god sees them and whose conscience condemns her in every thing which is contrary to the divine will end of chapter six Chapter Seven of A Young Woman's Guide to Excellence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bria Snow. The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. Self Government. This is so broad a subject that I shall present my thoughts concerning it under several different heads. It includes, in my estimation, the government of thoughts the imagination, the temper, the affections, and the appetites. The young woman who truly governs herself will be at once cheerful, discreet, modest, diffident, vigilant, courageous, active, temperate, and happy. Cheerfulness. Is cheerfulness within our power? Some may be inclined to ask. I certainly regard it so. That there are moments of our lives, nay, even considerable seasons, where cheerfulness is not required, may indeed be true. Our friends sicken and die, and we mourn for them. This is the law of our nature. Even our Saviour was at times a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, though of all individuals in the universe cheerfulness was his right. But he more and more than his own sorrows, and in so far as his example is, in this respect, binding upon us, it is only when we bear the sorrows of others those should indeed often be borne and in proportion as they are borne in proportion as we are wounded for the transgressions and bruised for the iniquities of others it may not be possible for us to be continually cheerful as for our own sorrows the sufferings the pangs the bereavements of our own existence we should never cease to regard them in some measure at least as the chastisements of an almighty father smitten friends according to the sentiment of a distinguished poet are messengers of mercy to us are sent on errands full of love for us they sicken and for us they die we should be at least resigned even under such chastisements when we remember that they are inflicted by our father's hand but setting aside occasions of this time is there not a demand in our whole nature for general cheerfulness it is not only the sunshine of the soul but that of the body the truly cheerful are not only happier in their mind and spirits but also in their very bodies the brain and nervous system play their part in the great drama of physical life better the heart and stomach and lungs work better indeed all is better throughout is not that a duty which is productive of so much happiness but can that be a duty which is not in our power to perform it was surely an impeachment of the wisdom and goodness of god to require us in his providence or in his word by his natural or his revealed law to do that of which we are incapable i consider cheerfulness then a matter of duty and of course as in a great measure in our power it makes us happier ourselves it enables ourselves to reflect more happiness on others i consider it especially as a duty of the young who have it in their power to communicate happiness thereby in such large measure let them young women especially strive to cultivate it it is in its nature a perennial plant and if it is not such at the present time it is because it is degenerated in a degenerate world let it be restored to its pristine beauty and let the world thereby in connection with other means of tending to the same end be restored to what it was before the loss of eden discretion this is a virtue with which it is supposed by some the young have little if anything to do i cannot assent to such an opinion i believe that the young are to be trained in the way they should go and as discretion is prominently a virtue of middle and later life i deem it desirable that we should see at least the germs of it in the young above all i do like to see the young woman discreet discretion 
not only heightens the pleasures of her existence but adds greatly to her reputation in the just estimation of the wise coupled with modesty of which i am to speak presently it more than doubles her charms let discretion then be studied let it be studied too for its immediate as well as remote benefit it will indeed bear fruit more abundantly in later life but it will not be without its value in youth it is the plant which it were worth while to cultivate if human existence were more frail and life more uncertain of continuance than it is now modesty of all the qualities appropriate to young women i know of none which is more universally esteemed than the modesty and what has been by common consent so highly esteemed i cannot find it in my heart to undervalue indeed i do not think it has ever been overvalued or that it can be i have been somewhat amused not to say instructed by the following remark on this trait of female character from the pen of one who is not only a philosopher but a physiologist they are not the more interesting perhaps because they are somewhat new but neither are they less so as i have nothing else to say on this topic which has not been said a thousand times i transcribe the more freely the thoughts of the author to whom i refer modesty establishes an equilibrium between the superiority of man and the delicacy of woman it enables woman to ensure thereby for herself a supporter a defender and while man thus barters his protection for love woman is a match for his power and the weaker to a great extent governs the stronger it is probable that modesty derives its cause in woman from a certain mistrust in her own merit and from the fear of finding herself below that very affection which she is capable of exciting and of which she is the object modesty compels her love to assume that form by which nature has taught her so universally to express it that of gratitude friendship etc modesty is a means of attraction with which nature inspires all females under this head i will just add that since by modesty the weaker govern the stronger it is of immense importance that woman should know the true secret of maintaining her power and also by what means she is likely to jeopardize that power and without undertaking to determine what should be the precise rules of female action and the precise limits of the sphere within which the author of her nature designed she should move it is not worth the serious inquiry whether she does not as a general fact lose influence the moment she departs widely from the province which god in nature seems to have allotted her when like a wollstonecroft or a wright or others still of less painful notoriety she mounts the rostrum and becomes the centre of gaping perhaps admiring thousands of the other sex as well as of her own so did not the excellent women of galilee eighteen hundred years ago although they were engaged heart and hand in a cause than which none could be more glorious or afford greater triumph especially to their own sex they probably knew too well their own power to endanger it thus in the general scale or if not they probably yielded to the impulses of a spirit which could direct them on a path more congenial to their own nature as well as on the whole more conductive to their own emancipation elevation and perfection diffidence this trait though nearly related to modesty is far from being the same thing its character having been more frequently brought in question than that of modesty and yet it seems to me equally valuable it gilds what modesty graces and polishes what modesty improves let not the reader confound modesty and bashfulness for they are by no means the same thing modesty is much opposed to impudence as anything can be and yet it is certain that impudence is often conjoined with bashfulness not so often to be sure in the female sex as in our own and yet such a phenomenon is occasionally witnessed even in women bashfulness is usually the result of too low an estimate of ourselves whereas true diffidence only leads us to value ourselves according to our real worth diffidence makes us humble but bashfulness sometimes makes us mean at least there is danger of it it is at all events of doubtful utility and though i would not denounce or condemn it i would urge the young to endeavour to rise far above it 
but i repeat it i would endeavour to cultivate and encourage every thing which belongs to true diffidence it will assist modesty in performing her angelic office and the influence of both united may save from many a pang in this world and perhaps prove a means under god of preventing the sentence of condemnation in the world to come courage by courage i do not mean that trait for which man is constitutionally as much distinguished as woman is for the want of it i do not mean a courage to meet and surmount physical difficulties and encounter outward and physical dangers i mean on the contrary that moral courage which is neither confined to sex nor condition not that physical courage is to be despised even by females on the contrary i think it is a trait of character which is quite too much neglected in female education it is not only lamentable but pitiable to see a female of twenty thirty or fifty years of age shrinking at the sight of a spider or a toad even when there is not the smallest prospect of its coming within three yards of her nor is it as it should be when a young woman already eighteen or twenty years of age has such a dread of pigs and cows as to scream aloud at the sight of one in a field so well enclosed that it is not possible her safety could be endangered with an animal ever so malicious such unreasonable and foolish fears ought by no means to be encouraged on the contrary she who finds herself a slave to them ought to suppress them as fast as possible this is indeed an important but much neglected part of female education and she who is a sufferer therefrom will do well to derive a hint from these pages the unreasonable fears of what i speak are by no means confined to the sight of toads or spiders or pigs or cows we find them more or less frequently and in some form or other in nearly every family some are unreasonably afraid of dogs and horses others of cats or snakes others again of the dark or of being alone by day or by night let me not be understood as saying that no tears are to be indulged in regard to any of these things it is only an unreasonable and foolish degree of fear that should be guarded against a cow or a horse feeding quietly in a pasture and separated from you by a stout fence which no animal in any ordinary circumstances is wont to leap is not a proper object of fear with a rational person over twelve years of age if a cow or horse is running at large in the highway and appears fearless of man or furious or if mad dogs are about enough of fear may reasonably be indulged to keep you from the street and confine yourself to your home unless you have suitable protection but as i have already said it is moral courage that i would inspire in the young woman if she has patience and perseverance and fortitude why then may she not add to these moral courage what man has done man may do it has been a thousand times said and the remark is not less applicable to women than to man what woman has done woman may do but woman in numerous instances has possessed moral courage she has been known more than once to face a frowning world or to oppose some of its tyrant fashions i could mention more than one who has thus evinced true moral courage and set her sex on a glorious example which not a few of my readers might do well to follow let woman dare to do right whether fashionable or unfashionable let her dare to do so in the smaller no less than the larger matters of life let her dare to obey god and the laws of god both natural and revealed both within and around her rather than the laws of any man or set of men let her do this and she will evince true moral courage a courage as far surpassing the highest efforts of physical courage of prowess as right surpasses might virtue vice or purity impurity vigilance the young woman who truly understands and practices the art of self-government will not only train herself to be at once cheerful discreet modest diffident and courageous she will also be vigilant the largest ship may be sunk by a very small leak and in like manner may the brightest and noblest character lose its lustre unless the possessor is ever on the watch let not the most perfect individual on earth say in the plenitude of his own power and in the height of his own self-assurance my mountain stands strong i shall never be moved such assurances of self-government and self-possession may be proper of course are so in him who is in his own nature perfect and immutable infinitely and eternally so but not in a frail 
mutable created man or woman above all in the young and inexperienced pardon me then youthful reader when i repeat the scripture cautions be vigilant and let him who thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall it is easier to maintain the measure of self-government we have already attained and even to add to it than to recover what we have once lost thoughts and feelings on this account set a guard over the very thoughts of your heart all sin begins in the desires of the heart and the affections of the soul there in the deep recesses of the man it germinates let every imagination then which exalts itself unduly be brought low and let the stream of thought and feeling be pure and perfect and holy acquire the exceedingly important habit of confining your thoughts and desires to those subjects which your judgment tells you are lawful and proper and which are not only lawful and proper in general but which are so at particular times and places the wise man says there is a time and season for everything and more than intimate than it is wisdom to confine everything thoughts and feelings to no less than words and actions to their own place and time respectively but to learn to think with order is one exceedingly important item in the art of governing our thoughts half the thought in the world is of a mere random character men are but half men who have not yet attained to the government of their thoughts and feelings the affections even these as i have already said can be controlled were it not so what meaning would there be in the gospel command so incessantly repeated by the divine author of the gospel to love our enemies on this subject the regulation and if i may say so the application of the affections i intend to dwell at greater length hereafter the temper nothing is more unpleasant slovenliness perhaps excepted than a bad temper i beseech every one who is so unhappy as to possess such a temper to pay particular attention to what i am about to say on this interesting and important topic some young women seem to entirely overlook the consequences of an ill temper these are numerous too numerous to be mentioned in a single chapter i shall only say here that such a temper is no less destructive in a slow way to the health of the body than it is to the mental faculties and the affections some suppose their ill temper to be constitutional and this serves them as an apology for neglecting to govern it they seem to regard it as so wrought into their very structure that it will hardly be possible ever to eradicate it they are condemned by inheritance as they appear to suppose to a perpetual war within in which the most they can hope for is their occasional victory now let me tell every young woman who has imbibed this erroneous and dangerous notion that god has never suffered the command of her temper to be placed beyond her reach she may acquire the most perfect self-command even in this respect if she will not in a moment nor in a day it is true the work may be the labour of months or of years still the battle can be won a permanent and final victory can be achieved the very general idea that single persons somewhat advanced in life especially females become habitually impatient or ill-tempered has too much truth for its foundation though it is by no means universally true nor is it ever necessary that it should be so as i have endeavoured to show elsewhere i wish every young person could be induced to study deeply the causes which operate on mankind to originate or perpetuate a bad temper they are numerous exceedingly so it is not necessary to charge much upon our ancestors the causes may much oftener be found within our own minds and bodies would we but look for them there we harbour or perhaps indulge in a thousand unpleasant feelings from day to day not seeming to know or at least to realise that a small streams form large ones so these first risings of anger lead to its more outbreaking form not a few of the instances of irritability fretfulness impatience and melancholy have their origin in physical causes in errors regard to exercise sleep air temperature dress eating drinking etc and some have their origin in mistakes about the theory or the practice of religion 
some originate too in disappointed love in short their sources are well nigh endless the appetites and passions it is in vain or almost in vain to hope for any radical improvement in our physical intellectual or moral condition except in proportion as the body and the bodily appetites are kept in proper subjection to right reason and religion here i must again urge upon every young woman the duty of studying the laws of health and especially those of temperance the knowledge thus to be obtained would be of exceedingly great value to her in the government of her passions and appetites professor massey recently of dartmoor college in new hampshire relates that a teacher in boston whose general course of discipline was quite mild was sometimes too much affected in his temper by high seasoned or overstimulating dinners as to be petulant and passionate even to blows immediately afterwards now whether this was often the case with the individual in question i cannot say this however i may affirm with the utmost safety and confidence that many an individual who finds her passions or her appetites more than usual troublesome or rebellious would do well to look for the cause in the bad air which she breathes the bad food or drink she uses or in something else in herself or in her habits which might have been prevented sometimes tea or coffee notwithstanding their first effects to enliven produce the results i have mentioned as their secondary effects sometimes a hearty dinner of flesh meat or a mo more moderate one with bad accompaniments or of improper seasonings is the cause of trouble sometimes the cause is something either quite indigestible or difficult of digestion whether it be animal or vegetable and lastly but yet most frequently of all it may be excess of quantity or the bad cooking of substances naturally wholesome and digestible i press this part of my subject upon the consideration of young women because it concerns not them alone but a host of others no one liveth to himself as an apostle and the remark is quite as important in its application to the young woman as to any other individual one reason why i urge it is because we are all almost universally referred to moral means and moral considerations alone in order to keep in subjection the body its passions and appetites and seldom if ever to a proper attention to our food or our drink our air our exercise or our sleep nay the hopes of the young in regard to keeping the body in subjection are sometimes completely paralyzed by the grave assertion that the strength of our passions and appetites is constitutional as much as our inheritance as the colour of our eyes or the contour of our physiognomies and almost equally unalterable now i would encourage no young woman to expect too much of temperance in all things without the cooperation of the moral powers and especially of the will but i would encourage her to strict temperance for her own sake and that of others I would say to her once more that in proportion to her obedience to the laws of health in regard to air exercise sleep temperature study food drink clothing etc etc will be her ability to govern herself according to right and reason and the commands of the creator the simpler her diet for example and the more free it is from extraneous things as fats condiments etc the easier it will be to keep herself in proper subjection to herself the body to the immortal spirit one of the most powerful and ever active causes of that slavery of the soul to the body which every person of sense must perceive and deplore is our unnatural and artificial cookery had it been the aim of all the cookery in the world to make it as bad as possible for the health of body and soul i know not that things could be worse than they are now very few things indeed are made more palatable more digestible or more nutritious by it the legitimate and the only end all the efforts of our fashionable cookery on the contrary they are made almost universally a great deal worse for us let the young woman who would serve god in her day and generation by doing good in the reformation elevation and eternal progress of herself and those around her not only study deeply the laws of health and life but let her tax her powers of reasoning and invention to see it is not possible to remove the cause of so much mischief from our parlours our sleeping rooms our kitchens and our tables much must be done in this respect before the world can become what it ought to be and woman must lead the way 
woman of some future generation, if not of the present. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bria Snow. Self Command. I was at first disposed to call this chapter Presence of Mind, but for various reasons have I have chosen to call it by another name, that of Self Command. To acquire the art of properly commanding ourselves in all circumstances, especially in the most trying emergencies and at a moment of danger, when not a minute, perhaps not a second, should be lost, is as difficult as it is important to every person, and to none, perhaps, more so than to young women. Not that their trials of this sort will be more frequent than those of other people, but because the usual course of their education is such as to prepare them but poorly to meet those which fall to their lot. It is said that Napoleon was greatly distinguished for the trait of character of which I am now speaking, but there are also numerous examples of self-command in females on record. I will relate one. Some thirty or forty years ago, when the Indians had not yet done making depredations on the inhabitants of our then frontier states kentucky and ohio a band of these savage men came to the door of a house in nelson country kentucky and having shot down the father of the little family within who would incautiously open the door they attempted to rush in and put to death the defenceless and unoffending mother and her children but mrs merrill for that was the name of the heroic woman had much of that self-command or presence of mind which was now so needful she drew her wounded husband into the house closed the door and barred it as quickly as possible so that the indians could not enter at once and then proceeded to the defence of her castle and all those in it whom she held dear the indians had so hewed away a part of the door so that they could force themselves in one by one but not rapidly this slow mode of entrance gave mrs m time to dispatch them with an axe and drag them in so that before those who were without were aware of the fate of those inside she had with a little assistance from her husband formed quite a pile of dead bodies within and around the door and even the little children half dead though they at first were with fear had gradually began to recover from their fright the indians finding their party so rapidly disappearing at length began to suspect what was their fate and accordingly gave up their efforts in that direction they now attempted to descend into the house by way of the chimney the united wisdom and presence of mind of the family was again put into requisition and they emptied upon the fire the contents of a feather bed which brought down half smothered those indians that were in the chimney who were also soon and easily dispatched. The remainder of the party, now very much reduced in numbers, became quite discouraged and concluded it was best to retire. I have not related this story because I suppose any of my readers will ever be tried in this particular manner. Many of them, however, may be placed in circumstances exceedingly trying, and their lives and those of others may depend on a little presence of mind suppose now that mrs m instead of dragging her wounded husband into the house and fastening the door had stood still and screamed or suppose she had fainted or run away what would have been the result we do not know it is true but we know enough of the indian mode of warfare to see that no condition could well be more perilous it cannot be denied that the large share of nervous sensibility which is allotted to the female constitution peculiarly unfits women for scenes of blood like that to which i have alluded and yet we see what can be done as a last resort but if most females were fitted for trying emergencies as i doubt not they could be however much better they could meet the more common accidents and dangers to which human existence is daily more or less liable and ought they not to be thus fitted do you ask how item be done this is precisely the question i should expect would be asked by those who have a strong desire for improvement this is a work that is at present chiefly left undone both 
by parents and teachers and yet hundreds of lives are lost every year for the want of it and hundreds of others are likely to be lost in the same way every year for many years to come unless the work is taken up as a work of importance and studied with as much zeal as grammar or geography or botany or mathematics it is a most pitiable sight to see a young woman twelve fifteen or maybe eighteen years of age left to take care of a babe suffer its clothes to get on fire by some accident and then without the least particle of self-command only to jump up and down and scream until the child is burnt to death or what perhaps is still worse rush out for relief leaving the door wide open to let through a current of air to hasten the work of destruction equally distressing and pitiable it is to see females young or old losing all presence of mind the moment a horse takes fright a gale of wind capsizes the vessel on which they are travelling and by their erratic movements depriving themselves of the only opportunity which remains to them of saving themselves or of assisting to save others but the question recurs can these evils be prevented in what way can our young women be taught or in what way can they be induced to teach themselves the important art of commanding themselves on all occasions and in all emergencies an aged but excellent minister of the gospel with whom i had the honour and the pleasure of being intimately acquainted once said that the only way of being prepared for the sudden accidents of life by being able to keep cool and possess our souls in peace was to think on the subject often and consider what we would do should such and such accidents occur thus we should consider often what we ought to do if a horse in a carriage should run away with us if we should awake and find the house on fire over our heads what to be done if we were in this room or in that etc if our clothes should take fire if we should be burnt or scalded what to be done if scalded with water and what if with milk oil or any other substance if a child should fall into a well be kicked by a horse be seized by convulsions or break or dislocate a limb etc it will be asked i know of what avail it is to think over and over what should be done without the instructions either of experiment or science but we can have these instructions to some extent whenever we seek after them the great trouble is we are not in the habit of seeking for them and what we do not seek we rarely if ever find there are around every young woman those whose judgment is worth something in this matter it is not always the old though it is more generally such there are those who live in the world almost half a century without learning anything and there are also those who become wise in a quarter of a century the wise whatever may be their age are the persons for you to consult and the older such persons are the better because the greater is likely to be their wisdom the truly wise are always growing wiser it is the fool alone who remains stationary wise and observing friends will probably tell you or at least relate anecdotes to you from which you may gather the conclusion that when the clothes of a child have caught fire you may often smother the flame by wrapping him instantly in a thick woolen blanket that it is seldom entirely safe to open the doors into an adjoining room at least without great caution when the house which we are in is discovered to be on fire but the best way as a general rule is to escape by the scuttle if there be one or by a ladder or by letting ourselves down to the ground if the distance is not too great to the windows this last is often the best way though not always the most expeditious one many sleep with a rope in their bedrooms to tie to the bedposts as a means of letting themselves down should there be occasion while others rely on the bedclothes to make a rope of them by tying several articles together but it was no part of my purpose in this work to direct to the appropriate methods of saving ourselves or our friends from harm in case of accidents or emergencies but only to point to the subject and leave the reader to pursue it the intelligent young woman who sets about gaining the habit of self-command will not only consult the experience of others but observe and reflect and reason on the case herself she will often originate plans and means of escapes in places and circumstances of danger which she would not gain from others in a hundred or a thousand years there is one other means of improvement in the art of self-command on which i do not know that any writer on the subject has dwelt with 
much earnestness and yet it is as plain and simple as can be it is to make the most of every little accident or emergency that actually overtakes or surprises us i know from personal experience that a great deal may be done in this way there are those who though they were formerly frightened half out of their senses at the sudden sight of a harmless snake have fought themselves by dint of long effort to so much presence of mind as only to start a little at first and be as calm and composed and self-possessed in a few seconds afterwards as if nothing had happened and the same presence of mind may be obtained in other surprises or emergencies besides she who is learning to command herself at sight of a snake or dog is at the same time acquiring the power to command herself in any other circumstances where self-command may be necessary i wish the principle indicated by the last statement were more generally perceived i wish it were distinctly understood that what we want is to gain the habit of self-command in all circumstances rather than to be able to work ourselves up to a proper state of feeling in particular cases and that this habit is to be acquired by frequent familiar conversation on the subject by daily practice in the continually recurring small matters of life it is indeed in governing ourselves in these small matters which recur so frequently and are regarded as so trifling as to have not only no moral character in themselves but no influence in the formation of character that the art to which i am now directing your attention is to be chiefly acquired they who defer the work until some larger or more striking emergency arrives will not be likely to make much progress for they begin at the wrong end of the matter they begin exactly where they ought to end end of chapter eight chapter nine of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Bria snow chapter nine decision of character this trait of character has been recommended to young men too exclusively i know of no reason why it is not equally important to young women and especially becoming the sex in general one thing at any rate i do know which is that thousands of young women and the world through their imperfections suffer in no trifling degree from the want of this virtue i call it a virtue what is there that produces more evil directly or indirectly than the want of power when occasion requires it to say yes or no as long as with half the human race and the more influential half to no does not mean no and yes does not mean yes there will be a vast amount of vice and crime and suffering in the world as a natural consequence and is not that which is the cause of so much evil nearly akin to vice and is anything more entitled to the name of virtue than its opposite let me illustrate my meaning by a scripture example when balak the king of moab undertook to extort a curse upon israel from balaam the latter did not say no but only said the lord would not permit him to do what was required he left neither to balak nor to his messengers any reason to conclude that his virtue was invulnerable on the contrary as the event plainly shows his answer was just such a one as encouraged them to prosecute their attempts to seduce him now it is precisely this sort of refusal direct or implied in a thousand cases which might be named which brings down evil not only upon those who make it but upon others they mean no perhaps and yet it is not certain that the decision is like the laws of the medes and persians irrevocable something in the tone or manner or both combined leaves room to hope for success in time to come the woman who deliberates is lost we are told and is it not so do not many who say no with hesitancy still retain the power and the disposition to deliberate and is it not so understood it is i repeat it a great misfortune a very great one not to know how and when to say no indeed the undecided are more than unfortunate they are very unsafe they who cannot say no are never their own keepers they are always more or less in the power and at the command of others 
they may form a thousand resolutions a day to withstand in the hour of temptation and yet if the temptation comes and they have not acquired decision of character it is ten to one that they will yield to it is it not too much to say that half the world are miserable on this account miserable themselves and a source of misery to others is it too much to say that decision of character is more important to young women than to any other class of persons whatever but as it is in everything almost everything else so it is in this matter they who would reform themselves must begin with the smaller matters of life the great trials those of decision no less than those of other traits of human character come but seldom and they who allow themselves habitually to vacillate and hesitate and remain undecided in the everyday concerns of life will inevitably do so in those larger matters which recur less frequently no one will succeed in acquiring true decision of character without perseverance a few feeble efforts continued a day or two or a week are by no means sufficient to change the character or form the habit the efforts must be earnest energetic and unremitted and must be persevered in through life i am not ignorant that many philosophers and psychologists have denied that woman possesses the power of perseverance in what she undertakes in any eminent degree a british writer distinguished his boldness if not for his metaphysical acuteness maintains with much earnestness that woman by her vital organization is much wanting in perseverance this notion may or may not be true certain it is however that she has her peculiarities as well as man his but whether she has little or much native power of perseverance in what she undertakes is not so important a question as whether she makes a proper use of the power she possesses who does the best his circumstance allows does well acts nobly angels could not more we are required however to do that best which circumstance allows as much as is the higher seraph and woman is not the less bound to persevere in matters where perseverance would become her because her native power of perseverance is feeble if indeed it is so on the contrary this very fact makes the duty of perseverance to the utmost extent the means god has put into her hands the more urgent especially as small powers are apt to be overlooked there is one habit which should be cultivated not only for its usefulness in general but especially for its value in leading to true decision of character i mean the habit of doing everything which devolves upon us to do precisely at the time when it ought to be done everything in human character goes to wreck under the reign of procrastination which prompt action gives to all things a corresponding and proportional life and energy above all everything in the shape of decision of character is lost by delay it should be a sacred rule with every individual who lives in the world for any higher purpose than merely to live never to put off for a single moment a thing which ought to be done immediately have been no more than the cleaning or changing of her garment when i see a young woman neglecting from day to day her correspondence her pile of letters constantly increasing and her dread of putting pen and thoughts to paper accumulating as rapidly i never fail to conclude at once that whatever excellent quality she may possess she is a stranger to the one in question she who cannot make up her mind to answer a letter when she knows it ought to be answered and in general a letter ought to be answered soon after it is received will not be likely to manifest decision in other things of still greater importance the same is true as i have said already several times in regard to indecision in other things of even less moment than the writing of a letter it is manifest especially in regard to the manner of rising in the morning she who knows it is time to get up and yet cannot decide to do so and consequently lies yawning a little longer or yet a little longer still can never i am bold to say while this indolence and indecision are indulged be decided in anything else at least habitually she may indeed be so by fits and starts but the habit will never be so confirmed as to be regarded as an essential element of her character nearly all the habits of modern female education i mean the fashionable education of the family and school are entirely at war with the virtue i am endeavouring to inculcate 
it would be a miracle almost for young woman who has been educated in a fashionable family under the eye of a fashionable mother and at a fashionable boarding school under the direction of a teacher whose main object is to please her patrons should come out to the world without being quite destitute of all true decision of character if it were the leading subject of our boarding schools to form the habit of indecision they could not better succeed than many of them do now they furnish to the world a set of beings who are anything but what the world wants and who are more likely to do almost anything else than to be the means of reforming it end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bria Snow. Chapter Ten, Self Dependence. Here again, our fashionable modes of education are wrong, and here too, almost every young woman who is determined on improvement has a great work to perform. It is one of the most difficult things in the world, perhaps it is one of the impossibles to bring up children amid comforts and conveniences and yet at the same time to cultivate them in the habit of self-dependence or as some would call it the habit of independence and yet nothing is more true than that human character has always with few if any exceptions been most fully developed and most harmoniously and healthfully formed amid difficulties Mr. McClure, the distinguished geologist, whose opportunities for observation in the world have been very great, says that orphans, as a general rule, make their way best in the world. Without claiming for myself so many years of observation, by thirty or forty as this distinguished veteran in natural science, I should be glad to make one modification of his conclusion before adopting it as my own. I would say that the misfortune of having no parents at all is scarcely greater than that of having overindulgent ones, and that the number of those who are spoilt by indulgence is greater than the number of those who are spoiled by being made orphans. It cannot be that an institution ordained by heavens as one of its first laws should so completely fail in accomplishing its design, that of blessing mankind, as Mr. McClure represents, it cannot be that parents, as a general rule, are a misfortune. Such a belief is greatly erroneous. The truth is that when we look about us and see so many spoils who appear to be well-bred, our attention is so exclusively directed to these strange, but in a dense population of frequently occurring cases, that we begin ere long to fancy the exception to be the rule. And again, when we see here and there an orphan, and in a population like ours, quite a multitude in the aggregate, making her way well in, in the world, we are liable to make another wrong conclusion, and say that her success belongs to the general rule, when it is only an exception to it. Nevertheless, and I have no wish to conceal the fact, it is extremely difficult, if not dangerous, to attempt to form good and useful character in the lap of ease and indulgence the needs privation and hard struggle to develop the soul and the body even zion the city of our god is represented in scripture as recruiting her inhabitants only by throes and agonies let it not be thought then that our young woman in new england a land of comparative ease quiet and affluence can be brought up as they ought to be without much painstaking a century ago things were in this respect more favourable then there were struggles and these were the means of forming a race of men and women of whom the world might have been proud then the young woman knew how to take care of themselves and having been taught how to take care of themselves they knew how to take care of others but times are altered thousands of young women and the same is true of young men are trained from the very cradle scarcely to know anything of want or difficulty all is comparative ease and comfort and quiet around them and they are led by ease and indulgence to love to have it so they are trained as i have said elsewhere to depend on the world and its inhabitants for their happiness not to originate happiness and diffuse it they are trained in effect to believe that happiness or blessedness consists contrary to the saying of our lord and saviour in receiving not in giving the time was 
i say once more when most young women if thrown by the hard hand of necessity upon their own resources could yet take care of themselves no matter how great their poverty or affliction how large or how deep their cup of adversity or trial they would in general struggle through it and come out as gold seven times refined mothers left with large families of helpless children and with no means of sustaining them but the labour of their own hands and daughters left without either parent would wind their way along in the world and the world be both the wiser and the better for their influence now on the contrary mothers and young women left destitute are apt to be of all beings except the merest infants of the former the most helpless this applies to even a large portion of what are called the poor in reality however we have no poor or next to none our very paupers are comparatively rich they dress and eat and drink and dwell like princes how then can they be so very poor it is true that nearly all of our young women are trained to something in the shape of labour very few indeed are trained to positive indolence but what is their labour generally speaking a little sewing or knitting or embroidery or still worse in circumstances of poverty or peculiar necessity a life of spinning or weaving or braiding or some other mechanical occupation which has no tendency to prepare them for true self-dependence i have said we have little poverty existing among us is it not so is not the life of young women in the great mass of our new england families far removed from any feeling of want or suffering but though not trained in real indigence they might be trained to self-dependence they might and always ought to be trained to make their own beds make and mend their own garments make bread and in fact to attend to the whole usual routine of duties involved in the care of themselves and a family but is it so are not all these things done to a vast extent either by servants hired girls or the mother and if the mother employs her daughters in assisting her is it not apt to just be so far as is convenient to herself and no father in short who can often find the individual mother or daughter who considers hard work care and obstacles and difficulties such as all the world acknowledge are required in order to form good and useful character is anything but task work and drudgery a curse and not a blessing to mankind true it is and greatly to be lamented that many of our young women are not well able for want of physical vigour and energy to encounter poverty and hardship and obstacles and suffering but this deteriorated condition of female character in new england is owing in no small degree to the very kind of education miseducation rather of which i am now complaining would mothers do their duty could they do it i mean in the midst of abundance the state of things would be very much altered for the better it is not uncommon in the schools of europe especially the female schools to assign each older pupil the care of some younger one for whom she is more or less responsible particularly as to behaviour this leads in no small degree to self-effort and self-dependence and it might be practised in families as well as in schools with equally good effects but there is another course which is better still in many respects it is not unusual in our new england families where there are several daughters when they are all employed at all i mean about household concerns to have them all employed at the same thing at once thus if breakfast is to be prepared all are to engage in it one goes this way another that and another that and it sometimes happens that they cross each other's path and come into actual conflict one goes for one thing another for another and so on and it is not uncommon for two or three to go for the same article that three or four females may thus spend all their time for an hour or more in getting breakfast when one alone would do it much more quietly and a great deal better and in little more time than is occupied by the whole of them is not the worst of the evil the great trouble is that no one is acquiring the habit of self-dependence on the contrary they are acquiring so strong a habit of doing things in company they hardly know how to do them otherwise true there is pleasure connected with this sort of dependence and most persons are exceedingly fond of it but the question is whether it is useful 
and not whether it is or is not pleasurable is it best for young women to become so much accustomed to assist merely in cooking and in performing other household offices as to feel even at thirty years of age as if they could do nothing without the aid of others i hardly know what a young woman is to do who finds herself in the dependent condition of which i have been speaking the habit is not very likely to be broken so long as she remains in a place where it was formed i have however seen such a habit successfully broken up in one instance and perhaps it may be useful to relate it a young friend and neighbour of mine in a family where there were several young men of nearly the same age happening to find out the evil of doing the smaller work of the morning and evening in this company manner that what was everybody's business in the language of a common maxim was nobody's resolved on a change he accordingly proposed to his companions to take turns in doing the work one was to do it faithfully the whole of it for a month another for the next month and so on the plan succeeded most admirably each became accustomed to a degree of responsibility and each began to acquire the habit of doing things independently without the aid of a dozen others perhaps this method might be generally introduced into families as it already has been in substance into some of our boarding schools it is at least worth while for a young woman who perceives her need of such an arrangement to attempt it to be suddenly required to make a batch of bread or wash the garments or cook the victuals of a household and feel at twenty years of age utterly at a loss how to perform the whole routine of these familiar household duties must be both distressing to herself and painful to others of course it is not desirable to see our young women all orphans and brought up as domestics for the sake of having them brought up in such a way to be good for something instead of being the poor dependent beings they too commonly are yet it were greatly to be desired that without the disadvantages of orphans and service in families they could have the energy and self-dependence of such persons allow me to relate for your instruction a few anecdotes respecting an individual who was to all intents and purposes an orphan but who was nevertheless more useful in life and more happy than a hundred or a thousand of some of those passive mortals who th float through life on the streams of abundance without feeling the agitation of tide or current and only discover the misery of such a course when they fall into the gulf of insignificance this individual had been abandoned by one of her parents very early in life and had been also early separated by poverty from the other she had lived in various families and had been compelled to hard labour and sometimes to menial services at length she married a person as poor as herself though not so independent he had been bred in the midst of ease and was consequently indolent but she was determined on going ahead in the world and her ambition at length aroused her husband the latter now engaged in hard labour by the day or the month among his neighbours while the wife took care of the concerns at home this continued for fifteen or sixteen years before their joint labours procured land enough for the husband to work on at home in the meantime however they had a number of children and the mother's care and labours of course increased for several of the first of these months the husband was seldom at home to assist or encourage her in the summer except during the sabbath and occasionally at evening so that though this diminished the labour of cooking it left her with her children wholly on her hands and a great deal of unavoidable labour such as washing and ironing the latter work she did for her husband as well as for the children and herself and it was therefore an item of considerable moment especially as she was obliged to bring water for this and all her domestic purposes in pails a distance of twenty five or thirty rods a part of the year and of ten rods or so the other part besides which she had to pick up much of her wood for the six summer months in the woods nearly a quarter of a mile distant carry it home in her arms and to cut it for the fireplace added to this was the labour of brewing once or twice a week for in those days when poverty denied cider to a family the beer barrel was regarded as indispensable nor were her domestic concerns properly so called her only labours she spun and wove cloth for the use of her family besides weaving some for her neighbours she also spun and wove a great deal of coarse cloth at shares 
and thus purchased a large amount of the smaller necessaries of the families and not a little of the clothing she continued this course i say something like fifteen years never to my knowledge unless she was actually sick did she receive any assistance in her labours not so much as the day's work of washing and yet under all these advantages she reared almost without help even from the children themselves as the difference between the oldest and the youngest was only about eight years a family of four children i have sometimes wondered how she accomplished so much by her own unaided efforts but the whole secret lay in her power of self-dependence she could do everything alone she had been trained to it she was truly independent as much so perhaps as a female can be in this world i might have added that notwithstanding these incessant labours i have often known her walk four or five miles to church on the sabbath and home again in the same manner that she was neat and orderly and that she found much time to read and converse with her children and for social visiting reader i do not ask you to imitate this veteran matron for it would be too much to ask of any individual in any age especially the present but i ask you and with great earnestness to acquire the power of self-dependence and to do it immediately make her a matter of conscience bear constantly in mind that whatever has been done may be done shame on those who knowing the value of self-dependence and having the power to acquire it pass through life so shiftless that they cannot do the least thing without aid the aid of a host of relatives or menials it is quite time that woman should understand her power and her strength and govern herself accordingly it is quite time for her to stand up in her native heaven-born dignity and show to the world and to angels even as well as to men for what woman was made and wherein consists her true excellence end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bria Snow. Chapter Eleven: Reasoning and Originality. I know not why a young woman should not reason correctly as well as a young man, and yet I must confess that somehow or other a masculine seems to be often attached to the thought of strong reasoning powers in the female sex to say of such or such a young woman she is a bold and powerful reasoner would it not be a little more uncommon would it be received as a compliment would it not be regarded as a little out of the way and to coin a term rather unfeminine perhaps the habit of boldly tracing effects up to their causes and of reasoning upon them is a little more uncommon among the young misses of our boarding schools of our more fashionable families both of city and country than among those of the plainest sort of people certain it is at all events that the former would be regarded as reasoning persons with much more reluctance than the latter and yet the former has probably been taught mathematics and all those sciences which are supposed to develop and strengthen the mental faculties and give energy to the reasoning powers for myself i have many doubts whether we are really or for the sex themselves are i mean so much the gainers by the superficial knowledge of modern days which tends to the exclusion in the result of that good old-fashioned education the housework which was given by the mothers of england in the days of her primitive beauty and glory then were our young women for the times reasoning women then were they good for something a few of those precious relics of a comparatively golden age have come down nearly to our own times I have even seen several of them since the beginning of the nineteenth century. There is one of this description, more than eighty years of age, now living with a son of hers in one of the middle states. Her sphere of action, however, in the days of her activity, lay not there, but on one of those delightful hills which are found at the termination of the Green Mountain Range in New England. There, in her secluded country residence, among plain people, and with only plain means, with her husband absent much of the time she educated not instructed merely nor brought up at school but educated a large family of children most of whom lived to bless her memory and the world so devoted was this woman to her household duties and to the right education of her family that for eleven of the first and hardest years of her life she never for once left the hill on which she dwelt a mile or so in extent 
and yet this female was a woman of reasoning power superior to those of most men she understood thoroughly every ordinary topic of conversation and could discuss well any subject which came within her grasp she has been for a few years past one of my most regular and most valued correspondents and nothing but her great age and great reluctance to put pen to paper would i presume prevent her from writing more frequently than she is accustomed to as a specimen of her style i venture to insert a paragraph or two from her letters the first was written when she was in her eightieth year i am glad to find you in the enjoyment of health able to be busily and usefully employed for this and coming generations i would like if it was god's will to be usefully employed in such ways too but though i am so greatly favoured as to be able to think as well as ever i cannot labour with my hands so as to have to give to him that needeth because my hands are weak and lame once i could fill six sheets of letter paper in a day without weariness but now if i can fill this sheet decently in two days i am ready to boast of it as an achievement when i look back and see my former activity i wonder if that was myself and am almost ready to doubt my identity but everything in its course first rising into life then decaying the world itself is not to stand for ever and of course the things animate and inanimate which are upon it must partake of its transitoriness again when she was in a few weeks of eighty years of age which was in january eighteen thirty eight she wrote to me in the following vein of playfulness as i can invent nothing new i must utter such truisms as i have picked up by the way in almost eighty years for you say to me right and of course i obey and scribble on now i say to you and may say it to mrs a too write write very sensibly by the way for old as i am i am a sharp critic i read in my early days lord kames's elements and i have been working up these elements ever since and if i cannot invent i can understand what is fairly presented to me so you will receive this as a caution but don't be afraid i'll tell you another thing of which perhaps you are not aware i had rather have one letter warm from the heart than a dozen from the head i was delighted to think you were pleased with my philosophy for i never dreamed i uttered any as to my politics i was pretty well drilled in the school of washington after seeing through the revolutionary struggle and that was no mean school i assure you washington was a statesman i see but few now but when i do see one i make him my best courtesy and as to my theology i learn that from the pilgrim fathers now whether those of my younger readers of a new generation who perhaps almost despise both letter writing and reasoning whether any of these i say will see either form or comeliness anything in writing in these paragraphs i cannot say but i can tell them at once that i do and it sometimes seems to me that no greater human benefaction could be offered to mankind than the application of those principles and methods of female education in family and school which would produce such minds and bodies as those of which we have in the case of this aged woman as her example perhaps however it is almost useless to hope for better times at present for reasons among others which are given in another place by my aged correspondence the mischief nowadays she says is that every one is on a railroad impelled by steam power and cannot stop so all speak at once and none hear what a state this is but it is true of the world in general i see but few who are self-possessed i wonder when i see any one who is so and i wonder if i am so myself but we are not only unwilling to stay to hear we are unwilling to stay to teach it would be no hard matter for parents and teachers especially by beginning early to establish in the young of both sexes habits of right reason i am afraid however that parents and teachers themselves do not perceive the value of such a habit and that they are not likely to do so for some time to come all however which remains for me to do i must do this is to press upon the few whose ear i can gain the importance of this part of self-education do not despise the idea of reasoning on subjects which come before you nor think it masculine or old-fashioned not only accustom yourselves to reason but to reason on everything there is almost as great a difference between a young woman who takes all things upon trust 
scarcely knowing that she can use her own powers in the investigation of truth and one who has been like my worthy and venerable correspondent in the habit of observing and reasoning seventy or eighty years as there is between a sam patch and a bowditch or a hottentot and a newton would that our young women knew this and would conduct themselves accordingly there is nothing in the wide field of human improvement which better repays the labour of cultivation than the reasoning powers nor is there any thing which does more to perfect and adorn the human being with the highest and noblest rational powers the human family especially the female part of it seems to me to accomplish least happily the great work for which they were created than any other earthly existences the little all of knowledge which pertains to the lower animals flows in at once says dr young whereas were man to live coeval with the sun the patriarch pupil might be learning still yet dying leave his lessons half unlearned and yet the former fill happily the sphere which god in nature assigned to them while the latter with all his capacities and powers of reason conscience etc wanders incessantly from his orbit and must be a most unsightly spectacle to god and holy angels and all other high and noble intelligences when will man return to his native sphere and the moral and intellectual world move in due harmony and happiness like the physical when will each moral creation of the divine architect move round its great spiritual centre with the same beauty and majesty and glory which is manifest in the motions of the physical world never i am sure till mothers and teachers who are as it seems the authors alike of human happiness and human misery come up to their appropriate work and never will there be such mothers until young women are better trained and the latter will never be trained till the work of education especially of self-education is undertaken with much better views of its objects and ends and with a thousand times more earnestness and perseverance and i might even say enthusiasm than has yet been manifested end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by bria snow chapter twelve invention is it not strange that in a world where have been sought out time immemorial so many inventions so few should as yet have been originated by woman what have the inventive powers of woman accomplished even within what have usually been regarded as her own precincts has she invented many special improvements in the art of housekeeping have the labours of knitting sewing making mending washing cooking etc been materially facilitated or rendered more effective by her ingenuity has she done much to advance the important art of bread-making towards perfection why has she not done more is genius confined to our sex nay is there even no common ingenuity out of the range of our own walks has not the young woman when she begins the world the same mental faculties in number and kind with the young man how happens it then that the world is filled with inventions and so few of them originated by woman there is a wide range for improvement in that departure of human labour which has usually been confined to the female sex especially in the department of infant education nor is there any department in which the invention would tell with so much efficiency in the cause of human happiness as in that let our young women consider this and let them resolve on inventing something in their own particular sphere which shall turn to the general account when i speak of the appropriate sphere of woman and of her taxing her powers of invention there i would by no means indulge myself in any narrow or circumscribed views in regard to her field of operation i should have no sort of objection to the application of her inventive powers to the work of facilitating the usual labours of the other sex particularly in the departments of agriculture and horticulture but i do not perceive any necessity for this i believe there is work enough profitable and philanthropic work too to, to task woman's power of invention for many centuries without her going out of her appropriate sphere in the art of cookery especially 
which certainly has a great deal to do with physical education and physical improvement, there is great room for the exercise of her inventive powers. This important art is, as yet, entirely in its infancy, and where any progress has been made, it has been chiefly in a wrong direction and under the guidance of wrong principles. Be it yours, young woman, to give this matter a right direction, and to bring it to bear as efficiently on the happiness of mankind as it has hitherto on their slow destruction. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bria Snow. Chapter Thirteen: Observation and Reflection. Keep your eyes open with the reiterated counsel of a distinguished theologian of this country, the late Dr. Timothy Dwight, to a young student of his, and it was in the main very wholesome advice. And in so far as it is wholesome for young men. I do not see, but it is equally so for young women. Your countenance open, your thoughts close, you will go safe through the world, was the advice of another individual of less eminence to a young friend of his. And did it not savour a little too much of selfishness, and perhaps of concealment, it would, like the advice of Dr. Dwight, be worthy of careful consideration. It does not partake quite enough of the gospel spirit and sentiment. As a man hath received, so let him give. It encourages us to get wisdom, but not to communicate it. I have said that the advice of Dr. Dwight was, in the main, wholesome. The only objection that can be made to it is that it gives no encouragement to reflection. Some may suppose it to mean that observation or seeing is everything. Now there are those who appear to see too much. They always have their eyes open. They are never satisfied otherwise. They absolutely hate all reflection. Of this description of persons, I am sorry to say, our young women furnish a full proportion. Not a very small number of the female sex are so educated that it is quite painful for them to turn the current of their thoughts inward. They will do almost anything in the world, not absolutely criminal, to prevent it. It cannot, indeed, be quite said that they observe too much, but it is perfectly safe to say that they see too much they should see much less with their eyes, and the soul were left to its own reflections, the result would be, no doubt, exceedingly happy. Solitude is as necessary as action, and to both sexes. No person is more pitiable than the individual of either sex, and such individuals are by no means scarce in our own, who cannot be easy unless perpetually running to see some new sight, or like the Athenians of old, to hear or to tell some new thing, who is nowhere so happy as when in company, and nowhere so miserable as when alone. Zimmerman, in his work on solitude, a pleasant book, by the way, notwithstanding its gloomy name, has some very appropriate and useful remarks on the advantages of being by ourselves a part of the time as a means of improvement. Should any of my young readers be sorely afflicted with the disease I have just mentioned, a dread of themselves, or of their own thoughts, rather, I beg them to read Zimmerman but read him, if you read him at all, very thoroughly. Some persons read solely to get rid of reflection. Worse than this, even, some persons read, work, and play, and I had almost said, go to church, and put themselves in the attitude of praise and prayer, to get rid of themselves and their reflections. Who will show us any good thing, is their constant cry, not who will lead us by external agencies, or by any other means, to sound and useful reflection, who will show us ourselves is a cry which, among the young women of New England, as well as those of most other countries, is too seldom heard. The best advice I can give to such persons, next to that given in the Sermon on the Mount, where they are directed to enter into their closet, is to read with great care, or rather to study, what's on the improvement of the mind. That is a work which has probably done as much good in the way of which I am now speaking than any book the Bible accepted, and the English language. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Detraction and Scandal Let it not be supposed for one moment that I consider young women 
as more generally in the habit of detraction than other people for i venture on no comparisons of the kind all i presume to take for granted is that they are often exceedingly faulty in this respect and need counsel and caution were there any doubts on the latter point one would think they might very readily be removed by reading the excellent work of amelia opie entitled detraction displayed or a cure for scandal this detraction or scandal is so common everywhere in life that multitudes are addicted to it without the shadow of a suspicion that they are so thousands and thousands of young women whose hearts would recoil at the bare recital of deeds of butchery and blood nay who would faint at the sight of the severities not to say cruelties which under the guise of parental discipline or on the plea of authority are often and hourly afflicted on the bodies of young and old who will yet rob and murder their unoffending neighbours for there is no little truth in what shakespeare says so pungently who steals my purse steals trash tis something not, nothing twas mine tis his it may be slave to thousands but he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed nor is there less truth in what the evangelist says that whoso hateth his brother and does not a slanderer hate is a murderer i know it may seem harsh to fasten on any class of the community and above all on the young of either sex the charge of robbery or murder but is it not proper that the truth should be told and if there is such a propensity in us to competition in its very forms that not only thoughts but words of detraction are as it were for ever on our thoughtless tongues and lips and we will not though often warned set a guard over the latter is it not right that we should be represented as the robbers of reputation and if there is such a disposition to try to be first in the community and compel those around us to take the second place the lower seat as generates envy and hatred the seeds of murder is it not right to warn the young of their danger and when we find them callous to our representations of the truth when we find their hearts almost as unmoved as the firm rocks they tread on notwithstanding our most faithful exhibitions of human depravity as is evinced by the slander the detraction and the calumny which everywhere prevail and which many must see as in a glass to prevail in their own bosoms while yet their very blood recoils at the tales of imaginary woe from the pen of bulwer or from some other novelist of kindred fame is it not proper to remind people of what the evangelist says of hatred that it is murder burns the poet sought some power who would bestow on us the gift to see ourselves as others see us poor burns this was as high as he could be expected to go but how much more to be desired is it that we could see ourselves as god sees us not indeed at once lest the very sight should sink us forthwith into everlasting night but by degrees rather as we may be able to endure it how much to be desired is it i say especially by the young that we might see how prone we are to enter into competition particular or general with the community and how apt we are with almost every success and in almost every conceivable form to throw the good character and merits and success even of others into the shade how can those whose young hearts beat high in anticipation of a good name even in this world be willing to jeopardize their character by the commission of so much meanness i did not enter into particulars especially when the valuable work of mrs opie is before the world let me refer those who entertain doubt whether after all i am not among the very sort of detractors whom i am censuring with so much severity or whether what i complain of in the individual as abusive on here and there a neighbour or acquaintance i am not pouring by wholesale and with a spirit not a whit better upon a whole community let me refer all such i say to that invaluable work 
let me also refer them to themselves i am sure no one can carefully examine and analyze her own most secret feelings without discovering in herself a spirit of detraction in some form or other if it be only in the form of genteel slander envy or discontent if there be those who do not find it so with themselves and who say that however it may be with others they are not thus circumstanced or thus guilty i pity them most sincerely as grossly ignorant of themselves such persons i have only and lastly to refer to that volume of divine truth which assures us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and which asks with the most pertinent significance not to say eloquence who can know it end of chapter fourteen Chapter fifteen of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen The Right Use of Time. On this subject, the right use of time, sermons, not to say volumes, without number have been written, and yet it is still true, as an eminent poet has well said, that the individual is yet unborn who duly weighs an hour. But my business is not so much to dwell at large on the value of time in its larger divisions such as days and hours as to urge in the first place an attention to moments take care of the pence says an old but just maxim and the pounds will take care of themselves it is somewhat so in regard to time take care of the moments and the hours and days will take care of themselves not indeed that hours and even days are not wasted and worse than wasted but the great error is in disregarding the value and slighting the use of those smaller fragments of which hours days and years are made show me individual young or old who sets anything like a just value on moments of time and you will show me the person who values in a proper manner its larger divisions i have ventured upon this hackneyed subject because i have often thought that young women more if possible than most other young persons need to be reminded at the unspeakable importance of moments it is only a minute or two many will say or seem to say and so they let time pass unemployed but these leisure moments are frequently recurring and the more they are slighted and wasted the more they will be and what is worse as she who frequently says it is only a minute and who makes this serve as an apology for wasting it will soon extend the same apology to much larger portions of time the current of human nature is ever downward that those who love improvement and desire to be improved remember it is so and let them ever be mindful in this respect of their danger there are thousands who suffer themselves to waste shreds of time which might be applied to the attainment of knowledge valuable knowledge or to the work of doing good in a world where so much good needs to be done who would not be willing to waste the smallest sum of money i would not speak lightly of the habit of wasting money but it must be admitted by all that she who wastes without remorse of conscience her precious moments which might be usefully employed if not in action at least in conversation or reading or reflection and yet would not on any account waste a cent of money is justly chargeable in a moral point of view was straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel for it should never be forgotten that however valuable money may be time is much more so it is much more so even as a means of doing good there are very many persons it is true who seem to think otherwise who seem not to think that they can do good with anything but money let us reflect however that no charity is more truly valuable than visiting and aiding the sick encouraging the depressed instructing the ignorant etc now is not she who does the latter more sure of doing good than she who only gives the former in the latter case she bestows the very thing which is truly needful in the former case she only bestows that which is a means of doing good these means may or may not be properly applied of this the donor cannot be certain but when instead of giving money 
or doing good by proxy she does it herself the work is done and done in her own way and if not done well she is responsible she is not made in that case responsible for her neighbours but is all time wasted that is not spent in action as some of my remarks might seem to imply by no means i have already spoken in this chapter of the use of time for reflection and in preceding one have dwelt more especially on the value of solitude at certain seasons what i mean to urge is the folly of trifling away time in absolutely doing nothing there is a sort of listlessness perhaps more properly reverie in which many indulge which is as sinful as it is unprofitable and there are modes of thinking and subjects of thought which are to say the least unworthy of a rational intelligent and immortal spirit i am not sure that there are not times very short seasons i mean during our waking hours even with those who are in tolerable health when we best serve god and our fellow-men by doing absolutely nothing at all i am not sure i say that thus may not be the case still if it is so we should be exceedingly careful not to run into excess in this respect an error which seems to be almost inevitable for one who spends too little time in doing nothing it is believed a thousand spend too much in this way but let it never be forgotten that not only for every idle word but for every misspent moment we are according to scripture to render an account in the day when god will judge the secrets of each heart according to the gospel of our lord and saviour jesus christ how valuable how immensely valuable will a few only of those moments which we now let slip with so much readiness appear to us in that great day what would we not then give for them five minutes here spent in listlessness or in doing absolutely nothing five there spent in idle or wicked conversation and five there in unnecessary attentions to our person or dress how are the ghosts as it were of these departed seasons haunt and torture us though willing to give worlds to recall them not only for the sake of our own souls but for those of others thousands of worlds cannot buy them no not one solitary five minutes happy is she who wastes not that she may want not here or hereafter end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by Bria Snow Chapter 16 Love of Domestic Concerns I have incidentally made a few remarks on this subject elsewhere, but its importance demands a further and more attentive consideration. There are numerous reasons which might be mentioned why a young woman ought to cultivate a love of domestic life and of domestic concerns but I shall only advert to a few of them. 1. Every young woman should have some avocation or calling. The Jews formerly had a proverb that whoever of their sons was not bred to a trade was bred to the gallows, but both Mohammedans and pagans have maxims among them which amount to the same thing. But is that which is so destructive to the character of young men I mean the want of proper employment, entirely harmless to young women? It surely cannot be. True is, and deeply to be regretted, that there is a fashionable feeling abroad which is the reverse of all this. Both men and women in fashionable life are apt to regard all labour, not only manual, but mental, as mere drudgery. They will labour, perhaps, if they cannot help it, but seldom if they can. Or at least, there seems to be their feeling when they begin a course of industrious action. Some, it is confessed, finally come so much accustomed to action that they continue it either as a matter of mere habit, or because its discontinuance would now render them as miserable as they were in breaking up their natural indolence and in forming their present industrious habits. 2. She should love the concerns and cares of domestic life because no ordinary employment contributes more 
on the whole, to female health. I do not mean to say that there is no other kind of employment which could be rendered equally healthy with doing housework, but only that, as a whole, and especially in the present state of public sentiment, this is decidedly the best. Perhaps in some circumstances, moderate labour, labour portioned to her strength in the field or in the garden, might be healthier were she trained to it, but as things and customs are now, this can hardly be done. 3. The employment is a pleasant one. It has at once all the advantages of a shelter from the severe cold of winter and of seclusion from the sultry sun of summer and the storms of winter and summer both. Footnote. Perhaps it may be said that woman actually suffers more from the extremes of heat and cold than man, notwithstanding her seclusion. This may be true, but I still think her constitution is not quite as liable to injury from the weather as that of man, besides which she is rather less liable to accidents. End footnote. And not only is the housekeeper favoured in these respects, but in many others. A pleasant, well-ordered home is perhaps the most perfect representation of the felicity of the heaven above which the earth affords. At any rate, it is a source of very great happiness, and woman, when she is what she should be, is thus made a conspicuous agent in communicating that happiness. Are not then home and the domestic concerns of home desirable? Are they not agreeable? Or if not, should not every young woman strive to make them so? How then does it happen that an idea of meanness is attached to them? How does it happen that almost every young woman who can gets rid of them, as almost every young man does of farming and other manual labour? Home affords to young women the means and opportunities of intellectual improvement. I do not mean to affirm that the progress they can make in mere science amid domestic concerns will be quite as great in a given time, say one year, as it might be in many of our best schools. But I do mean to say that it might be rapid enough for every practical purpose. I might say also that young women who study a little every day under the eye of a judicious mother and teach that little to their brothers and sisters will be more truly wise at the end of their pupilage than they who only study books in the usual old-fashioned, I might say rather new-fashioned, manner. It is in these circumstances more strikingly than elsewhere that teaching we give and giving we retain. 5. But once more, she who is employed in the domestic circle is more favourably situated, I mean if the domestic circle is what it should be, for social improvement, than she could be elsewhere. She may not, it is true, hold so much converse on the fashions or be a means of inventing, or especially of retailing, so much petty scandal as in some other situation, or in other circumstances. Still, the society of home will be better and more truly refined than if it were more hollow and affected and insincere, in other words, made up of more fashionable materials. If to be fashionable is to distort nature as much as possible, and if the most fashionable society is that which is thus distorted in the highest degree, then it must be admitted that home cannot always be the best place for the education of young women. 6. But lastly, young women should love domestic life and the care and society of the young because it is, without doubt, the intention of divine providence that they should do so and because home and the concerns of home afford the best opportunities and means of moral improvement prerogative of women, the peculiar province which God in nature has assigned her, has been already alluded to with sufficient distinctness. Let every reader then follow out the hint, and ask herself whether it is not important that she should love the place and circumstances thus assigned her, or whether she who hates them is likely to derive from them the great moral lessons they are eminently designed to inculcate. Is it asked what moral lessons, so mightily important, can be learned in the nursery and in the kitchen? In return, I may ask, 
what lessons of instruction are there which may not be learned there and what moral virtues may not there be cultivated every family is a world in miniature and all the necessary trials of temper and of the character are usually found within its circle are we the slaves of appetite here is the place for learning the art of self-government are we fretful here we may learn patience for a great fund of patience is often demanded and the more so as we are apt here to be off our guard and to yield to our unhappy feelings there are thousands who succeed very well in governing themselves their temper and their passions while the eye of the world is upon them who nevertheless fail most culpably in this respect when at home secluded as they seem to think themselves from observation hence the importance of great effort to keep ourselves in subjection in these circumstances and hence too the value of a well-ordered and happy home are we over fond of excitement home is a sufficient cure for this or may be made so to those who ardently desire that it should be are we desirous of forming our character upon the model of heaven we are assured from the author of holy writ that the kingdom of heaven consists in that simplicity confidence faith and love which distinguish the child in short to repeat the sentence there is no place on earth so nearly resembling the heaven above as a well-ordered and happy family if your lot is cast in such a family young reader be thankful for the favour and strive to make the most of it not merely as a preparation for standing at the head of such a family yourself not merely as a preparation for the work of teaching although for this avocation i know of nothing better not merely because it is your duty and you feel you must do it but because it is for your happiness yes even for your life all character is formed in the school of trial all good or valuable character especially and i repeat the sentiment in no place or department of this school are circumstances so favourable for such a purpose as what may emphatically be termed the home department the family and the church are god's own institutions all else is more or less of human origin not therefore of necessity useless but more or less imperfect she who would obey the will of god in forming herself according to the divine model must learn to value those institutions in some measure as they are valued by him and love them with a degree of the same love wherewith he loves them it will here be seen that i value domestic avocations so highly giving them as i do the preference over all other female employments not as an end but as a means it is because they secure far better other things being alike the grand result at which every female should perpetually aim the attainment of excellence it is because they educate us far better physically socially and morally and with proper pains and right management they might do so intellectually than any other employment for the great future towards which we are every day hastening this home school is after all which has been said of schools and education not only the first and best school especially for females but emphatically the school it is the nursery from which are to be transplanted by and by the plants which are to fill and beautify and perfect if any perfection in the matter is attained all our gardens and fields and render them the fields and gardens of the lord too much has not been too much cannot be said it appears to me in favour of this home department of female education especially as a means of religious improvement young women thus trained would not only be most fitly prepared for the employment which as a general rule they are to follow for life but for every other employment to which they can and the good providence of god ever be called no matter what is to be their situation no matter even if it is merely mechanical as in some factory or as an amanuensis this apprenticeship in the family is not only highly useful but as it seems to me indispensable is not mind 
and health and self-government yes and self-knowledge too as indispensable to the individual who is confined to a bench or desk as to any person who is more active nay are they not even much more so since sedentary employments have in themselves as respects mind and character a downward and narrowing and contracting tendency end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by Breer. chapter seventeen frugality and economy economy is another old-fashioned word which like the thing for which it stands is fast going into disrepute and in these days it will require no little moral courage in him who has anything of reputation at stake to commend it and above all to commend it to young women what have they to do with economy thousands might be disposed to ask with a subject urged upon their attention is there not something connected with the idea of economy which tends necessarily to narrow the mind and contract the heart this question too is often asked even by those whom age and experience should have taught better things I am pained to find the rising generation so prone to discard both frugality and economy, and to regard them as synonymous with narrowness and meanness and stinginess. There cannot possibly be a greater mistake. May I not ask, without incurring the charge of irreverence, if there is anything more obvious in the works of the Creator than his wonderful frugality and good economy? Where in his domain is anything wasted? where indeed is not everything saved and appropriated to the best possible purpose and will any one presume to regard his operations as narrow or mean or stingy what can be more abundant for example than air and water yet is there one particle too much of either of them is there one particle more than is just necessary to render the earth what it was designed to be such a thing may be said i acknowledge by the ignorant and short-sighted and incautious. They have vent their occasional complaints even against the ruler of the skies because the windows of heaven are for a short time shut up and the rain falls not. Yet these very persons are constrained to admit in their more sober moments that all is ordered about right. Be this as it may, however, there can be no doubt that a just measure of frugality and economy is a cardinal virtue and should be early inculcated, even though it cost us some time and effort. A great deal has been said, and no small number of words wasted in endeavouring to show the folly of spending two pence to save one, whereas to do so, in some circumstances, may be our highest wisdom. If it be important to learn the art of saving, the art of being frugal than the art should be acquired even if it costs something in the acquisition no one thinks of reaping the full reward of adult labour in any occupation the moment he begins to put his hand to it as a mere apprentice does he not thus in learning his occupation or trade especially during the first years spend two pence to save one does not all preparation for the future obviously involve the same necessity i do not certainly undertake to say it is always proper or indeed that it is often so to spend more in order to save less i only contend that it is sometimes so and that to do so may not only be a matter of propriety but also a duty let me give an example young women are sometimes apt to acquire a habit of being wasteful in regard to small things such as pins needles etc Yet to teach them in these days of refinement always to pick up pins when they see them lying before them on the floor or elsewhere, and put them into a pin cushion or in some suitable place would no doubt be considered as quite unreasonable. But would not such a habit be exceedingly useful? I might be told that it would be a great waste since the value of the time consumed in thus picking up pins and needles would be more than twice the value of the articles saved. I might be told that this is not only spending two pence to save one, but that it is actually wicked. 
and if so, by what art shall a wasteful young woman be taught good habits? I will certainly urge a young girl who is careless about pins, needles, etc., to form the habit of picking up every one she found. I would do so to prevent her prodigal habits from extending to other matters, and affecting and injuring her whole character. But I would also do so to cure the bad habit already existing. More than even this, I advise if a young woman who finds herself addicted to habits which are opposed to a just frugality and economy to begin the work of eradicating them, without waiting for the promptings of her mother and friends, nor let her for a moment fear the imputation of meanness. It is sufficient for her that she is doing what she knows to be right. Good habits, as well as bad ones, like virtues and vices, are apt to go in company. If one is allowed, others are apt to follow. First, those that are most nearly related, next, next those more remotely so, and finally, perhaps, the whole company. I would not dwell long on a subject like this in a book for young women, were I not assured that the case requires it. I see young women everywhere, especially among the middling and higher classes, and in great numbers too, exceedingly improvident, and not a few of them wasteful. The world seems to be regarded as a great storehouse which can never be exhausted. Let them be as extravagant as they may. They forget entirely the vulgar but correct adage that always taking out of the meal tub and never putting in soon comes to the bottom, and seem to take it for granted there is no bottom to their resources. Our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers rather, were not ashamed of frugality or economy. They were neither afraid nor unwilling to do what they knew to be right, simply because it happened to be unfashionable. I am not indeed, if a constitutionally or by age, one of those who place the golden age exclusively in the past. I can see errors in the conduct of our grandmothers, but I also see in them excellencies, many virtues of the sterner and more sober sort, which have been bartered for modern customs, not to say vices, at a very great loss by the exchange. What we have thus lost, I should be glad, were it possible, to restore. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. R read by Brea Snow. Chapter eighteen System. There is hardly anything which the majority of our young women hate, frugality and economy and the study of themselves perhaps excepted, so much as system. In this respect, a few of our best schools have, within a few years, attempted something, and in a few instances, with success. I could mention several schools for females whose teachers have done much more good by the habits of order and system they have inculcated and endeavoured to form than by the sciences they have taught. The tendency of this excellent feature of a few of our institutions is, however, pretty effectually counteracted by the general feeling of the public that the school is but a place of painful though necessary restraint and that when it is over study is over and with it all the system which had been either inculcated or practised and though not a few who have been thus compelled to live by system for two or three years see plainly its excellent effects and both they and their parents acknowledge them Still, the school is no longer terminated, then everything of the kind is very likely to become as though it had never been. So long, however, as home is home, and all the associations therewith are as delightful as they are now, and so long as the greater number of our families live at random, regarding order as constraint and method and system as slavery, just so long will the feelings of the young of each rising generation revolt at everything like order and system, and though, for the sake of peace, as well as other and various reasons, they may be willing to conform to both for a time, yet will they sigh internally for the hour when their bondage shall cease and the day of their emancipation arrive. It is not in human nature to look back to scenes and customs and methods, 
if methods they deserved to be called, were all is at random, of early life, without a fondness for and an inward desire to return to them. And there are few so hardened as not to do it whenever an opportunity occurs. How important, then, how supremely so, is right education! How important to sow, in the earliest years, the seeds of a love of order and system! How important to young women, especially, that this work should not be deferred, since, if it is so, it is most likely to be deferred forever. I know full well that here and there a housekeeper convinced in her conscience that she can do vastly more for herself and others, as well as do it better by means of system, than without it attempt something like innovation upon the usual random course which prevailed about her. She resolves to have her hours of labour, her hours of recreation, and her hours of reading and visiting. She believes life is long enough for all the purposes of life. She is resolved to be systematic on Sabbath and weekdays in the common details of the family, in dress, and in regard to the hours of rising meals and rest. But she has a Herculean task to accomplish, no small part of which is to bring her husband and the other members of her family to cooperate with her. Yet, amid every discouragement, she perseveres and at length succeeds. Is not such a victory worth securing? Let the young woman who has such a person as I have just described for her mother rejoice in it. She can never be too grateful, not only to her mother, but to God. Her life is likely to be of thrice the usual value. Our daughters who are blessed with such mothers may be as polished cornerstones in a temple, worthy of themselves, of those who educate them, and of God. But let not those who have been less fortunate in respect to maternal training and influence utterly despair. Convinced of the general correctness of the views here advanced, and desirous of entering on the work of reform, let them take courage and begin it immediately. Though the mother, by her influence in the early formation of character, is almost omnipotent, she is not quite so. Though the Ethiopian cannot change his skin, nor the leopard his spots, Still, it is not utterly impossible for those to do well who have been long accustomed to do evil. What has been done, you know, can be done. Make this maxim your motto, and go forward in the work of self-education. But remember to begin, in the first place, with the smaller matters of life, and to conquer in one point or place of action before you begin with another. And lastly, remember not to rely wholly on your own strength. You are indeed to work, and to work with all your might, but it is always God that worketh in you, when anything effectual is accomplished in the way of improvement. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter 19. Punctuality. No system can be carried on without both order and punctuality. I have already said something, incidentally, on both these topics, but their importance entitles them to a separate consideration. The importance of strict punctuality could be shown by appealing to hundreds of authorities, but I prefer an appeal to the good sense of my readers. How painful it is in a thousand instances of life to be but one minute too late, and how much evil it may, indeed, often does occasion, both to ourselves and others. Quote, Think of the difference, says the spirited writer, between arriving with a letter one minute before the post office is closed and arriving one minute after between being at the stage office a quarter of an hour too soon and reaching there a quarter of an hour too late between shaking a friend heartily by the hand as he steps on board his vessel bound to the indies and arriving at the pier when the vessel is under way and stretching her wide canvas to the wind think of this and a thousand such instances and be determined through life to be in time. End quote. 
allow me to illustrate the important subject of which i am now treating by the case of a young mother she wishes to go from boston to lowell she leaves boston in the cars which go at eleven and reach lowell soon after twelve she goes to spend the afternoon with a sick friend there resolving to return at five the hour when the last cars leave lowell for boston her infant is left for the time in the hands of a maiden sister the husband being engaged in his shop and hardly knowing of her departure she spends the afternoon with her friends and her services are very acceptable but ere she is aware the bell at the railroad depot rings for passengers to boston a few moments are spent in getting ready and exchanging the parting salutation with those friends who though aware of the danger of her being left have not the honest plainness to urge her to make speed she is at length under way but on arriving at the depot lo the cars are started and are twenty or thirty rods distant what can she do time and tide and railroad cars wait for none it is in vain that she waves her handkerchief the swift-footed vehicles move on and are soon out of sight she returns much distressed to the house of her sick friend unfit to render her any further service to say nothing of the mischief she is likely to do by exciting her painful sympathies but how and when is she to get home there are no public means of conveyance back to the city till to-morrow morning and the expense of a private conveyance seems to her quite beyond her means how could i be so late she says to herself how could i run the risk of being thus left why was i not in season what will my husband think especially as i came off without saying anything to him about coming but this though much to distress her is not all nor the most her poor babe what will become of that her friends endeavour to soothe her by diverting her mind but to no purpose or nearly none she is half distracted and can do nothing but mourn over her folly in being too late but the weather is mild and all is propitious without except it is likely to be rather dark and by means of the efforts of thoughtful friends a coach is fitted out with a careful driver to carry her home this very evening it will take five hours in all and as it is now six she will reach home at about eleven the infant will not suffer greatly before that time finding herself fairly on the road her feelings are somewhat composed and she just now begins to think what her husband will do when he comes home from the shop at seven and finds she has not arrived she is afraid he will be at the extra pains and expense to come for her perhaps in the darkness pass by her and go on to lowell and her fears are partly realized after much anxiety and some complaining which however i will not undertake to justify the husband is on the road with her vehicle going to lowell to assist her in getting home they meet about half way from place to place the drivers recognize each other though rather more than in the darkness could have been expected the coach from lowell returns and that from boston taking in both passengers wheels them back in haste to their home in their joy to find matters no worse they forget to recriminate each other and think only of the timid sister with whom the infant was left in charge for in the hurry of getting off the husband had made no provision for quieting her fears of being alone she passes the time however in much less mental agitation than might have been expected and takes as good care as she can of a fretful crying half-starved babe as the clock strikes one the family are all quiet in bed and endeavouring to sleep how much uneasiness is here caused by being just about one minute and no more too late and whence came it not by her not knowing she was running a risk by being tardy not that she had no apprehensions of evil not because her conscience was uneducated or unfaithful it was neither nor any of these there was in the first place a little want of decision she suffered herself to vacillate between a sense of duty and the inclination to say a few words more or bestow another parting kiss and in the second place it was the wretched habit she had always indulged of delaying and deferring everything she put her head or hand to do till the very last moment I will give you a brief but correct account of her general habits not that the picture is a very uncommon one but you may view it in connection with the 
anecdote i have related and thus get a tolerable idea of the inconveniences to which the wretched habit of which i have spoken is continually exposing her she makes it a rule no i will not say that for she has no rules but she has a sort of expectation on the subject to rise at five o'clock yet i do not suppose she is up at five six times in the year she is never awake at that time or but seldom unless she is awakened her husband indeed makes it a sort of rule to wake her at that hour but he alas poor man has no rules for himself or others and if he undertakes to awaken her at five it is usually ten or fifteen minutes afterward and if she is left alone she is often in bed till half past five oftener indeed than up earlier the breakfast hour is six but i never knew the family to sit down at six it is ten minutes fifteen minutes thirty minutes or sometimes forty-five minutes after six before the breakfast is on the table the fire will not burn and the tea is not ready or the milk or cream for the latter has not arrived or something or other is the matter so she says and so she believes and indeed sometimes so it is the dinner time is half past twelve that is professedly so but it is not once in twenty times that they sit down much before one o'clock i have known it to be even later so it is with supper and i might add with everything else if an engagement is made directly or indirectly positively or only implied it is never fulfilled at the time she is never in her seat at church till almost everybody else is in and the services have commenced although the kind but too indulgent parson waits for some five or ten minutes for his whole congregation who alas he is unwittingly trained to delay in short she does nothing and performs nothing punctually not even going to bed for this is deferred to a very late hour sometimes till near midnight now herein is the secret the foundation rather of her trouble at lowell had she been trained to punctuality in other things she would in all probability have been punctual there the misfortune which i have described is but a specimen of what is ever and anon occurring in the history of her life nor are her sufferings though they are severe from her unhappy habit the end of the matter i have already more than intimated that her companion has caught the disease but it is still more visible in the conduct of her sons and daughters they like herself seldom do anything at the proper time they are never punctual in their engagements nor decided in their conduct i know not however what the daughters may yet do several of them being quite young if they should chance to meet with better instructions than they are accustomed to receive should take warning and do all they can in the way of self-improvement they may be able to break the chains of an inveterate and almost inconquerable habit and make themselves useful in their day and generation i do think most sincerely that if all the rest of the world were disorderly or fell short in matters of punctuality the young woman should not do so let her in every duty learn to be in time let her resolve to do everything a little before the time arrives nothing a moment after it the keeper of a boarding school who is at the same time the principal of one of our most flourishing schools for males and females makes it a point have every one of his boarders in their seats at dinner when the clock strikes twelve which is the appointed hour and the late principal of a very highly distinguished female school in boston used to have every exercise regulated by a clock kept in the room whatever else was going on whether it was finished or unfinished whenever the hour for another exercise arrived it was attended to the whole school as if with one impulse seemed to obey the hour rather than the teacher such order and punctuality everywhere and in everything constitute the beauty of life and i was going to say the beauty of heaven in which this life should be a sort of emblem heaven in any rate is not only a world of order but of punctuality also and she who goes there must be prepared to observe both or it will be no heaven to her as i have strongly insisted in respect to the formation of other important habits so in regard to this it must be commenced in the smaller matters of life let the young woman be in time that is be punctual in the performance of what she regards as trifles and when she becomes a matron she will seldom be tardy 
in what are deemed the weightier matters. I have spoken of the importance of punctuality, and have strongly insisted that whatever is worth doing at all is worth doing well. I am now about to insist with equal earnestness that what is worth beginning and performing well is worth doing thoroughly or finishing. Some young women never do anything thoroughly, even the smallest matters. All their lives long they live, as it were, by halves and do things by halves. If they commence reading a book, unless it is something very enticing or exciting, they neither read it thoroughly nor finish it. Their dress is never put on thoroughly, and even their meals are not thoroughly eaten. In regard to what is last mentioned, they fail in two respects, either from fear that they shall be unfashionable if they use their teeth, or from sheer carelessness in their habits, they never masticate their food thoroughly, and they never seem to get through eating. The true way is to finish a meal in a reasonable time, and then let the matter rest, and never be found eating between meals, whereas the class of persons of whom I am speaking seem to never begin or end a meal, they are nibbling if food chance to fall in their way all their lives long. But, to return to other habits than those which pertain to eating and drinking, this want of thoroughness of which I am speaking, wherever it exists in a young woman, will show itself in all or nearly all she does. Suppose she is washing dishes, for example, something is left unwashed which ought to have been washed, something is left only partly washed, or the whole being done in a hurry, something is not set away in its place, and along comes a child and knocks it over and breaks it. Perhaps she is sewing. She is anxious to get her work along, and though she knows how it ought to be done, she ventures to slight it, especially if it is the property of another. Or, having done it well till she comes near the end, the place, where perhaps everything ought to be particularly firm and secure, ought to be done thoroughly, she leaves a portion of it half done, and the garment gives way before it is half worn. Or she is cooking, and though everything else is well boiled, a single article is not well done, which gives an appearance of negligence to the whole. At any rate, it is not done well, and she gets the credit of not being a thorough housekeeper. Quote, For who hath despised the day of small things? End quote. Is a scriptural inquiry on a most important subject, and were it not likely to be construed into a want of reverence for sacred things, the same inquiry might be made in regard to the matter before us. There is a universal disposition abroad to despise small matters and to stigmatize him who defends their importance. One might suppose a young woman would find out the mischiefs that result from a want of thoroughness by the inconvenience which inevitably results from it. It is not very convenient or comfortable to be obliged to do a thing wholly over again or to suffer from want because a piece of work very trifling in itself was not done thoroughly nor is it convenient to go and wash one hand every time a lamp is used because it was not thoroughly cleaned or duly put in order when it should have been nor is it easy to clean an elegant carpet which has become soiled or to replace a valuable astral lamp or mirror which has been broken simply for the want of thorough attention in those who have the care of these things. The little inconveniences constantly recurring might rouse the person to reflection, one would think, as effectually as occasional larger one. We do not, however, always find it so. Young people ought to consider what a host of evils sometimes result from a slight neglect. The trite saying, quote, for want of a nail the shoe was lost, for want of a shoe the horse was lost, and for want of a horse the rider was lost. End quote. Will, however, illustrate this part of my subject. Had the single nail which was omitted, the last one, been driven and driven properly, had the work, in short, been done thoroughly, the shoe, horse, and rider might have all been preserved. Do not dread the imputation of being over nice or whimsical if you do your work thoroughly. You must learn to regard your own sense of right, your regard to duty as a thing of far more importance than either the sneers or the approbation of thousands of the unthinking. I have heard an individual of great worth and respectability complain of a young friend of his because he made it a point to finish thoroughly everything he undertook, and charge him with what he called a mania for finishing. 
I remember, too, a very worthy and in the main excellent farmer, who used to complain of a very conscientious son of his, because, forsooth, he was determined to finish everything he began in the best possible manner, without paying much regard to the opinions of others. But these facts only show that wise and good men may not fully understand the nature and power of habit, or the necessity of being thorough in small as well as larger matters. The first individual I have named was for ever suffering from his own want of thoroughness, and was miserable through life, and the last would have been far happier all his lifetime had he been as much disposed to finish the things he undertook as his son. End of chapter 19《Chapter Twenty of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bria Snow.《The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence》Chapter Twenty Exercise This is a highly important subject, and it is connected with an unusual variety of topics. I beg the reader to exercise a little patience, therefore, if on this account, I extend it to an unusual length. It should not be forgotten that the human body is moved from place to place at the direction of the will through the intervention of what are called muscles, of which there are in connection with the whole human frame from four hundred to five hundred. They are long bundles or portions of lean flesh, usually a little flattened and somewhat rounded at their ends and terminating at one end, often at both, in a harder, flatter, white substance called tendon, which is fastened to the bone. But I need not, and indeed I cannot, in a work like this, enter upon a minute account of the human frame, or of any considerable portion of it, especially so considerable a portion of it as the bony and muscular systems. For such information, I must refer the reader to the work alluded to in a previous chapter, The House I Live In, and, if a leisure time will justify it, to still more extended works on anatomy and physiology, which can be easily obtained. Of the philosophy, and even the necessity of exercise, however, I need only say, in the present place, in addition to what has been said already, that much of human health and happiness depends on the proper development and cultivation and daily exercise of the whole muscular system, that the health and happiness and usefulness of young women are not less dependent on the right condition of the physical frame, the bones and muscles among the rest, than in the case of the other classes of persons. I might even say that of all classes of people in the world, parents and teachers alone accepted, young women are most imperiously called upon to attend to this subject. It will now be my object to speak of the various kinds of exercise for young women, and to treat of them in what I conceive to be the order of their value. 1. Walking. If I were residing in Great Britain, and writing for the perusal of young women there, I suppose it would hardly be necessary to urge very strongly the importance of walking as an exercise, for we are told by accredited travellers that not only females of the middle and lower classes, but those of rank also are accustomed to this form of exercise to an extent which would surprise the young women of this country. Neither do they go out tired in such a manner that a single drop of water would annoy them, or spoil their happiness, but they go prepared for the task. They have, as I understand, their coarser clothes and shoes and headdresses for the purpose. But here, in the United States, among the female sex, especially, walking, like housekeeping and agriculture, has been, of late years, regarded as drudgery, fit for none but the poor, or the mean, or the eccentric. And when performed, it is seldom done in the love of it. Now it is well known to those who have studied the subject of exercise that, though walking is of inestimable importance, second, in all probability, to no other form of exercise, it is nevertheless of far the most value when it is undertaken and pursued with pleasure. 
while therefore i recommend it to young women i do it in the hope they will not regard it as task work as mere drudgery i hope they will regard it as a source of pleasure and happiness to render it such something more is required than to merely walk in a solitary manner to a certain stone or tree or corner or house the mind all the while unoccupied by anything agreeable or useful and then to return as listless as they came such exercise it is true will move the limbs and do much to keep the bones and muscles in a healthy state and by the gentle agitation which is induced will promote the circulation of all the fluids and the due performance of all the function in the body except the function which pertains to the brain and nervous system it will do all this they say but it will not do it so well if the exercise is performed as a piece of task work than it would if it were done cheerfully and voluntarily i counsel the young woman therefore who wishes to derive the utmost possible benefit from walking to contrive to make the exercise as agreeable as possible to this end she should endeavour to have before her i mean before her mind an agreeable object or at least she shall be accompanied by an agreeable companion both are desirable but one of the two is indispensable as to the kind of object which should be held in view i cannot of course say much nor need i for it makes but little difference so far as the physical benefits to be derived from it is concerned in regard to the moral and intellectual advantages however which are to be derived from it to herself and to others it makes a very great difference indeed she who goes in company with one or two or a small number of companions on some benevolent errand some work of mercy to the ignorant the sick or the distressed that once secures all the physical the intellectual and moral advantages to be derived by herself and confers inestimable blessings on others let it not be said that it is not the duty of young women to go on such errands of mercy i know of no neighbourhood containing the small number of twenty families in which there are not individuals who need to be fed clothed enlightened encouraged warmed or elevated the more elevated their present condition as a general rule the more can be done to raise them still higher the destruction of the poor is their poverty and in like manner the destruction of the ignorant is their ignorance people must know something in order to know more and in like manner must they possess something in order to value our charities and make a wise use of them if it should be urged that in speaking of the advantages of walking i have hitherto addressed myself to a small class of the community only that those who are compelled to labour have not the time necessary for walks of love instruction or charity i reply that this does not lessen the importance of what has been said to those individuals to whom it is applicable walking is nature's own exercise and will always be her best when it can be performed nor would many in new england think themselves so poor as to be unable to afford it were they aware of a tenth part of its general importance and did they but know how to live orderly and systematically two hours of active walking a day are worth a great deal and no one who can walk briskly and cheerfully and without very great fatigue three hours need to complain of want of exercise i must admit of course in a work like this intended for young women the mention of any motion more rapid than walking running to those who have passed into their teens would be unfashionable and who could endure the charge of disregarding the fashions who could risk the danger of being regarded as a romp i am informed by a traveller of the most undoubted veracity that females of the highest classes in some parts of europe the daughters of fellenberg the swiss educator for example do not hesitate at times to engage in the athletic and healthy exercises of skating and coasting i have even been told that the same remark may be applied to some extent to the females of the state of maine two gardening and agriculture here again i should be treading on dangerous ground as i am fully aware as in the former case however so in the present i shall not be wholly alone there are those 
who have dared to jeopardize their reputation by insisting on light agricultural and horticultural employment for females young and old who cannot or who suppose they cannot find time for walking and to the list of this sort of unfashionables my name i suppose must be added to those who do not and cannot enjoy the benefit of active and pleasurable walking abroad these employments are unquestionably the best substitutes when these are wholly depended upon for exercise however they should be pursued at least from two to four hours in a day and the constitutions of some will require much more than even four hours let not the hardy healthy young woman alone be employed in this manner it is useful and necessary indeed to her but it is still more so to her in whom to a light skin with light eyes and hair adjoined a slender frame a narrow chest and an unnatural and sickly delicacy whether this delicacy is the result of staying in the house almost entirely secluded from light air in the extremes of heat and cold or is inherited makes very little difference she who has it needs a great deal of exercise three housekeeping next to walking an agricultural and horticultural exercise housekeeping or as it is familiarly called housework is probably the most healthy and ought to be the most agreeable and yet the bare statement of the fact will be enough to induce many a fair reader as i doubt not to turn aside with pain and disgust the reasons why this employment is so healthy are many and various one is found in the fact that it requires such a variety of exercise like farming and gardening it calls into action in the course of a day and especially in the course of a week nearly every considerable muscle of the body all these exercises seem at first view to have some advantages over walking it should be remembered however that nearly every muscle and tendon and bone in the whole human frame is agitated if it is not employed in walking and if the limbs are employed much the most still the continued action of the whole body though gentle is in a few hours quite sufficient for all the purposes of health every young woman should be determined to attend to and understand every kind of housework if a few kinds as washing for example seem to be beyond her strength she should only attend to them in part according as she is able it is pitiable to see a young woman of twenty twenty-five or thirty who cannot make bread or iron a shirt or boil a pudding ay and who cannot make and mend clothes if necessary simply because she has never been required to do it still more pitiable is as i have already said to find those who have never done it because they thought it would be demeaning to themselves or because they have acted upon the principle of doing nothing for themselves or others as long as they can help it it is scarcely possible that a young woman twenty years of age has not had ample opportunities for learning to do all kinds of housework provided it has been her fixed resolution to improve them and i am fully assured that housekeeping actively and cheerfully pursued in all its parts is sufficient to secure a tolerable measure of health to every individual and yet i am equally confident that if walking or out-of-door labour was superadded to this in the way i have proposed and recommended she would derive from it many important advantages besides being still healthier indeed no person in any employment whatever is so healthy as to exclude all possibility of further improvement it is not yet known how healthy an individual may become four riding horseback exercise for those who cannot enjoy any of the three modes of which i have already spoken is excellent it is particularly valuable where there is a tendency to lung complaints whether induced by wearing too tight a dress or in any other matter it should not be forgotten however that if the chest is very greatly diseased this exercise may be one of the worst which could be taken as to riding in a carriage unless it is an open one i must honestly say i do not like it as an exercise for those who can secure 
that which is better indeed except for a medicinal purpose i always prefer one of the three kinds named above and as for medicine i would have young women so live and especially so exercise as they have no occasion for it but on this subject i intend to say something in another place i do not believe life is long enough in general to allow us to indulge to any great extent either in what are commonly regarded as passive exercises or in amusement as such i speak now of those who are above twelve years of age not that those who are over twelve do not need amusement i would have everything amusing or at least interesting i mean simply to say that walking and running and gardening and farming and housekeeping usually involve enough of physical exercise for health and that where these are duly attended to or even any one of them what are commonly called amusements will hardly be needed in earlier life they unquestionably may be but i do not think well of passive exercises for any person so long as they can be avoided and heterodox as the advice may be regarded i cannot help counselling the young above all never to ride in an easy carriage or a railroad or in a steamboat or other vessel or ship as long as they can pursue the lawful purposes of life in a lawful and proper manner by means of walking it is soon enough to ride when we cannot walk those who are desirous to glorify god in whatever they do as paul expresses it will understand and feel the force of what i am now going to say will those who make it their business in this world to seek happiness without being careful to do it through the medium of personal excellence or holiness will perhaps only smile at what they suppose is a mere eccentricity of opinion five local exercise i have intimated that the bones and muscles the brain and the nerves the stomach and intestines the liver the chyle apparatus the lungs and the skin are more or less exercised and benefited by walking running gardening housekeeping or riding on horseback still other exercises will be necessary in addition to all these but much that i wish to say on these points will be found in subsequent chapters it is only necessary for me to observe in this place that all the organs of the body internal or external together with all the senses require nay demand their appropriate or as i might say their particular exercise and this not only daily but some of them much oftener the brain and nervous system require observation and reflection and even in my view considerable hard study this is their appropriate and necessary exercise there are indeed those who exercise their brains too much but for one who suffers from thinking too much a dozen suffer from thinking too little the stomach and intestines require such food as will call them into proper action that which is highly difficult of digestion may cause them to overact and this to those whose vital powers are feeble would be injurious on the other hand that which is too easy of digestion will not afford the stomach exercise enough and hence in time if its use is long continued will be equally injurious but once more concentrated substances substances i mean consisting of pure nutriment or that which is nearly so such as oil sugar gum etc do not afford the right kind of exercise to the stomach for it is the appropriate work of this organ and of the other internal organs and not of machinery of human invention to separate the nutritious part from that which is innutritious and therefore that food affords the best sort of labour to the stomach which contains along with a full supply of nutriment a good deal of innutritious substance the exercise of the lungs consists not only in their full and free expansion in breathing but in speaking singing etc and even in laughing physiologists also consider sneezing coughing and crying especially the latter as having their advantages in early infancy and perhaps in some circumstances even afterward 
in like manner do the eye and the ear the tongue and the teeth the hands and the face and indeed every part of the system require their appropriate exercise this is not true of the merest infancy and childhood alone but also for the most part of youth and manhood conversation to a certain extent is for aught i know as necessary to the health of the vocal organs as to that of the lungs nor are the benefits of mastication confined wholly to the process of digestion it is fully believed by distinguished physiologists that the teeth themselves will last longer for being considerably used and they seem to be borne out in this conclusion by facts but if this is the case what are we to think of the importance of light to the eye sound to the ear employment to the hands etc it is extremely difficult to induce the young to pay any attention to this important subject as a matter of duty even in some of its most obvious points and parts some of them will it is true use exercise enough of a particular t kind and at particular times but the idea of attending to it as a matter of duty is exceedingly hard for them to receive or entertain few things are more pitiable than the sight of young persons of either sex so entirely enslaved to fashion they dare not labour in the garden or the kitchen or even walk briskly lest somebody should observe and speak of it it is not to be wondered at trained as the young of both sexes are to demand incessant excitement that they should dislike walking and everything else of the more active kind and sigh for the chaise the coach the sleigh the car and the steamboat but it does seem to me strange that contrary to nature they should seek their happiness in passive exercises alone forgetful of their limbs and hands and feet it is passing strange that any tyrant should be able even fashion herself so to change the whole current of human feeling as to make a sprightly buoyant young girl of ten years of age become at thirteen a grave staid or mincing young woman unable or rather unwilling to move except in a certain style and then only with an effort scarcely exceeded by the efforts of those who are suffering from inquisitorial tortures no young woman who has a conscientious desire for improvement and who is acquainted with the merest elements of physiological knowledge could or would submit for one day to such abominable tyranny she could not but be afraid thus to disobey the natural and reasonable laws of her maker the consequences of this premature inactivity of the human frame and the future well-being of that frame have never been half told nor do i know that they can be at least for some time to come i scarcely ever prescribed for one of these staid young women without very great pain to see a machine evidently made by its almighty architect for a great deal of motion and made to run on with exactness for a hundred years or more would you care taken to preserve it in good order completely deranged because fashion says that motion is ungraceful or unbecoming what in a physical point of view can be more lamentable to see women denied daily by fashion's nonsensical decrees the pleasure which every healthy person feels in the use of his limbs with their hundreds of muscles and tendons and kept not only inactive but almost secluded from air and light who is not almost ashamed that he belongs to the same species yet such things are quite common among us and they are constantly becoming more so End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bria snow chapter twenty one rest and sleep the moving powers of the human body are so constructed by the grand mover of all things that they require rest as well as action and the many hundreds of muscles and tendons in the living system it is not known that there is one which could continue its action uninterrupted for any considerable time without serious injury even the muscular fibres of the heart 
rest a part of the time between the beats and pulsations whether the brain which is of course without muscular fibres can act incessantly in the production of thought is a question which i believe is not yet settled by metaphysicians one thing we do know however which is that if the other organs suffer for want of rest we soon find that by the law of sympathy and otherwise the brain and nervous system suffer along with them and if our wakefulness is greatly protracted they sometimes suffer very severely i have said that all the moving powers of the body require rest they do and in the young a good deal of it it is in vain for mankind the young especially to abridge their hours of sleep whether for selfish or benevolent purposes sleep is made by the creator a condition of our being and happiness and he who complies not with this condition is unworthy of the boon sleep moreover should be had at the right season it is useless to think of sleeping during the daytime and keeping awake during the night with impunity for many facts are on record showing in vivid colours the mischiefs which result sooner or later from thus turning day into night and night into day need i present these facts they are found in greater or less numbers in almost every work on health or physiology i will present but one it is from Valangin. Two colonels in the French army some time ago had a dispute whether it was most safe to march in the heat of the day or in the evening. To ascertain this point, they obtained permission of the commanding officer to put their respective plans into execution. Accordingly, the one with his division marched during the day, although it was the heat of summer, and rested all night. The other, with his men, slept in the daytime and marched during the evening and part of the night. The result was that the first performed a journey of six hundred miles without losing a single man or horse, while the latter lost most of his horses and several of his men. Of course, the inference from this and other similar facts is that night is a time for sleep and not day. Is it said that every person knows this? But every person does not practice accordingly. There are those who either do not know the fact, and not a few young women too, may be found among the number, or who, knowing it, do not act according to their knowledge. Is it not more charitable to conclude they do not know the fact? Franklin, indeed, once undertook to show, in his humorous way, that the inhabitants of Paris did not know that the sun gave light at its first rising. Whether they did know it or not, or whether or not they were culpable for their ignorance, provided it was voluntary, shall hold my readers to be as truly guilty of doing that wrong which is the result of their own voluntary ignorance, as if their minds were really enlightened. The young woman who goes to bed so late that she cannot wake till it has been day for some time, or who darkens her room on purpose at the daylight, may not interrupt her repose when it comes, and who knows at the same time that it is wrong to sleep by daylight except from the most absolute necessity, is as truly guilty as if she slept by daylight with her windows open. I believe the night is long enough for sleep in any latitude not higher than fifty degrees, and comparatively few of the human family reside much further than this towards the poles. The young woman who finds herself inclined to sleep after daylight should resolve to break the habit as soon as possible. In order to do this, however, she should believe herself able to do it. Here it will be rational to ask whether, after all, there is any moral character in the error, if it be one, of sitting up an hour later than usual and then making it up by sleeping an hour after the arrival of daylight whether it is not a matter of propriety merely rather than a question of positive right or wrong in the sight of heaven this question i have answered in the chapter on conscientiousness to which in order to prevent repetition i might refer the reader if there be a sort of actions to which no character good or bad can justly be attached then what did the apostle mean in requiring that whatever we do should be done to the glory of god 
and where is the line to be drawn between those actions which are too small or too trifling to be worthy of having any right or wrong attached to them and those which are not but if every thing we do is either right or wrong then there is a right or a wrong in regard to the particular class of actions of which i am just now treating the object of sleep should be to restore us and fit us for renewed action we may rest to some extent without sleep as when we throw ourselves upon a sofa or sit in an easy chair indeed there is no hour of the day in which some portions of the moving powers are not resting more or less still we cannot be wholly restored in body and mind without the soothing influence of tired nature's sweet restorer balmy sleep every young woman should regulate her habits in regard to sleep and rest not less than all her other habits in such a way as will tend most to the good of her whole nature and as will consequently tend most to the glory of god in other words each person should be governed in this matter by true philosophy and christian principle this would lead to the following axioms or conclusions every one of which is sustained by high authority apartments for sleep should if possible be large and airy and not on a ground floor or in too dark a corner of the building the air of the room should circulate freely although it is not considered safe to be exposed to currents of air to this end the bed should be rather large and loose and should stand out from the wall and from the corners of the room and should be without curtains even in the coldest weather the bed ought to be rather hard but it should at any rate be cool soft yielding feather beds in which the body sinks deeply are very injurious on account of the unnatural heat and perspiration they are sure to induce it is of little consequence what the material of your bed is if it be light dry and porous and not too soft straw grass husks hair and a great variety of other things have been employed almost anything i repeat it is better than feathers the same remarks will apply to pillows we should sleep with as little covering as we can and not actually feel cold and chilly most persons sleep under a great deal too much clothing we require more in cold than in warm weather we also require more on first going to bed than when we get fairly warm but as it usually happens that we get warm and go to sleep at nearly the same time it follows that the clothing which was only sufficient to warm us remains on the bed all night we ought not put on so much clothing as we are apt to do when we first go to bed then we shall not be likely to sleep all night under too much clothing and wake up in the morning weakened by it the temperature of the room must never be overlooked it should be as cold as it can well be made and not be absolutely uncomfortable one reason for this is that the oxygen or vital principle of the air which is more abundant in a given volume of cool air than in an equal amount of that which is warmer will last longer when the room is cool and the room will thus remain free from impurity another reason is that ratified air not only contains less oxygen in a given volume as i have already said but also appears to admit more readily of the admixture and thorough diffusion of bad gases the carbonic acid gas which is formed by breathing settles the more readily towards the floor in proportion to the general density of the atmosphere of the room and if the bedroom be large so that it does not accumulate in such a quantity to rise higher than the bed it is less likely to be breathed over again than if the atmosphere was more rare but there is still another reason for having our bedclothes cool though it is substantially the same with that mentioned in the preceding paragraph for having light rooms beds and light covering we are greatly debilitated by sleeping unnecessarily warm our vital powers should be trained to generate a good deal of heat and what they have been trained to do they should continue to perform 
all the heat, I say, therefore, which the body will manufacture for itself, readily sh it should be permitted to do so. But the moment we depend unnecessarily on external means of warmth, as too much or too soft and warm bedclothing, and too warm an atmosphere, that moment our internal organs begin to be enervated in a greater or less degree, whether we are sensible of it or not. We should not sleep in the clothes we have worn during the day. This is not on account of the heat it may induce, but on account of the bad air which our clothing confines. By having extra clothes for the night, and those very few indeed, and taking a little pains with those we have worn during the day, to hang them up and air them properly, we may do much towards keeping the pores of our body open, and preserving the skin in a clean state, and in a condition to perform its accustomed work. We should also avoid damp clothing about our beds or bedrooms. A healthy person may get slightly wet in the early part of the day, and even remain wet for a short time, especially if he continues in action without injury but it is by no means safe to sit down or lie down in wet or damp clothing and it is more unsafe to do so at the close of the day than it is in the morning a vast amount of disease colds rheumatism fever and consumption is generated or aggravated in this way what i have said here of the conditions of sleep is sustained as i have already informed the reader by high authority I mean that of Macnish. He says further that, quote, The practice of having two or three beds in one room and two or three individuals in each bed must be deleterious, end quote, and that wherever it is necessary for more than one person to sleep in a single bed, quote, they should take care to place themselves in such a position as not to breathe in each other's faces. End quote. He also alludes to the custom of covering the head with the bedclothes and calls it, as he ought to do, a dangerous custom. McNish also gives the following directions on this subject. Quote, Before going to bed, the body should be brought into that state which gives us the surest chance of dropping speedily asleep. If too hot, its temperature ought to be reduced by cooling drinks. Footnote. By cooling drinks, McNish can surely not mean drinks of a low temperature, for these would be somewhat injurious in the evening. He means by cooling, not heating or irritating. Exposure to the open air, sponging or even the cold bath. If too cold, it must be brought into a comfortable state by warmth, for both cold and heat act as stimuli, and their removal is necessary before sleep can ensue. A full stomach also, though it sometimes promotes, generally prevents sleep, consequently supper ought to be dispensed with, except by those who, having been long used for this, to this meal, cannot do without it. As a general rule, the person who eats nothing for two or three hours before going to rest will sleep better than he who eats a late supper. His sleep will also be more refreshing and his sensations upon awaking much more gratifying. End quote. The cold bath at going to bed, taken to reduce our heat because we are too warm, is a rather doubtful utility. Some may use it with entire safety, but to the feeble, or those who have been greatly overheated or overfatigued, it would be hazardous. By supper, McNish means, no doubt, that fourth meal so common in fashionable life, and not the usual third meal at six o'clock. Those who never heard of a fourth have no occasion for caution on this subject, except it be in regard to quantity. This third meal, however, even when it is eaten three hours before going to bed, should be light. In order to sleep properly, let all the conditions which I have mentioned be faithfully observed. Then to these let there be added a most strict or conscientious regard for the rule which I have suggested in the beginning of this chapter, which is to rise early. 
Let no young woman be found in bed after daylight, in the longest days, nor in the winter after four o'clock. Some will say that at this rate they should not get enough sleep during the night, and should, as a consequence, either be dull during their waking hours, or be obliged to take a nap in the daytime. But if our hard-labouring people who rise at four o'clock in the summer find time enough to sleep, most of them, without a nap in the daytime, surely they whose labour is not so hard can do it. They cannot, I well know, they sit up till ten or eleven o'clock at night. If any one desires to glorify God in everything she does, let her attend to the conditions I have mentioned. If she finds that in rising at daylight she does not get sleep enough, let her go to bed a little earlier. We ought to sleep about as much before midnight as after, and she who goes to bed at eight and rises at four will be pretty sure to get sleep enough. Few, if any persons over twelve years of age, need more than twelve hours sleep, and the greater proportion not so much. Here I will mention one thing which does not seem to be generally known. The more we sleep, if we increase our sleep by degrees, the more we may. How far the time for sleep may be thus extended, I do not know. There are indeed circumstances which may make the same individual require less or more sleep, independent of a habit of indulgence. Still, it is true, as a general fact, that we may sleep as much or as little as we please. When we increase the hours of sleep, however, it does not follow that we actually sleep more in the same proportion. Let an active individual who have been accustomed to six hours suddenly confine herself to four. Will her actual sleep be abridged by one third? By no means. Nature will endeavour to make up for the loss of time by inducing sounder sleep. In this, however, she is only in part successful. For those who sleep very soundly often sleep too sound. We are sometimes conscious when we awake from our over-sound sleep that we are not well refreshed, but whether conscious of it or not, it is so. Magnish says, quote, That sleep from which we are easily roused is the healthiest, very profound slumber partakes of the nature of apoplexy. End quote. A person who, having been in the habit of sleeping six hours in twenty-four, suddenly reduces the number to four, will probably for a time sleep as much in four hours as she slept before in about five or five and a half. But the quality of these five or five and a half hours sleep will be inferior and continues so unless she arouses herself to an increased activity of her intellectual powers and reduces the quantity of her food and drink. I have supposed it to be generally known that we need the more sleep or seem to need it in proportion as our minds are less active and our bodily appetites hold us more in subjection. The individual, male or female, who approaches the most nearly to the more stupid lower animals in point of intelligence, activity and general habits will actually seem to require the most sleep, and on the contrary, in proportion, as an individual rises above all this and becomes exceedingly active in mind, body, and spirit, will the necessity for sleep be greatly diminished. Some of the most elevated of the human race, in point of intelligence, benevolence, and benevolent activity or spirituality, have acquired but very little sleep. Of this number were Wesley, Matthew Hale, Alfred the Great, Jeremy Taylor, Baxter, Bishops Jewell and Burnett, Dr. John Hunter, Dr. Priestley, and Sobieski, as well as Frederick the Great, General Eliot, Lord Wellington, and Napoleon. Of the same number, too, are some of our modern missionaries, to say nothing of several distinguished statesmen among whom is Lord Brougham. In view of these considerations, is there one of my readers who, while she endeavours to sleep enough to answer 
every valuable purpose of her existence, on penalty of more or less suffering, will not guard with the same assiduity against sleeping too much. Aware that the more she indulges herself, the more she may, because she will become by so much the stu more stupid, and that the more she denies herself sleep, provided it is not to such an extent that a sleep becomes apoplectic, the more will her intellectual powers be developed and acquire the ascendancy, and her animal nature be brought into subjection. Will she not exert herself to the utmost and pray for aid from on high in striving to gain the victory over herself, her lower self, her animal self, and thus increase the duration and value of her existence? I do not urge the consideration of the great amount of time merely which may be saved by rising early. Some have attempted to show that they who rise two hours early every morning than usual gain an amount of time in sixty years, viz. from the age of ten to that of seventy, equal to about seven years of active life. Is it not obvious that there may be a mistake here? For if she who rises two hours earlier goes to bed as much earlier at night, no time is saved at all. And if, without going to bed any earlier, she is rendered so much more dull or sleepy during the day that she loses two hours or even one, this will form a proportional deduction from her supposed gain. It is she only who, while she sleeps all which her nature really demands and takes care not to exceed the demand, succeeds also in lessening the demand itself that is the real gainer. It is a pitiable sight to see an immortal being made in the image of Almighty God and capable, by divine aid of enjoying him forever, rendering himself sleepy, brutish, or besotted by the form of indulgence of which I am now speaking. And it seems to be more pitiable, indeed, absolutely disgusting to see females doing this, and especially intelligent young women. I wish every reader would take this subject of wasting time in sleep into seriousness and conscientiousness and prayerful consideration. Let her remember that her time is not hers any more than she herself is her own, that both are bought with a price, an amazing price too. How can she then waste time? A single moment of it. Yet people will do it. Hundreds and thousands and millions will do it. Some will do it, many I fear, who have professed the Christian name, and who believe they bear in their bodies the marks of their dying Lord and Master. I will close this chapter by briefly summing up what has been said. Let your sleep be in the night, not in the daytime. Let it be, moreover, in the middle of the night as much as possible. To sit up till near midnight, and to get up just after midnight, are perhaps equally injurious, though not by any means equally common. Spend the close of each day at home, and go to bed early, with an empty or nearly empty stomach, a bed simple and cool, and your room also cool. Wake up with the first rays of the morning in summer, and about the same hour in winter. Get up as soon as you wake, and if your sleep has been insufficient, go to rest a little earlier the succeeding evening. Thus you will once discharge your duty and obtain peace here and hereafter. End of chapter 21chapter 22 is a young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bria snow chapter 22 industry what ordinary virtue is there more commendable in the young than industry on this account and in this view it is that well-disposed parents sometimes employ their children in a way not absolutely or in itself useful to them, for the sake of their general habits. Such parents are certainly excusable, even if their example should not be regarded as commendable or as worthy of being followed. Dr. Good, the well-known theological, philosophical and medical writer, vows the belief that man is naturally lazy, that he would not 
so much as lift a finger if he could help it and that all his activity grows out of a desire to avoid present or future suffering or pain perhaps this is carrying the matter rather too far since we see young women positively active not so much from the desire of avoiding pain as that of procuring pleasure but however untrue it may be in regard to children it is unquestionably true of many adults and some it is to be feared of both sexes of all lazy persons however i dislike most to see a lazy young woman destined by her creator at once to charm instruct and improve the world around her by her looks her words and her actions and this to a degree which no female has ever yet attained how exceedingly painful is it to see her floating along the stream of inaction or insignificance without making one considerable effort to arouse her faculties bodily mental and moral from their half dormant condition too many females who are trained in the bosom of ease and abundance have no idea of any attempts at benevolent effort or even of active untiring industry if they are not more selfish than the other sex they are scarcely less so they live but for themselves and seem to desire no more granting as we sometimes do that this is the fault of their education is it therefore the less pitiable I have already urged the importance of self-dependence. Every healthy young woman ought to be so trained as to be able to make her own way through the world without becoming at all its debtor. I speak now not merely of her moral and intellectual and domestic efforts, but also of her physical ones. I care not what her rank or condition may be. Every American young woman ought to be able, in the common language of the community, to support herself through life i must insist on even more than this she ought to be able in point of bodily efficiency to do something for the support of others and not merely something but a great deal i am not ignorant of the low rate of female wages disproportioned altogether so to their comparative value in the scale of human happiness and yet with all the necessary abatements i hold that all healthy females ought to be able to support themselves should necessity require it and to aid in supporting others whether however their labour supports themselves or more than does it is not so much the question as whether they are truly industrious an aged woman who at ninety was often found at her spinning wheel and always at active employment though by no means indignant was accustomed to say that every person ought to strain every nerve to get property as long as life lasts as a matter of duty i would not say quite so much as this but i do say that every person no matter what may be her rank or circumstances ought to be industrious from early life to the last moment such a person male or female will seldom want means of support and even of distributing to him that needeth but should such a thing happen it is of no very great importance she will at least die with the consciousness of having spent her life in active industry and of having benefited someone though she may have spent less on herself as to the kind of labour or exercise in which females ought to engage i have perhaps said enough already i will only add that i consider a person as industrious and as truly worthy of time i mean pecuniary reward in performing valuable mental or moral labour a part of her time as she who was engaged the whole time with her hands and i know of no propriety in the custom which has led to the valuation of things by a different standard i know of no reason for example why a young woman who as a sister or as a daughter or as a friend merely contributes by wise management to keep an aged parent or an infant child or any other person happy though it were only by cheerful conversation or by relating stories for an hour or so occasionally i know not i say why she is not as truly entitled to the rewards of industry 
as though she were employed in furnishing bread or clothing to the same persons are the affections and passions and knowledge and excellence of less value than the rewards of manual labour in money or property and is not mental or spiritual labour at least as valuable as bodily end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bria snow chapter twenty three visiting but is a young woman to be always actively employed is not time to be allocated her for mere passive enjoyments may she never unbend her mind from what is called duty May she never lay herself, as it were, on the bosom of her family and friends? May she never seat herself on the living green amid roses and violets, or on the mossy bank studded with cresses or cowslips, and laved by the crystal stream? May she never view the silver fish as he leaps up and dumbly speaks the praise of God? May she never wander abroad for the sake of wandering, or ride for the sake of riding, or gaze on the blue ethereal by day, or the star-spangled canopy by night. Far be it from me to say any such thing, for I know not to whom such exercises, as such exercises merely, may or may not be necessary. That they may be useful to some cannot be doubted, but that they are far from being useful or even innocent to all is quite certain. It is certain, I say, that mere passive exercises are not only unnecessary with many, but sometimes wrong. The young woman who is trained, or has commenced training herself on truly Christian principles, and who enjoys a tolerable measure of health, will hardly find special seasons of this sort necessary or desirable. She will find sufficient relaxation amid the routine of active life and her daily occupations and in her labours of love and charity. The society of sisters, brothers, parents, grandparents, of companions indeed, of every sort with whom she mingles at home or at school, will afford her at times every enjoyment, even of the passive sort, which she really needs, or which, if she has the true spirit of Christ, she will heartily desire. In her duties to these, nay, even in her very duties to herself, in the kitchen, the garden, or the field, she will have ample opportunity of descanting on the beauties and glories of the animal and vegetable world, and on the wonders of the starry heavens. In pruning and watering and weeding the vines and plants, she may drink in as much as she pleases of the living green, as well as feast her eyes anon on the blue expanse, and in her walks of charity and mercy, whether alone or in company with others, she may also receive the nectar of heaven, as it glistens and invites from nature's own cup, as in rich draughts, as if she were merely lounging and seeking for pleasure, nay, even in richer ones, by as much as active exercise of body and mind gives her the better mental and physical appetite. It is one of the strongest proofs that we have a benevolent creator, the head of the world in which we live, that he has made duty and enjoyment perfectly compatible, so that in pursuing the pathway of the former, we almost inevitably make sure of the latter. And it is also equally remarkable, if not an equally strong proof of benevolence, that in seeking enjoyment as such, without seeking it, in the path of duty, we seldom find it, or if found, it is but half enjoyed. There is nothing in this world, or hardly anything, to say the least, which should be done for the mere sake of doing it. We labour not for the sake of labouring alone. We eat not, we drink not, for the sake merely of eating and drinking. At least we should not, would we obtain the whole benefit of eating and drinking nor should we even amuse ourselves for the sake alone of the amusement. Double ends are often secured by a single means, nay, almost always so. I speak now of the woman 
not of the infant or the child. Social visits among friends and neighbours, for the mere sake of the passive enjoyment, therefore, in the earliest years of infancy, may do exceedingly well as a preparation for the more active and more truly Christian visits of maturer years and later life. They are useful in elevating ourselves and others to a state where such visiting is not so needful to our happiness. As to many forms of visiting current among us, such as morning calls, evening parties, and calls of any sort which answer none of the real purposes of visiting, tending neither to make ourselves or anybody else wiser or better, but on the contrary, to make society worse indirectly, I have never found any apology for them which seem to me sufficient to satisfy a rational, intelligent, immortal spirit. To come together late in the evening, just to eat and drink together that which ought not to be eaten and drunk at all, or if at all, certainly not at such an hour. To hold conversation an hour or two under the influence of some sort of excitement, physical or moral, got up for the occasion on topics which were of little comparative importance, of which the most valuable part often is the inquiry how do you do, and the consequent replies to it, to trifle the time away until ten, eleven, or twelve o'clock, and then go home through the cold, damp atmosphere, perhaps thinly clad, to suffer that night for want of proper and sufficient sleep, and the next day from indigestion and a thousand other evils. What can be more truly pitiable, not to say ridiculous? Nor is the practice of putting on a new dress or one which, if not new, we are quite willing to exhibit, and of going to see our neighbours and staying just long enough to ask how they do, say a few stale or silly things, and prove an interruption and a nuisance, and then going elsewhere, a whit more justifiable in beings made in the image of God, and who are to be accountable at his eternal bar. Let it not be said that I disapprove of visiting entirely. On the grounds of condemnation at the final day, it is represented in the twenty-fifth chapter of Matthew as being, He visited me not, that is, did not visit in the name and for the sake of the judge, those whom God has made it a duty no less than a privilege to visit. And can I set myself with impunity against that which my Saviour has encouraged and yet pretend to be one of his followers? What would be more presumptuous? I am not an enemy to visiting, if done with a view to glorify God and the benefit of mankind. Let young women visit, indeed, but let it be done in a way which will be approved by the Saviour and Judge. But there may be dissipation in the garb of visiting, and it is still oftener nothing more than the garb of indolence. It is not visiting, but visiting without a definite or important purpose, to which I object. It is not visiting itself, but the abuse of visiting. Celestial spirits, for what we know, are much employed in visiting. And shall not man be so? Are we to belong to their society hereafter, and yet not be their associates? Are we to associate with them, and yet remain solitaries? Could such a thing be? Is not man, here and hereafter, as I have already insisted, a social being? And if so, shall not his social nature and social powers be early and successfully developed and cultivated? Let our visits but promote the purposes of benevolence, and nothing can, with propriety, be said against them. I would wage no war on this point except with selfishness. End of chapter 23《ハプター・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・トゥ・And on account of the excellency, I propose to give a brief abstract of some of them. 
she complained in the first place that manners are too often considered as certain forms to be taught or certain modes of conduct for which the rules are to be made and observed that some of the greek states maintained professors to teach manners in connection with which she immediately adds the following paragraph Quote, is this making manners a distinct branch of education consistent with their nature are they not the sign of inward qualities a fitting expression of the social virtues are they not a mirror which often does and always should reflect the soul for instance is not a person of mild temper gentle in manners has not another a bold and independent disposition a forward and fearless manner it has been well said that real elegance of demeanour springs from the mind fashionable schools do but teach its imitation here she quotes with apparent approbation the views of mr locke this writer in speaking of the moral education has the following paragraph quote, if his tender mind be filled with veneration for his parents and teachers which consist in love and esteem and a fear to offend them and with respect and good will to all people that respect will of itself teach those ways which he observes to be most acceptable End quote. miss sedgwick also makes the following judicious remarks quote, i pray you to bear in mind that manners are but manifestations of character i must premise that by manners i do not mean the polished manners of the most highly educated and refined of other countries nor the deferential subservience of their debased classes so pleasing to those who prefer the homage to the friendship of their fellow creatures manners in every one's character and conduct should be based on religion honour all men says the apostle this is the spring of good manners it strikes at the very root of selfishness it is a principle by which we render to all ages and ranks their due a respect for your fellow beings a reverence for them as god's creatures and our brethren will inspire that delicate regard to their rights and feelings of which good manners is the sign if you have truth not the truth of policy but religious truth your manners will be sincere they will have earnestness, simplicity, and frankness, the best qualities of manners. They will be free from assumption, pretense, affectation, flattery, and obsequiousness, all of which are incompatible with sincerity. If you have a goodly sincerity, you will choose to appear no other nor better than you are, to dwell in a true light. End quote. I have often insisted that the Bible contains the only rules necessary in the study of politeness, or in other words, that those who are the real disciples of Christ cannot fail to be truly polite. Nor have I any reason for recalling this opinion from which that of Miss Sedgwick does not materially differ. But the same forms will be observed by every follower of Christ in manifesting his politeness. All I insist on is that every one will be truly polite. Let me illustrate my views in a very plain manner. Suppose a wandering female clad in the meanest of hell calls at a house to inquire the way to the next inn, having just found the road to divide or fork in a very doubtful and difficult manner. Suppose there are no persons in the house but half a dozen females, these we will also suppose are persons of real piety and true benevolence what does true politeness require of them but to give the stranger in a gentle and affectionate manner the necessary information but if every one is ready to perform the office which true politeness would dictate it is consequently truly polite there will probably be as many ways of manifesting these feelings as there are individuals present in the company one, for example, will give the stranger the best direction she can without leaving the room, but will be, in all respects, exceedingly particular. Another will go to the door and there give the same directions. A third will go with her into the street and there instruct her. A fourth will go with her to the first or second fork of the road and there give better directions. A fifth will send a boy with her. 
a sixth will sketch the road plainly though coarsely with a pencil and mark in a proper manner the course she ought to pursue each one will instruct her in an intelligent manner so there can hardly remain the possibility of a mistake but we see that there will be a considerable difference in the form it may be said in reply to this view of politeness that there are genuine disciples of christ who from ignorance of what they ought to do or from bad habits not yet subdued will not in such a case as i have described render any assistance at all and that they cannot of course be truly polite to which i have only to reply that such a thing can hardly happen and if it should the spirit of christianity would not lead to it but it would be the result rather of a want of that spirit in short let the young woman who would be truly polite take her lessons not in the school of a hollow heartless world but in the school of jesus christ i know this counsel may be despised by the gay and fashionable but it will be much easier to despise it than to prove it to be incorrect always think of the good of the whole rather than of your own individual convenience says miss farrer in her young lady's friend the most excellent rule and one to which i solicit your earnest attention she who is thoroughly imbued with the gospel spirit will not fail to do so it was what our saviour did continually and i have no doubt that his was the purest specimen of good manners or genuine politeness that the world has ever witnessed the politeness of abraham himself not accepted end of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter twenty five Health and Beauty. Dr. Bell of Philadelphia, whose reputation as a medical man and an author is deservedly high, has written a volume, as the reader may already know, entitled Health and Beauty, in which he endeavours to show that a pleasing contour, symmetry of form, and a graceful carriage of the body may be acquired, and the common deformities of the spine and chest can be prevented by a due obedience to the laws of growth and exercise. These laws he has endeavoured, and with considerable success, to present in a popular and intelligible manner. Nor was the task unworthy of the efforts and pen of the gifted individual by whom it was executed, Young women, of course, are inclined to set a high value on beauty of form and feature, as well as to dread more than most other persons what they regard as deformity. Surely they ought to be glad of a work like that I have described. I have no wish to disparage beauty. It is almost a virtue. There can hardly be a doubt that Adam and Eve were exceedingly beautiful, nor that so far as the world can be restored to its primitive state, which we hope may be the case in its future glorious ages the pristine beauty of our race will be restored it is sin in a larger sense of the term which has distorted the human face divine disrobed it of half its charms and deprived the whole frame of its symmetry does any one ask of what possible service it can be to know these facts when it is too late to make use of them the truth is it can never be too late there is no person so old that she cannot improve her appearance more or less if she will but take the appropriate steps i do not of course mean to say that at twenty or thirty years of age a person can greatly alter the contour of the face or the symmetry of the frame though i believe something can be done even in these respects it was the saying of dr rush that husbands and wives who live happily together always come to resemble one another more and more in their very features and he accounted for it on the principle of an increased resemblance in their feelings tastes or dispositions and there are probably few who have not observed how much bad passions and bad habits distort the features of every body at every age then why should not dr rush be right and why should not good feelings and good affections change the countenance in a greater or less degree as well as bad ones and what reason then can be given why every young woman certainly those who are far down the column of teens cannot change her 
countenance for the better if she will take the necessary pains for it that she can do but little is no reason why that little should not be done the very consideration that she can do but little enhances the importance of doing what she can let her remember this would that the principle were universally remembered and applied would that it were generally believed and the belief acted upon that the latter-day glory of the world is to be brought about in no other way by having every individual of every generation through a long series of generations do all in his power aided by wisdom and strength from on high to hasten it do not suppose that i entertain the belief as foolish as it is absurd that in any future glorious period of the world's history mankind will be perfectly beautiful or perfectly conformed to one standard of beauty i entertain no belief in human perfectibility i believe and i wish to state this belief once for all that i may not be misunderstood that we are destined if we are wise to approach perfection forever without the possibility of ever attaining to it to any perfection i mean which is absolute and unqualified nor do i believe that all mankind will ever become perfectly beautiful according to any particular standard of beauty this were neither useful nor desirable there will probably be as great a variety of features and possibly too of size and symmetry in the day of millennial glory as there is now what i believe is this that in falling with our first parents we fall physically as well as morally and that our physical departure from truth is almost as wide as our moral i suppose all the ugliness of the young not of course all the variety in feature and complexion but all which constitutes real ugliness of appearance comes directly or indirectly from the transgressions of god's laws natural or moral and can only be restored by obedience to those laws by the transgression of which it came it is not tight dressing alone which spoils the shape but improper exercise neglect of exercise over exercise and a thousand other things also nor is it the application of rouge alone which spoils the beauty there are a thousand physical transgressions that dim the lustre of the eye or sink it too deep in the socket or flatten it or paint a circle around it so is the face in general there are a thousand forms of transgression that take away the carnation of the lip and cheek and leave unnatural hues not to say pimples and furrows in its stead i might be much more particular i might show how every physical transgression every breach of that part of the natural law which imposes on us the duty of proper attention to cleanliness exercise dress air temperature eating drinking sleeping etc mars in a greater or less degree our beauty such a disclosure might be startling but it ought to be made dr bell in the volume mentioned has led the way and his work entitles him to a high place among the benefactors of our race but he has only begun the work the important honour of completing it remains to him or to some of his countrymen but enough on this subject for the present if i have convinced the reader whence her help in this respect is to come if i have convinced her that under god she is to restore her beauty only by coming a true christian by having her whole being body intellect and affections brought into subjection to divine law especially by a prompt and minute and thorough obedience to all the laws of health and life as far as she understands them and by diligent effort to understand them better and better as long as she lives and lastly by the smiles of almighty god upon her labours and efforts End of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter twenty six Neatness and Cleanliness. After saying so much of the general importance of obeying the laws of life and health, it seems at first view almost unnecessary to go further into particulars than I have already done and yet i feel somewhat inclined to do so for two reasons first because i find several considerable errors in the advice given to young women in some of our young women's books in matters pertaining to their physical improvement 
which I should rejoice to be able to correct. Secondly, because, that in a work from me, information of this kind will probably be expected. And yet, it seems quite commonplace to advise a young woman on the subject of cleanliness in general, and still more so to speak to her on the subject of personal neatness. A young woman wanting in neatness? At the first view of the case, such a thing seems almost impossible. Would that it were so! Would that our daughters and sisters, the daughters and sisters of America especially, were so far apprised of this indispensable requisite as to need no monitor on the subject. But unhappily it is not so, very far from it on the contrary. No person in tolerable health, male or female, seems to me to be entitled to be considered as neat, truly so, who does not wash the surface of the whole body in water daily. But are there not multitudes who pass for models of neatness and cleanliness, who do not perform this work for themselves half a dozen times, nay, once a year? That I may not be regarded as wholly ultra on this subject, because professedly a strong friend and advocate of physical education and physical improvement, I beg leave to subjoin the following paragraphs from Mrs. Farrer's Young Lady's Friend. Quote, Once at least, in twenty-four hours, the whole surface of the body should be washed in soap and water, and receive the friction of a coarse towel, or flesh brush, or crash mitten. This may be done by warm or cold bathing, by a plunging or shower bath, by means of a common wash tub, or even without further preparation than an ordinary wash bowl and sponge. By washing a small part of the person at a time, rubbing it well and then covering what is done, the whole may be washed in cold water, even in winter time, and a glow may be produced after it in a young and healthy person. It is common for persons who are in the habit of sponging all over with cold water every morning, or of taking a shower or plunging bath, to omit it when they have a slight cold or sore throat or a touch of rheumatism, whereas, if it were properly done so as to produce a glow all over the skin, the habitual ablutions would be the best remedy for the beginnings of evil. If not sure in such a case of producing a glow after the use of the cold water, it will be better to use the warm in order to make the skin do its office freely. But to cease your customary bathing at such times is to increase all your difficulties. Many think it impossible to make this thorough washing when the weather is very cold, and that they must do it in rooms never warmed by a fire. But in healthy and vigorous persons the glow after washing would be so great as to more than compensate for the momentary chill. End quote. By washing the body in cold water every day and following it by friction, according to the recommendation of Mrs. F., you gain, at once, two important objects. You secure to yourself the benefits of cleanliness and of a vast amount of exercise and consequent vigour. I say a vast amount, but this depends much on yourself. You may make a great deal of it, or only a little. I know of one teacher who says his cold bath and friction are worth two hours of ordinary exercise to him every day. But two hours of ordinary exercise a day is much more than the whole which is taken by some of our young women. I have spoken of the vigour derived from cold bathing. This is gained in two ways. First, directly, by the action of the muscles or moving powers, which I have partially described in the chapter on exercise. Secondly, indirectly, through the medium of sympathy. I know of no one thing which costs so little time and effort, for the work may be done after it has become natural and habitual in twelve or fifteen minutes, which secures at the same time such an amount of exercise and bodily vigour as daily cold bathing. The particular forms of bathing are numerous. Among these are the simple washing with the hand spoken of by Mrs. Farrer, sponging, immersion in a tub or stream, and a shower bath. All these, except, of course, washing in a stream, may be done with cold, tepid, warm, or hot water, and may be continued for a greater or less time, although, in general, 
the cold bath should be a quick operation. Let me now present the reader with a physiological explanation of the use and necessity of frequent ablution and bathing, derived in substance from a little tract already before the public. I use the language of the tract because I can use none which is better for my present purpose. The dust accumulates on the surface of our bodies much more readily and adheres much more firmly and in much larger quantities than is usually supposed and then by many would be credited. Mr. Buckingham, the Oriental traveller, asserts that from two to three pounds of it are sometimes removed from the whole surface of a person who has for some time neglected bathing and washing in the tropical climate and this, under some circumstances, may possibly have been the case. For not only does the moisture of the skin favour its accumulation, but so also does the oily substance continually poured out of the small bottle-shaped glands, sebaceous glands, as they are called, which are found in the skin in great numbers, with their mouths opening on its surface. Nothing, indeed, can be more obvious to an enlightened and reflecting mind than the indispensable necessity of frequent ablutions of the body in some form or other. It will indeed be said, it is often said, that much depends in this respect upon the nature of our occupation. The farmer, the smith, the manufacturer, the individual in one word, whose employment is most uncleanly, will be thought to need frequent attentions of this kind, while those whose employments are quiet and sedentary will need them less frequently. But it should not be forgotten that although frequent bathing and cleansing are indispensable to those whose employments expose them to a great deal of dust, yet they are scarcely less necessary to the sedentary and for the following reason. The active nature of the employments of the former in their exposure to the open air break up the coating of oil and dirt with which they are enveloped, and render it more pervious to the matter of perspiration than the thinner but not less tenacious varnish which covers the surface of the sedentary. On the whole, therefore, I regard bathing and thorough cleansing of the skin as of nearly equal importance in all the varied circumstances of age, sex, climate, and occupation. We must not omit to observe that whatever changes take place in the lungs by the action of the air upon the blood in the small vessels of those organs to purify and renovate it take place all over the surface of the body that in this respect therefore the skin may be regarded as a sort of appendage to the lungs and that if the skin be varnished over with a mixture of oil and dust so that it cannot perform its office an unreasonable burden will be thrown upon the lungs, which will thereby be weakened and predisposed to disease. I have not a doubt that a universal neglect of cleanliness not only favours in this way the production of lung diseases, especially of those colds which are so frequent in our climate, and which often pave the way for others and still more dangerous diseases but also that it tends to aggravate such diseases of the lungs as may already exist, or to whose existence there may be in us, either by inheritance or otherwise, a predisposition. This temporary suspension of all the offices of the skin is, however, peculiarly dangerous to those who have light complexion, slender form with a long neck, and narrow shoulders projecting almost like wings, indicating a chest whose internal organs as well as external dimensions are comparatively small and feeble and therefore poorly prepared to do that work which belongs to other parts or organs let all persons beware of compelling the lungs to work for the skin but above all those who have the particular structure to which i have alluded it is hardly necessary that i should advert here the repugnance felt by our sex to those young women whose external appearance bespeaks a want of attention to this subject but it is necessary that i should allude to the indecency of that neglect by no means uncommon which renders the odour of the perspiration very disagreeable 
or increases its disagreeableness by means of the accumulations of grease and dirt on the skin. They should also be reminded that there is, somehow or other, I know not how exactly, a very general connection between external and internal purity. It is exceedingly uncommon, I had almost said quite so, to find an individual who pays a daily close attention to neatness and cleanliness of person and dress, who does not at the same time possess a reputation which is not only above reproach, but also quite above suspicion. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27 Dress and Ornament. When we remember that the threefold object of dress is to cover, warm, and defend us, and that the kind and quantity of dress which best does this, is most conducive to our own and the public good, as well as to the glory of God, we are led very naturally to the following reflections. 1. We can have no right to use that kind of dress which does not answer well the purpose of a covering, as long as we can lawfully obtain that which would do it better. All fashions, moreover, which tend to remind the beholder that our dress is designed as a covering, and nearly as improper as those which do not effectually cover us. And let me say with sufficient plainness that there are such fashions in existence, and that they ought to be shunned like the plague. Does not the world in which we live contain sources enough of temptation, and avenues enough to vice, seduction, and misery, without increasing their number by our dress? I need to specify but one fashion in a list of those to which I refer. It is the fashion of exposing the neck and a part of the chest. I could tell young women that it would be wisdom to remove this dangerous custom, were health entirely out of the custom. A word to the wise, to adopt the language of Solomon, is sufficient. May it prove so in the present instance. Let not the young of the other sex, miseducated as they are now, and the slaves in improper imaginations and feelings be longer trifled with in this matter. 2. We have no right to use any articles of clothing when we have it in our power by lawful means to prevent it, whose tendency is directly contrary to what has been laid down as the second great object of dress, that of assisting to keep our bodies at a proper temperature. It would be idle to pretend that clothing, in itself considered, is a source of warmth to our bodies. It is only so by the relation it bears to our bodies, or, in other words, by the circumstances in which it is placed. Our own bodies, their internal living machinery, rather, are the principal sources of our heat. Clothing is useful in keeping us warm only by retaining for some time a proportion of the heat of our bodies, which would otherwise escape so rapidly into the ambient cooler air as to leave us with a sensation of chilliness. It should therefore be adapted to the season. That clothing which conducts the heat from the body in the slowest manner, or in other words, impedes most its progress, is best adapted to severe cold weather, provided, however, it does not keep the heated air in contact with the body so long as to render it impure. And on the contrary, that clothing which most readily allows the heat to escape from our bodies is, in hot weather, the best adapted to our health and happiness. I have said that the internal machinery of our bodies is the great source of our heat. Foremost, perhaps, in this work are the lungs, the stomach, the brain and nervous system, and the circulatory system, including the heart, arteries, veins, and absorbents. Our moving powers, the muscles and tendons, have indeed much to do with generating our heat, but it is principally by the assistance which they render the digestive, the nutritive, 
the respiratory, the circulatory, and the thinking machinery. The fat of our bodies also has something to do in promoting our warmth, but it is only on the same principle as that by which it is done by our clothing, that is to say, it prevents the heat from being conducted off too rapidly. All these internal organs, and, in fact, all the living machinery of our bodies, have the power to generate heat and diffuse it all over the system, in proportion to the freedom and energy of their action, or, to express the same idea in fewer words, in proportion to their health. But this is not all. We have not only the power of generating heat in proportion to the healthiness, but also of resisting cold. Who does not know that the living system at 98 degrees of Fahrenheit will resist a temperature nearly 150 degrees lower than this, and yet for some time not freeze? Perhaps this is done, however, in the same way in which a more moderate amount of heat is generated. Perhaps the increased muscular and nervous energy and the increased activity of the other organs enable them to generate heat as fast as the increased cold around carries it off. But the conclusion I would at present enforce from these physiological premises is the following, that whenever our dress, by means of its material, form or quantity, has a tendency to weaken our internal organs or any one of them, and thus to prevent the free and energetic performance of their several functions, it is injurious, and its use is wrong, not to say sinful. This is sometimes done by clothing which irritates and excites the surface of the body too much. Coarse flannel is more irritating than any other material in ordinary use, and therefore should never be used when a sufficient amount of bodily heat can be maintained without it, as its use weakens in the end the perspiratory and calorific and depurating powers of the skin. But the skin has all these powers and even in some cases brings on eruptive and other diseases. Fine flannel is more irritating than cotton, and the latter still more so than linen. Still, there are multitudes who cannot get along without flannel at some seasons, either coarser or finer. The evil of which I have spoken is, however, much oftener induced by error in regard to the quantity of the dress than its quality. As to quantity, we need no more than is just necessary, along with healthy and vigorous exercise, to keep us from being sensibly cold or chilly. Any amount beyond this, be its nature what it may, is debilitating, and consequently more or less injurious. But the form of our dress often does great injury as well as its material and quantity. For some classes of our community this is a greater evil than either of the former, though with others it is not. All forms of dress which impede any kind of motion, especially those which impede circulatory motion, are greatly injurious. It is, I suppose, pretty well known that all parts of the skin are full of minute blood vessels, chiefly veins, in addition to which there are also a great number of veins still larger immediately under the skin and connected with it, as may be observed by looking at the hands or limbs of very aged or very lean persons. Now, the tendency or course of the blood in all the veins is towards the heart, and this course is slower or more rapid according as the skin is more or less active, healthy, and free. A rapid course of the blood in these veins is desirable because it has become, in the progress of its circulation, greatly impure, and in the same proportion unfit to minister to the purposes of health, and needs to go on to the heart, and through that to the lungs, to be relieved of its load of impurities. Is it not plain, then, that all compression of the skin by cravats, wristbands, waistbands, belts, garters, or any other form of ligatures must be wrong? Must it not impede the motion of the venous blood in its return to the heart? Must not even light boots, garters, stockings, etc. do this? Is it not a task sufficiently difficult for the blood to climb from the feet to the heart, directly against the power of gravity, without being impeded in its course by compression of any sort, and above all by ligatures? 
but if these ordinary compressions of the surface of our body are so injurious what are we to say of the practice of many females and of most young women at least in fashionable life of compressing the chest for in compressing this part of the frame though we do not impede the action of so much blood in its return to the heart as might be supposed we do a great deal more injury in many other respects than is usually known i must advert to the various items of this injury first compressing the chest by dress or otherwise prevents free motion of the trunk of the body we can indeed bend the body a little notwithstanding the compression but not so freely and not therefore so healthfully secondly compression of the chest prevents the lungs and heart the principal organs wholly contained in its cavity from expanding and doing their work in a proper manner if there were no compression by ligatures or otherwise of any other part of the system that the impure blood came back to the lungs for renovation as fast as it ought still it would not be properly depurated or renovated unless the lungs acted in a full healthy and vigorous manner but this they cannot do unless the chest is left free from external compression the internal expansion and enlargement is limited by the external much in the same way as the space in the bellows is limited or extended according as the bellows itself is expanded or compressed if the muscles concerned in moving the chest near a hundred in number do not properly act if the breastbone when we inhale air is not thrown forward and the ribs thrown outward and upward so as to increase very greatly the size of the internal cavity then the venous blood which is brought into the lungs to be purified and cleansed cannot i repeat it be purified and cleansed as it ought to be and the whole system may suffer the consequences in being fed and nourished on impure and i might say poisonous blood this is the case when the lungs are compressed during a single breath how great then is the evil when the compression continues an hour during which period we probably breathe ten or twelve hundred times how much greater still when it is continuous to the waking hours of a day say fifteen or sixteen in which period we breathe nearly twenty thousand times and a young woman of twelve to fifteen years of age probably more but think of the evil is extended to a year or three hundred and sixty-five days a whole life of thirty fifty or seventy years how much poison blood must go through the living system in sixty or seventy years should the injured system last so long and how many bad feelings and how much severe pain and suffering and chronic and acute disease must almost inevitably be undergone thirdly this poisoning of the blood however is not all the chest so constantly compressed even if the compression is not begun in early infancy shrinks to a much smaller size than is natural and in a few years becomes incapable of holding more than half or two-thirds as much air as before so that if the compression is removed the injury cannot be wholly restored though if removed any time before thirty-five years of age something may be done towards restoration but not only if the cavity diminish permanently in size the bones and tendons are bent out of their place and made to compress either the lungs themselves or the other contiguous organs as the heart the liver and the stomach and to disturb the proper performance of their respective offices or functions fourthly tight lacing as i have already said compresses the heart as well as the lungs and impedes the motion of this important organ the suffering and disease which are thus entailed on transgression if not quite so great an amount as that which is induced by the abuse of the lungs is yet very great and added to the former greatly diminishes the sum total of human happiness and increases in the same proportion our miseries and our woes fifthly the stomach is also a sufferer and the liver and indeed all the other organs there is suffering not only from being in actual contact with each other but also from sympathy and fellow-feeling i have adverted to that law 
by which if one member or organ of the human system suffers all the others suffer with it this is very remarkably the case with the lungs when they suffer other organs suffer with them for more sympathy and that to a great extent this is especially true of the cerebral and nervous systems and of that portion of the general system which gives to woman her peculiar prerogative as well as her distinctive character let no young woman forget moreover that she lives not for herself alone but for others and that if she injures health and life by improper dress she does it not for herself alone but for all those who sheltered their abuses under her example as well as for all those who may hereafter be more immediately influenced by her present conduct let her neither forget her responsibility nor her accountability would to god that she could see this matter as it truly is and as she will likely see it in years to come let it be remembered moreover that as we can diminish the size of the chest by compressing it so we can enlarge it gradually especially in early life by extra effort or by general exercise but especially such general exercise as i have mentioned in a former chapter i mean moderate labour in the garden or in the field and in housekeeping no spinning on a high wheel which requires not only walking to and fro but also considerable motion of the arms and chest a very bad exercise a great deal may also be done by reading aloud in a proper manner and by conversation and especially by singing i believe that by a proper education of the lungs instead of the modern custom of uneducating them it would be possible in the course of a few successive ages greatly to enlarge the cavity containing them and if this can be done it will be a means of promoting in the same degree the tone and vigour not only of the lungs themselves but also of a whole physical frame and the aggregate gain to our race would be immense let us think of the amazing difference between a race which has been deteriorating in body and mind from generation to generation and at the same time suffering from disease in a thousand forms and one which is not only free from primitive disease but gradually improving both bodily and mentally and in a fair way to go on improving for centuries perhaps thousands of years to come three we have no right to use that dress as a defence which does not answer this purpose so long as we can get that which does provided it answers neither of the other two purposes already mentioned now that are not a great number of articles of clothing worn whose use cannot be justified on these principles does not the greater part of human time and labour which is expended on dress both by the maker and the wearer go to answer other purposes than these is it not expended for mere ornament and is such expenditure right my own conviction is that we are bound as christians and as such i must consider my readers in this favoured country to use that dress and that alone which answers the great purposes of dress and that were the subject viewed in its true and just light all beyond this should be regarded as sinful what i suppose these great purposes of dress are have already been mentioned in short i suppose that our duty is to dress in such a way if our circumstances permit it as will be best for the purposes of merely clothing tempering and defending our bodies that material that quantity and those forms of dress which we suppose best accomplish this should be adopted as far as they are known such a view will of course be opposed by the devotees of fashion but not i think by many of those who know they cannot serve two masters god and mammon or god and the fashions and that it is their duty to devote themselves unreservedly to the worship and service of the former i shall also be opposed by another class the devotees of utility or a species of what i call utilitarianism they will say that i am a utilitarian of the rankest sort that i would destroy all taste all industry all division of labour all commerce and all wealth but is it so is that proved to be a just taste to which the views he presented seem to be opposed 
where is the proof and by whom has it been adduced i am no advocate for a utilitarianism which excludes just taste but i believe our taste to be depraved by the fall no less than our affections that they are not as some suppose free from sin but less sinful perhaps than our moral tastes and preferences i believe that a taste which is not conformed to the nature of things and to the law of god is a perverted taste and that the modern taste in regard to dress and ornament is to a great extent of this description and does there remain no room for industry when personal ornaments are excluded as well might it be said that the exclusion of all drinks but water would strike a death blow at industry is there nothing left for people to do because you take away ornament perhaps indeed if all personal ornament were taken away suddenly it might give a temporary check to industry and seem to conflict with the principle of a division of labour but this cannot happen except it were by miraculous agency the utmost that can be rationally accepted at moment by the most sanguine would be the professing christians should exclude it nor could they as a body be expected to do it at once one here and another there would renounce as wrong what he had been accustomed to think right and this would give society time to adjust itself and preserve its balance as it has been done in the case of every great and important change of public opinion but we are gravely told by several writers on this subject that as a nation's wealth is derived from a division of labour it follows that to deny ourselves all ornament would be a great injury to the community what a strange inference is there nothing for people to do in this world i ask again but to make ornaments or can it be that they form so important a division of human labour that to dispense with them in the only way in which it is possible humanly speaking to do so that is by enlightening the public opinion and appealing to the conscientious is to take away the wealth of the nation i deny most resolutely that mere artificial ornaments make any considerable part of a nation's real wealth that which tends to make us healthier in all the functions of our bodies which develops and improves all the faculties of our mind and which develops and cultivates to the highest possible extent all the good affections of the soul is alone worthy of the name of wealth i do not deny that he who makes two stalks of grain grow where only one grew before is a public benefactor i do not deny that for certain purposes in the arts in architecture especially he who polishes a gem or a block of marble may also be a public benefactor this is a very different thing from preparing and applying ornaments to our persons and may be to some extent useful but i am still assured that those who make a person healthier than before or improve his intellect or are a means of awakening in him a love to god and man and of promoting its growth where it is already awakened are benefactors to the world in a degree infinitely higher and add to its true riches almost infinitely more it is health knowledge and excellence we again say which exalt a nation and these are its true wealth fifteen millions of free men all as healthy as the most perfect specimen which could now be found among us all as wise as the wisest men in the world and all as virtuous and excellent as aristides or howard or benezet or john the beloved apostle himself what a national treasure they would be what a revenue of true wealth they would afford now if fifteen millions of such people would be a source of national wealth before unheard of would not every individual of this whole number be a source of wealth and would not every element which should go to make up the sum total of the excellencies of each individual be a part of this mighty treasure if the richer part of the community have money to spare why should they not spend it in increasing the health the knowledge and the morality of the needy around them by giving employment to those who are capable of promoting these blessings and who want employment it will be said i know that the great multitude of persons around us are not fit for more elevated employments no nor will they be in any considerable numbers until they come to be employed in this way much more frequently than they now are 
let there be an urgent demand in the market for a commodity and it usually comes soon to be abundant let there be a demand for labourers in the mental and moral field in this more elevated garden of the lord and they will ere long be furnished and the more persons there are employed in this way and who consequently come into the habit of fitting themselves to be thus employed the richer will be the national treasury that many young women who read this chapter will wholly lay aside their ornaments and fit themselves as fast as possible for the noble purpose of ornamenting those around them by promoting their physical intellectual and moral well-being can hardly be expected but i do hope that i shall lead a few to expend less of time and money in dressing and ornamenting their persons than heretofore and more in dressing and ornamenting the immortal mind as well as in promoting health of body i cannot but hope to live to see the day when every person who professes the name of jesus christ and not a few who make no professions at all will entertain similar views in regard to the purposes of dress and their own duty in relation to it to those which i have endeavoured to inculcate such a day must surely come sooner or later and i hope that those who believe this will make it their great rule to expend as little on themselves as possible and yet answer the true intentions of the creator respecting themselves there is a very wide difference between spending as much as we can on our persons in the gratification i mean of the wants of our depraved tastes under the specious plea that it encourages commerce and industry and spending as little as we can on ourselves and as much as possible in promoting the health the learning and the piety of ourselves and those around us the former has been tried for centuries with what result let the state of society and our misnamed refinement bear witness let the latter be tried but half as long and the world will be surprised at the results foremost in this work of reform should be our millions of young women they should be so for two reasons first because their influence and responsibilities to coming generations are great and secondly because they are at present greatly involved in the practical error of loving external ornaments too well and of valuing too little the ornaments of a healthy body a sound mind and a good heart i am often pained to hear the reproach cast upon females especially upon the younger of the sex that they are fond of the far-fetched and dear-bought even when they are the less valuable it should not be so they should be above the suspicion of such a weakness what else can be expected however when those who should be the guardians of the public taste and who should as christian citizens strive with all their might to elevate it engage in pandering to the follies not to say the depravities of the age let young women rise above themselves and escape the snares thus laid for them by those who ought to be their guides to the paths of wisdom and virtue and happiness end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by Brea. chapter twenty eight dosing and drugging fallen as human nature a physical nature with the rest now is there are seasons in the life of almost all of us when we are either ill or fear we shall be so and young women as well as others have their seasons of debility and their fears and even their sick days they have their colds their coughs their sick headaches, their indigestions, and their consumptions. Above all, and more frequently by far than almost anything else, they have those undefinable and indescribable feelings of ennui, which, for want of a better name, are called, in their various forms, nervousness. When the unpleasant sensations to which I have just alluded are referred to the region of the stomach, and only produce a few qualms, young women are not in general so apt to take medicine as to eat something to keep down their bad feelings as a bit of seed cake a little fruit some cloves or cinnamon or a piece of sugar this though better than to take medicine is yet a very bad practice 
for although momentary relief is secured in this way it never fails to increase the unpleasant sensations in the end i ought to say somewhere and i know of no better place than this that the habit of eating between our regular meals even the smallest thing whatever is a very mischievous tendency and this for several reasons first the stomach needs its seasons of entire rest but those persons who eat between their meals seldom give any rest to their stomach except during the night secondly eating things in this way injures the general appetite thirdly the habit is apt to increase in strength and is difficult to break fourthly it does not afford relief except for a very short time on the contrary as i have already intimated it increases the trouble in the end this eating of such simple things i have said is quite bad enough but there are errors which are worse such is the habit of taking an extra cup of tea or coffee extra either as respects the number of cups or the strength now tea and coffee and sometimes either of them are very apt to afford like eating a little food a temporary relief indeed the sufferer often gains so long a respite from her sufferings that the narcotic beverage which she takes is supposed to be the very medicine needed and the very one adapted to her case the like erroneous conclusion is often made after using with the same apparent good effect certain hot herb teas yet i repeat it such medicinal mixtures usually perhaps i should say always aggravate the complaint in the end by deranging still more the powers and functions of the stomach and debilitating still more the cerebral and nervous system different and various are the external applications made to the head in these circumstances but all usually with the same success they only produce a little temporary relief the same may be said of the use of smelling bottles containing as i believe they usually do ammonia or hartshorn cologne water camphor etc the manner in which these operate to produce mischief is however very different from that of the former they irritate the nasal membrane and dry it if they do not slowly destroy its sensibility they also in some ways affect seriously the tender brain in any event they ought seldom to be used by the sick or the well nor is this all they are inhaled to irritate and injure the lining membrane of the lungs trifling as it may seem to many i never find that a young woman keeps a cologne bottle in her dressing-room or a smelling bottle about her or perfumes her clothing or is in the habit of eating every now and then a little coriander or fennel or cloves or cinnamon without trembling for her safety persisting long in this habit she will as inevitably injure her brain and nervous system her lungs or her stomach ay and her teeth too as she continues the habit i never knew a young woman who had used any of these things year after year for a long series of years whose system was not already suffering therefrom and if i were fond of giving or receiving challenges i should not hesitate to challenge the whole world to produce a single instance of the kind in the very nature of things it cannot be such persons may tell us they are well when we make an attack upon their habits but take them when off their guard and we hear at times quite a different story in regard to the daily or even the occasional use of the stronger drugs of the apothecary's shop whether this shop is found in the family or elsewhere i would fain hope many of our young women may claim an entire immunity it seems to me to be enough that they should spoil their breath their skin their stomachs and their nerves with perfumes aromatic spices confectionery and the like without adding thereto the more active poisons as laudanum camphor picra antimony etc the mention of the word confectionery in the last paragraph brings to my mind a congregated host of evils which befall young women as the legitimate consequences of its use some may suppose that the class of young women for whom i am writing had little to do with confectionery that they have risen above it would that it were so 
but that it is not many a teacher of young ladies boarding schools female seminaries etc to say nothing of parents might abundantly testify that they are very often the dupes of the quacks and the quackery with which our age abounds or at least that they take many of the pills and cough drops and bitters and panaceas of the day i will not believe much as they err to their own destruction i trust they have not yet sunk so low as this end of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of the Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter twenty nine Taking Care of the Sick. The art of taking care of the sick should be considered an indispensable part of female education. Some of the reasons for this are the following. One. As society now is, there is danger that the number of our young women who fall into a state of indifference, not to say absolute disgust, with the world and with life, will greatly increase unless the sex can be led by an improved course of education to exercise more of that active sympathy with suffering which prompts to assist in relieving it. 2. Nurses of the sick are greatly needed. It not unfrequently happens that good nurses cannot be obtained, male or female, except by going very far in search of them. And yet it would seem that every one must know the importance of good nurses from the prevalence of the maxim, not more prevalent than just. Quote, a good nurse is worth as much as a physician. End quote. What physician has not, again and again, seen all his efforts fail to do any good because not sustained by the labours of a skilful, intelligent, faithful, and persevering nurse? This condition is one of the most trying that can befall him, and yet, trying as it is, it is his very frequent lot. 3. Females are better qualified, other things being the same for attending the sick, than males. They not only have a softer hand and more kindness and gentleness, but they are also more devoted to whatever they undertake, and they have more fortitude in scenes of trial and distress. Their thoughts are, moreover, less engrossed by the cares of business and by other objects than those of our sex. They seem formed for days and months and years of watchfulness, not only over our earliest infancy, but also over our first and second childhood. And it was strange indeed if nature in qualifying them for all this had not qualified them to watch over us during the few short years that intervene. There may indeed be instances, there certainly are some such, where the physical strength of females unaided is not sufficient for the task of which I am speaking. For the most part, however, it is gentleness and patience and fortitude which are most wanted, and in these woman stands preeminent. 4. It is often advantageous to have female assistance in taking care of the sick, because it can be afforded at a much lower rate than that of males. There are females who need the avails of these labours for a livelihood, but not having been trained to them they are not of course employed. Hence there is suffering in both ways. The sick suffer in the loss of the needed help and an indigent woman suffers for want the avails of that labour which she might have been trained to perform. One great advantage of being able thus to obtain female attendance at a cheaper rate is that the sick would be more likely to have the regular attention or at least the general care of the same individual. Thousands and thousands of sick people have died who might have easily recovered had they been able to employ a regular nurse. Where a change of nurses takes place almost every day, no one of them feels that degree of responsibility which it is highly desirable that somebody in this capacity should feel. 5. I have spoken of the necessity of having young women trained in the art of taking care of the sick, that it may open a door to their sympathies. But it should also be done to open the door to their charities. Such charities as the gratuitous attendance of the sick, where it can be afforded, are among the most valuable which can possibly be bestowed. Footnote. 
i mean here to speak only of those charities which go to correct the evils which are in the world for however great the good we may do in spending time and influence in correcting evil the same amount of effort rightly applied must also still do more good in the way of prevention and footnote had we ever so much to give to the sick and distressed it might be misapplied or at least applied in a way we should not approve even if it were spent to procure good attendance are we quite sure our own attendance would not be still more useful is it not always better to do the good ourselves provided we are competent to do it than by proxy especially by employing those who we know little or nothing of if we do all the good we are able to do with our own hands we feel that we have better discharged our duty than if we had first turned our labour into money and then applied the money to the same purpose but how is it possible i shall doubtless be asked that in a healthy community like that of our own new england young women generally can be trained to understand this office there is no great difficulty healthy as we are that is comparatively so we have in every neighbourhood if not in every family ample opportunities for initiating the young into this most indispensable art it is not to be expected nor is it indeed desirable that they should be fully employed or made fully responsible at first there should be a sort of apprenticeship served to this trade as well as to any other indeed i hardly know of an occupation or an art which more demands a long apprenticeship than this but as i was going on to say let young women at a very early age be gradually inducted into the office some young female of their own age perhaps is sick let them solicit their mother and the friends of the disease to permit them to be present a part or all of the time that they may observe and early understand the art of taking care of the sick let the young woman solicit her mother i say because i apprehend as i have done all along that the work of reformation in this matter no less than in others must begin with the young woman she finds herself twelve fourteen or sixteen years of age and entering upon a life involving duties and responsibilities to her before unthought of and for which she finds herself most sadly unprepared she believes in the necessity of self-effort what conscience tells her ought to be done she decides to do she goes forward intelligently and what she begins she resolves if possible shall be finished let it not be objected that the introduction of the young to the sick room will expose them unnecessarily either the contagion or the breathing of bad air for as to contagion there is probably much less of it in the world than many suppose but whether there is less or more danger the best way to do so as the world is now situated is to inure themselves gradually to disease there are in new york and philadelphia many very aged persons who have been employed as professional attendants of the sick during all the visitations of those cities with yellow fever and cholera who have yet never taken either of those diseases it is our fear of taking disease very often which makes us take it the sum total of the danger to the community as a community of contracting even contagious disease will actually be much lessened rather than increased by all our young females being trained in the art and practice of nursing the sick and the same might be said of the danger from bad air because the better the nurse is that is the more thorough and scientifically she understands her profession the more pains will be taken in regard to ventilating both the rooms of the sick and of those who are healthy i know very well to be a complete professional nurse requires a great deal of instruction in anatomy physiology hygiene and chemistry not to say nothing of botany and pharmacy and materia medica but are not females fully competent to all this are they not are they not as much so to say the least as males besides the same information which is so indispensable to a nurse if it should not be much wanted for this person for some females would not be needed as nurses to a great extent would be of inestimable value in the early management of a family what could be more pitiable to see a young widowed mother say twenty-five or thirty years of age in poverty in a situation remote from neighbours 
with three or four children sick from some epidemic disease while she is utterly unacquainted with the best methods of taking care of them let it be supposed still further that she is without a physician and destitute of a nurse excepting herself what is she to do take care of them she cannot as she may honestly tell you never having taken care of a sick person even a near relation for so much as a single day or night in her whole life i was sick and you visited me is represented moreover by the judge of all the earth as one of the grounds not of salvation from sin but a final reward in the world of spirits but can any one believe our saviour here means those empty hollow-hearted visits now so common among us just going i mean to a sick neighbour's door and asking how she does or peradventure stepping in only to stare at the sufferer and with a half-suppressed breath and a sigh to hope to comfort her by wishing she may ultimately recover no such thing the saviour by visiting the sick meant those kind and valuable offices which are worthy of the name especially when performed by the kind and gentle hand of a lovely intelligent benevolent and pious woman o young ladies hadst thou but a glimpse of one half the angelic offices in thy power how wouldst thou labour and pray for those qualities and that education which would enable thee to act up to the dignity of thy nature in the sight of god angels and men how wouldst thou labour to accomplish thy noble destiny End of chapter 29chapter thirty of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by Breer. chapter thirty intellectual improvement much has been said incidentally in the preceding chapters of the importance of extended intellectual improvement besides i have treated at large on this subject in another volume footnote see young wife chapter thirty three page Two ninety two and footnote to which as scarcely less adapted to the condition of, of young women than that of young wives, I must refer the reader. What I have to say in this work will be little more than an introduction to the views there presented. The long agitated question whether a woman is or is not equal to man in capacity for intellectual improvement need not surely be discussed in this place. It is sufficient perhaps to know that every young woman is capable of a much higher degree of improvement than she has yet attained and to urge her forward to do all she can for herself and do it with all her might i have already mentioned in preceding chapters several sources of improvement especially observation and reflection but there are many sources of instruction accessible to those who are willing to be instructed both external and internal some of these will now be made the subject of a few passing remarks. 1. Conversation. It is seldom, if ever, that we meet with an individual of either sex whose conversational powers have been properly directed. To develop, cultivate, and perfect these powers seems hardly to be regarded as a part of education. We have left the tongue like the rest of the frame to which it is attached, and of which it forms a component part to go very much at random in some to be sure it goes quite fast enough and continues on the wing quite long enough but it is too apt to go without rule measure or profit that is comparatively so now to teach the tongue to go as it should to teach it how to go and how long and when and where to make use of its power is not by any means a small matter or a very easy task but ought not all this and much more to be done the old notion that taciturnity is wisdom is now very generally believed to be unfounded these north american indians who are most remarkable for this trait of character are not to be found a whit wiser than the other tribes who are more loquacious and what is found by observation to be true of nations or tribes is equally true of individuals one of the most taciturn persons i ever knew and who passed with many for a very wise man because he was very silent and grave turned out on a more intimate acquaintance to be silent because he had nothing of importance to say nor is loquacity uniformly a mark of wisdom 
Some, indeed, talk a great deal because they have a great deal to say. You will find a few such in a thousand. Others talk incessantly, either because they have nothing else to do, or will do nothing else. They do not, indeed, talk sense, or produce ideas, for sense and ideas they have not. At least, their sense is not common or sound sense, and as for their ideas, they are all superficial or borrowed. Immense is the good which may be done in society by conversation. There is hardly an art or science, the elements of which, to say the least, may not be inculcated orally, that is, by conversation. But it is not necessary that our conversation, in order to be useful, should always be very scientific. There are a thousand topics of interest that have never yet been dignified with the name of science, which might yet be discussed in our familiar circles to a very great extent with both profit and pleasure. When our conversation takes the form of story-telling, it is of still more absorbing interest than when it is confined to mere ordinary colloquy. Here again, a vast field of improvement opens upon our view. Few acquirements are more valuable to a young woman who expects ever to be at the head of a school or a family than the art of relating a story well, and yet, owing to the neglect of this matter in education, no art perhaps is more uncommon. A few leading principles duly attended to will, it is believed, enable those who have already had some teaching on this subject to turn their conversation to better advantage as well as aid in the work of reformation those who have not been duly instructed. 1. We should enunciate correctly and speak distinctly. Few persons do this, and hence much of the pleasure which might otherwise be had is lost. 2. We should endeavour, as far as in us lies, to speak with grammatical correctness. The custom of having two sorts of language, one for composition and the other for conversation, appears to me to have a very ill tendency. I would have no one converse in a language he does not understand, but I would have every one converse correctly. 3. We should endeavour to select such topics as are not only profitable to one party, either ourselves or those with whom we are conversing, but also as are likely to be acceptable. It is of little use to force a topic, however great in our judgment may be its importance. 4. Conversation should be direct, though not confined too long to one point or topic. But while one subject is up, you should know how to keep it up or if the thoughts of either party wander, you should know how to return to it, without too much apparent effort. 5. Conversation, like everything else under the sun, should have its time and place. It is as wrong to converse when we ought to read, or study, or labour, or play, as it is to read or play when we ought to converse. Social life has a great many vacancies, as it were, which good and sprightly and well-chosen conversation should fill up. 6. Conversation should be sprightly. If we converse not in this way, we might almost as well dispense with conversation entirely. We might nearly as well resort to the dead for society, to the dead, I mean, who speak to us through the medium of their works. Of course, I refer to conversation in general. 7. We should remember our responsibilities. For every idle word that men speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, said he, who is to preside at the dread tribunal of which he spake. And an apostle has told us that, quote, a conversation should be in heaven, end quote. That is, as I understand it, should be heavenly in its nature. 2. Reading. There are, as I suppose, few young women of the present day who do not read more or less, and to whom reading is not, in a greater or less degree, a source of intellectual improvement. Their reading is, however, governed chiefly by whim or fancy or accident, or at most by taste. Some read newspapers only, some read only novels, some read everything, and therefore nothing. Each of these methods if methods they can be called, is wrong. But, shall not a young woman be governed by her taste? Is that to be turned wholly out of doors? My reply is, 
that though our taste is not to be turned out of doors wholly it is nevertheless a very imperfect guide and needs correction our intellect like our moral and physical likes and dislikes is as i have elsewhere said perverted by the fall i will not say that our moral intellectual and physical tastes are perverted in an equal degree for i do not think so still there is a perversion greater or less of the whole man in all his functions faculties and affections as a general rule when left to our own course we choose that food for body mind and soul which though it may be pleasant at first is bitter afterwards there is a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof is death end quote. still it may be said if our intellectual tastes are perverted how are they to be set right why not i ask in the same way that our moral taste is by the word and truth of god to the law and to the testimony the application of the doctrines i am now advocating belongs most properly to parents and teachers religious teachers especially parents aided by ministers of the gospel and perhaps the family physician should decide for the young individually what means of intellectual improvement are best for them all things considered what books society studies etc but i must confine my remarks to books and reading it is not difficult to decide what the taste of a child shall be in regard to reading i will not indeed say that a parent may at once do everything she desires but she may do a great deal the child's moral and intellectual tastes are about as fully at her command as its physical ones and who shall say that her power to the latter respect is second to any but that of the creator it is not for parents however that i am now writing but for those whose taste by the aid or neglect of parents is already formed if formed on the basis of the word and truth of god if they are inclined to prefer the best books and reject the worst then all is well but if not then the work of self-education is in this respect to set that right which has hitherto been wrong hardly anything can be of greater importance in this matter than the assistance of a friend in whom we can confide in making a selection this is as necessary in regard to newspapers as to books she who reads newspapers indiscriminately will derive little benefit from them as her head will be filled with such a mixture of truth and falsehood and wisdom and folly as will be likely to do her more harm than good few will read to advantage who do not have their set hours for reading it is true that unforeseen circumstances may at times break in upon our arrangement and impede our progress in knowledge but if we have no arrangement or system at all we shall find our progress impeded still more do not read too much the world is almost deluged with books not only see that your selection is as it should be in regard to the character of the books but beware of having too many of them a few well read and understood will be more valuable the importance of sometimes reading aloud has been mentioned it has other advantages however than merely the exercise of the lungs with a proper monitor at hand it may be made a useful aid in correcting our enunciation as well as in improving our conversational powers reading is but speaking the thoughts of others instead of our own and she is the best reader and indeed most likely to be made wiser by reading who speaks the most naturally our reading should be such generally that a friend in an adjoining room would find it difficult to tell whether we are reading or conversing three composition next conversation and reading as a means of intellectual improvement i place composition this is nothing neither more or less at least it should not be than talking on paper as reading is merely talking over the thoughts of others conversing in another's word so composition is merely conversing with others through the medium of a piece of paper it is a most delightful consideration that it has pleased god to secure to us a written language are we grateful enough for the gift do we think enough of the privilege of conversing in this way with friends in every quarter of the globe 
one of the most valuable kinds of composition is letter writing or epistolary correspondence this above all should be in the style of familiar though well-directed conversation i wish with all my heart that people could get rid of the idea that there should be one style for conversation and another for writing here is the stumbling stone on which youth of both sexes have been stumbling time immemorial and on which i fear many will be likely to stumble for some time to come could they get rid of this strange belief could they perceive most clearly the composition is nothing more than putting our thoughts on paper instead of delivering them by word of mouth and that conversation is nothing less than composition except the words are written as if it were in the air instead of being placed on a sheet of paper how soon would the complaints about the tediousness of composition cease to be heard some young women of sixteen or eighteen or twenty years of age appear to regard letter-writing as childish they talk of having once been so foolish as to be addicted to the practice but as having now outgrown it such persons have no conception of the vast importance of this species of composition as an aid to correct thinking and correct writing the more we think the more and better we are able to think the more we write the more thoughts we have which we wish to put down one valuable form of putting down thoughts next to letter writing consists in keeping a journal i often wonder why our families and schools should encourage almost everything else rather than letter writing and journalizing our familiar letters to familiar friends might often consist of extracts from our daily journals but here again there has been great error journals have usually consisted of the driest details or exteriors of events the young should be encouraged to record their feelings in them their hopes and fears their anticipations and their regrets their joys and their sorrows their repentances and their resolutions such journals with old and young could not fail to advance the intellect even if they should not improve the heart four music attention to music vocal music especially should always form a part of female education the day is gone by as i trust when it was customary to say that none but the gifted could acquire this accomplishment it is now i believe pretty well understood that all persons may learn to sing as well as to read not of course equally well in either case but all can make a degree of progress i have called singing an accomplishment but it seems to me to be much more its bearing upon the health and even upon the intellect is very great even its moral tendency is by no means to be overlooked the value of music to soothe the feelings and cast out the evil spirits which haunt the path of human life has never yet received that measure of attention which deserves even in those parts of continental europe where all the peasants sing and are accustomed to fill the air with their cheerful and harmonious voices as they go forth to prosecute their daily tasks no less than in their families even there i say the full power and value of music are not understood they make it by far too much a sort of sensual gratification let it be redeemed for a better and nobler purpose let it become a companion of science and literature as well as of industry and of virtue and of religion still more than all five lectures and concerts lectures are often useful even when they do more than afford an agreeable means of passing an hour's time they are not indispensable for those young women who love study but are more useful as a means of exciting inquiry in those who have little fondness for it besides there are lectures at times on subjects which cannot be found in books and in such cases they may be specially useful to all as for concerts and parties of all sorts attended as they usually are in the evening there are many objections to them though as society is now regulated it may not be best to denounce them altogether home is the proper place for young women as well as for other honest people after dark at least this ought to be the general rule if lectures concerts etc could be attended in the afternoon 
there would be fewer objections to them even then however there would probably be more or less intellectual dissipation connected with their attendance it is to be regretted that time which is so valuable cannot be better employed than in mere running abroad because others are going six studies if the young woman could have some judicious friend male or female to advise her what books to read and what studies to pursue and if the non-essentials in dress etc were discarded i cannot help thinking that life is long enough to give her an opportunity to become mistress of everything which is usually thought to belong to a good english education i will venture to say that there is hardly a girl of twelve years of age whose circumstances are so unfavourable as to prevent her from thus acquiring the keys of knowledge by the time she is twenty-five years of age could she be directed in a proper manner i have spoken of acquiring the keys of knowledge as if this was the first object of a course of studies and such i regard it i know indeed that we reap some of the fruits of almost all our acquired knowledge immediately still the greater part remains for years to come no young woman should fail to be thoroughly versed in spelling reading writing composition grammar geography and arithmetic and as much as possible in anatomy physiology hygiene chemistry botany natural history philosophy domestic and political economy civil and ecclesiastical history biography and the philosophy of the bible to say nothing of geology and the higher branches of mathematics one word more in regard to your handwriting nothing is more common in these days than to write in a most illegible manner a mere scribble now whatever young men may do in this respect i beseech every young woman to avoid this wretched slovenly habit hardly anything appears more interesting to me in a young woman than a neat delicate and at the same time plain style of handwriting do not pursue too many studies at once it is the most useless thing that can be done your knowledge should you get any would in that way be confused and indefinite instead of being clear and practical useful to you i would never pursue more than one or two leading sciences at the same time and in general i think one is better than more if you pursue more than one let them be such as are related as geography and history let me say in closing this chapter that the great end of all intellectual culture is to teach the art of thinking and of thinking right to learn how to think merely is to rise only one degree above the brute creation to learn to think well however is noble worthy of the dignity of human nature and of the author of that nature End of chapter 30chapter thirty one of the young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this librivox recording is in the public domain read by brea chapter thirty one social improvement were there but a single individual in the wide world that individual with the laws that woman now has to guide her laws internal and external natural and revealed would be susceptible of endless and a limitable improvement she might make advances every day and it would be her duty to do so upward towards the throne of god and towards the perfection of him who occupies it but if much might be done by an individual in a solitary state how much more may be accomplished in the social state in which it has pleased our heavenly father to place us it is difficult to turn our eyes in any direction without being met by numerous and striking proofs of divine wisdom and benevolence but if there be any one thing in the whole moral world short of the redemption by jesus christ which overwhelms me with wonder and leads me to adore more than anything else it is the divine wisdom and benevolence as manifested in the social state allotted to man how interesting how exceedingly so the relation between a mother and a daughter and how many blessings deficient as many mothers are in knowledge and love are showered upon the head of a young woman through maternal instrumentality 
in no case however is this relation more interesting than when the young woman is just beginning to act for herself then if ever should she avail herself of them she knows little of the world before her either of the dangers on the one hand or the advantages on the other of these however the mother knows much that the daughter value her society and good counsel above all else human and lay hold of it as for her life how interesting too the relation between a wise and good father and a virtuous and affectionate daughter i am most struck however with this relation and most reminded of the divine goodness in its institution when i see a daughter ministered to the wants moral and physical of a very aged relative parent or grandparent one who is superannuated or sick there are in civilized society and above all when the rays of the blessed gospel of the son of god have been let in scenes on which angels themselves might delight to gaze and on which i have no doubt they do gaze with the most intense delight would that such scenes were still more frequent would that filial love was always what it should be instead of degenerating into cold formalities how i have been charmed says addison to see one of the most beauteous woman the age has produced kneeling to put on an old man's slipper and so have i it is a sight which revives one's hopes of fallen nature no matter if the infirmities of the parent are the consequences of his own folly vice and crime the same soft hand is still employed day after day and the same countenance is lighted up with a smile being able thus to employ it but when the tenderest love on the part of a young woman in this relation and to the kindest efforts to promote the temporal happiness and comfort of those whom she holds dear is joined a love for the mind and soul when every opportunity is laid hold of with eagerness to inform to improve and elevate and this too though the subject of her labour is the most miserable wreck of humanity of which we can conceive when to works of love are added the warmest prayers at the bedside and elsewhere for almighty aid and favour the interest of the scene is indescribable it needs a more than mortal pen or pencil to portray it there are other relations of society relations of the young woman i mean in particular which are of great importance and interest among these are the relations of brother and sister perhaps i am inclined to make too much of the passage of scripture already noticed in another chapter where cain is said to have been set over abel in the very language which is used to signify the superiority of adam over eve and yet it must mean something there is a mutual dependence between brothers and sisters of every age which should result in continual improvement intellectual moral and religious the duties involved in this relation however will be more especially binding on elder brothers and sisters and as it appears to me above all on elder sisters indeed in this respect it is impossible for me to be mistaken an elder sister is a sort of second mother and she often fulfils the place of a mother oh how important how sacred the trust committed to her keeping i have seen the care of a large family devolve by the death of the mother upon the elder daughter instead of her being disheartened at all i have known her to go forward in the pathway of duty sensible at the same time of her dependence on her heavenly father and not only instruct the other children but train them up in the same degree in the way they should go do you think i respected or loved this young woman the less because she was thus early a housekeeper a matron and a mother do you think i esteemed her the less because exclusive of the common school she had no seminary of instruction her education was a thousand times more valuable than that of the fashionable routine of the schools without the kind of discipline she had a world whose females were all educated in the family schools and especially in the school of affliction and poverty and hardship would be incomparably a better world than one whose young women should wear soft clothing and live in king's courts who should be educated by merely fashionable mothers amid ease and abundance and finished at the institute or the boarding school 
let me not be understood in all this as undervaluing kind mothers and boarding schools and comforts and luxuries even in themselves considered all i mean to discourage is a reliance on them to the exclusion of other things of more importance if we could have the latter in the first place difficulties hardships hard labour and adversities and upon these engraft the former i should like it exceedingly well what i dislike is not ornament in itself but ornament on that which is not worth ornamenting and above all nothing but ornament let every young woman whose eye meets these paragraphs rejoice if she has younger brothers or sisters or even if she has brothers or sisters at all the younger may do something for the older as well as the older much for the younger and if she is without either there are probably other and remoter relatives for whom something may be done i have alluded elsewhere to grandparents there are usually uncles aunts and cousins sometimes in great numbers there is much due to these i know very well that our over-refinement in an over-refined and diseased society says otherwise of late, and that our time is expended more and more, especially that of females, and our own dear selves, to the exclusion of remoter relatives. But this should not be the case. Whether we have brethren or sisters, properly so called, together with other more distant relatives or not, we have brethren and sisters. The world is but a great family, and all are brethren, or ought to be so. We should love all, even our enemies, as brethren, but we should love with the deepest and most enduring affection those who love God most ardently. My mother and brethren are they that hear the word and do it, said the Saviour, and it is only in proportion as we possess his spirit that we shall be found to belong, in the truest sense, to his family. The ties of which I have been speaking in the preceding paragraphs will have but poorly answered their purpose if they have not had the effect to raise us to this universal love referred to by the Saviour. For this they were chiefly instituted, and to this, in the best state of human society, do they tend. They do not lead us to love relations usually so called any less, neither did they have this effect on Jesus but they lead us to love the world at large more. If young women would have the spirit of our Lord and Saviour, or if there would be instruments in his hands of hastening the glad day of his more complete reign on the earth in the hearts of his intelligent family, they must strive to come up to this love of the human family. It is to elevate them to this love, I again say, that the family institution with all the interesting relations which go out of it, was instituted. When it has accomplished this work, though, it will not cease to be valuable in the abstract. It will be less valuable relatively, because it will absorb a smaller proportion of our thoughts and affections, and leave a large proportion for the world in general and its creator. I have quoted elsewhere the sentiments of Addison in regard to the filial affection of daughters. In the same paper, this interesting writer embodies his views on this subject in the character of a young woman by the name of Fidelia, whose devotion to her father he describes as follows. Quote, Fidelia is now in the twenty-third year of her age, but the application of many admirers and her quick sense of all that is truly elegant and noble in the enjoyment of a plentiful fortune are not able to draw her from the side of her good old father. When she was asked by a friend of her deceased mother to admit the courtship of her son, she answered that she had a great respect and gratitude for her for the overture in behalf of one so near to her, but, during her father's life, she would not admit into her heart no value for anything which should interfere with her endeavours to make his remains of life as happy and easy as could be expected in his circumstances. The happy father has her declaration that she will not marry during his life, and the pleasure of seeing that resolution not uneasy to her. End quote. Now, though I am not quite satisfied with the selfishness of the father in this case, nor with the notion of Fidelia, that the particular friendship of another would interfere materially with her filial duties, 
yet i do not undertake to say that there are no cases in which a young woman has the right the moral right to make resolutions not unlike that made by fidelia it does not seem that her resolution to neglect the society of others for the sake of discharging an important filial duty was for a longer period than during the short life of a decrepit old father i have introduced this subject in this place as the preface to a series of remarks on that particular relation which every young woman except perhaps a few who are situated like fidelia ought to be prepared to sustain and to sustain well indeed I consider this to be paramount at a suitable age to every other, and that no duty can, as a general rule, be more obligatory. He who instituted the law of marriage has not yet condescended to say how early or in what circumstances this command must be yielded to or obeyed, but, as a general rule, he expects it to be obeyed in some form or other and at some time or other or to express the views i entertain more correctly i should say that no young woman in ordinary circumstances has the right to resolve to neglect the subject for ever or to say she will never marry she is to consider the command of the creator as obligatory as a general fact on the whole human race she must remember moreover that if it is binding on the whole it must be so on the individuals composing that whole on these principles the education of every young woman should as i think be conducted and if by the neglect of parents masters or guardians it has not been so then it should be the aim of the young woman herself in her efforts at self-education to supply what has been by others omitted some of the items in this work of education have been alluded to not only in the chapter on domestic concerns and in that on economy but elsewhere my purpose at the present time is merely to speak of the selection of a society with reference to a future state of life this is a subject of the highest importance to the happiness present and future of every young woman the marriage relation considered only as a means of completing the education of the parties is one of immense importance but it is of still greater importance in reference to other duties which it involves hence it requires much forethought and reflection let me prevail with you therefore when i urge upon you the following considerations one never think for one moment of the society of any other than a good man whatever may be his intrinsic endowments wit beauty talent rank property or prospects all should be as nothing to you unless his character is what it should be of course i am not encouraging you to look for angelic perfection or purity on this earth but do not make too many allowances on the other hand for frailty a close examination as with the microscope will disclose irregularity and roughness on the most polished or smooth surface how then will that surface appear which is uneven without the microscope if it were possible for your associate for life to come apparently near celestial purity and excellence a closer acquaintance would most undoubtedly convince you that he was of terrestrial origin do the best you can therefore and you will do ill enough two it is not sufficient however that the friend you seek should be good that is negatively so he must do good multitudes in these days pass for good men because they do no harm or because at most they maintain a good standing and are benevolent in the eye of the world i know of more than one person in the world who gives his property by thousands annually and whose praise is in all the churches who never yet gave anything worth naming in his life if the gospel rule on the subject is to be the correct one that the widow who of her penury casts into the treasury two mites in reality casts in more than all they of their abundance bestowed large and liberal sums let your associate therefore be a doer of good in deed and in truth this is said however with the supposition that you are so yourself for if i have not already convinced you that the great end for which 
you are sent into the world is to do good, I shall not expect to do so by any remarks which could be thrown in here. If you are still out of the way, it is to be feared you will remain so, nor shall I expect you, for reasons to be seen presently, to seek the society of those who do not possess the same turn of mind. 3. It is highly desirable that the individual with whom you associate for life should be something more than merely a good man. This, however, does not explain my meaning, for are there not many of the most excellent persons in the world whom you would not willingly take for a daily companion? Do you not desire likeness in opinion, taste, purpose, etc.? Might not the two very best persons in the world be unhappy in each other's constant society if they were exceedingly unlike each other? In the establishment, then, of this interesting relation, seek by all means an individual who appears to entertain views of social life as much as possible like your own. Does he find his happiness in going abroad or in lounging? Is he impatient in the society of children? Is he a great friend of parade and excitement? And do you the reverse of all this? Do you love most the quiet and retirement of home, and to be surrounded by infancy and childhood? Do you dread, above almost all things in the world, excitement and parade? Does your friend hate nothing so much as his own thoughts and reflections? Does he dread also, like the cholera or the plague, all efforts at mental or moral improvement? Does he hate improving conversation, and above all, those books and associates which have the improvement and elevation of the body and spirit for their great and leading object? And have you a different taste, entirely so? Do you live, do you eat, drink, sleep, wake, exercise, dress, labour, play, converse, read and think, and pray you may become wiser and better and holier? In short, is the ultimate object of the one the gratification of self, and does all with him terminate in the external, while the other seeks primarily in all things the improvement, the holiness and the happiness of herself and others? How can such persons be suitable companions for each other? Can two walk together, says the scripture, unless they are agreed? That is, agreed as to the main points and purposes of life? I know of no being whom I so much pity as a young woman who, believing perhaps that a reformed rake, once handsome, or it may be a wit, makes the best companion, becomes chained for life to a stupid, shiftless creature one whose energies of body and soul are exhausted and seems unsusceptible of being renovated or restored, one, too, with whom, in that more intimate acquaintance which time and circumstances afford her, proves to be totally unworthy of her hand or her heart. I have said that I know of no being more pitiable than a young woman thus situated. I know of none, I mean to say, except a young man in similar circumstances. Did the effects of these unhappy companionships terminate on themselves, the misfortune would not be so great. Woman, at any rate, for a fortitude might endure it. But it is not usually so, and here is the great evil. Misery is inflicted on a new generation, one that has done nothing to deserve it. Let me entreat my readers, therefore, while I urge them to regard the companionship of which I am now speaking as a matter of duty, to be exceedingly careful in the selection of a companion. Choose, but do not be in haste. On the wisdom of your choice, much more depends than you can now possibly imagine. It is for your life. Would you could realize this truth. For though so old, and often so repeated, that it may appear rather stale, it is not less true for its age. Have nothing to do, above all, with those who despise your sex. There is a large number of young men, much larger indeed than you may be aware, who have caught the spirit, not to say the sentiments, of Byron in regard to woman. They have caught them, I say, but this, perhaps, is not so. I will only say they have them. I know not how, as a general fact, they came by them. I can only say that they are often very early bibed and that they grow with their growth and strengthen with their strength. 
would to heaven this utter scepticism in regard to female worth and purity could be removed or rather prevented it is the bane of social life as i could show were i disposed to do so by a thousand illustrations as a general rule to which perhaps there are some exceptions it is according to human nature to suspect others to be wanting in those virtues which we are conscious we are wanting in ourselves find a person wanting in sterling integrity and he is the very person to be found complaining of the want of it in others i will not say that his complaints are not sometimes indeed quite too often just i only say that whether just or not neither his suspicions nor complaints prove them to be so beware then i beseech you beware of the young man who is ever prating about the innate worthlessness not to say vice of your sex i do not say reject him forever simply on suspicion for that would be to go to the other extreme but though i have admitted that there may possibly be exceptions in regard to the general rule i have laid down i also insist that they are rare therefore i again say be wary in forming your friendships and especially so in suffering them to become more and more intimate precisely in these circumstances it is that you may regard immense benefit from a discreet female friend but in this too you must be deliberate and use great judgment for there are many whose views on these subjects are such as entirely to disqualify them for the office of an adviser i remember hearing a lady of great gravity though of much good sense in all other respects say that she thought the friends of a young woman were much more competent to select a companion for her than she was to make the selection for herself i was so struck with the remark that not knowing but i misapprehended her meaning i ventured to inquire whether she really meant to say that other people could judge better in regard to selecting a companion for life than the parties most concerned in the choice to which she answered yes without hesitation and immediately went upon a defence of her opinion i was as little pleased however with the defence as with the assertion for the whole thing carried absurdity on the very face of it it cannot surely be so it is contrary to the very nature of things i cannot help counselling you to be as wary of such an adviser as of the friend to whom she would direct your attention the choice the final choice be it never forgotten rests on you because on you rests the responsibilities while therefore you seek with great earnestness for advice seek it is advice only neither seek nor admit in any case a dictator be it also ever remembered that it is your duty to sift with great care the opinions and views of one in whom you are daily becoming more and more deeply interested if it be even true that woman is not distinguished for perseverance let this fact only stimulate you to use what powers of perseverance you possess though you are not to be held responsible for the exercise of talents which you have not you are to account for what talents you have and fearful may be the reward of the individual who is found delinquent in the matter before us fearful in this life even were it possible to escape punishment in the life to come let a comparison then be faithfully made of your views on all important subjects as female superiority or inferiority selfishness and benevolence dress and equipage education of ourselves and others discipline its means instruments and ends household management amassing property the chief end of human existence particular duties etc while i would encourage every young woman to look forward to married life as a matter of duty i am very far from desiring to encourage that indiscriminate conversation which among young women is rather common let it be discussed by the young chiefly in the company of their parents above all let not females be found talking with great interest on this subject in the presence of the other sex such conversation in such circumstances is evil and only evil in its tendency parents may prevent this mistake in young women if they will the mother at least can prevent it when mothers manage the matter as it ought to be managed you will not find daughters on going into company 
so deeply interested in these matters that nothing seems to loosen the tongue light up the countenance and brighten the eye as conversation about the latest engagements and marriages and nothing so much or so quickly interests them in a newspaper even a religious one and that too on the sabbath as a list of marriages alas do mothers or daughters know what are the practical common sense inferences from this conduct where it greatly abounds remember moreover in this matter as well as in all other matters which concern your own happiness and the happiness of others in this matter i might say which concerns your happiness more than almost all others to seek the direction of that being who has said if any lack wisdom let him ask of god you cannot surely obey this first injunction on the human race without first and always at every step of your course seeking for his approbation you cannot in one word be concerned in a duty which may involve the destinies present and eternal of millions and millions of human beings without looking upward towards the throne of god and soliciting with all the humility as well as confidence of the most devoted child of an earthly parent that wisdom and guidance which are to be found in all fullness in the father of light and which when properly apprehended can never mislead you end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two is a young woman's guide to excellence by william a alcott this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Brea. Chapter 32. Moral Progress. After so all I have said of the importance of physical, intellectual, and social improvement and progress, it is moral progress for which we were preeminently created. The great end of Christianity itself, to use the words of learned and eloquent divine, is to make men better than they were before but whether or not this expresses the entire truth one thing is certain that wherever christianity fails to make man better it fails of accomplishing its whole intention respecting him perhaps the apostle expressed the idea i would inculcate in the fewest words and in the clearest manner when he required his converts to quote, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and saviour jesus christ End quote mere physical improvement or even physical perfection were it attainable would hardly be worth the pains if it were anything more than a means to an end you might study the subject of health and practise its excellent rules with the utmost zeal and faithful conscientiousness and yet it would hardly prove a blessing to us if it only gave us some more efficiency in the service of the world the flesh and the devil and the same or nearly the same may be said of intellectual improvement and progress there is a general tendency of both when conscience is properly trained and the heart set right is beneficial yet it is not necessarily so without a right heart and correct conscience satan is not wanting so to speak in intelligence or physical energy physical and intellectual development and progress therefore a little more than means to secure an end if they prove to be what it was the original intention of the creator they should be they are eminently conducive to our highest interests both as respects this world and the world which is to come if otherwise they do but accelerate and in the end aggravate our doom they tend but to make our condemnation the more sure and the more dreadful i have urged elsewhere the importance of conscientiousness in everything we do let me especially recommend you to make continual progress in excellence or holiness the matter of conscience do not be continually measuring yourself above all your spiritual self by your neighbours if you are the true disciple of christ and if you are what a christian should be in this land of christianity you will not indulge yourself in comparisons with any but the saviour himself you will be daily and hourly striving to possess more and more of his spirit in the belief that without the spirit of christ you neither are nor can be his it is painful to think of the great number of individuals who go through life 
often through a long life, and yet accomplish so little for themselves and others, that they are free from outward immorality or blame, as much so at least as their neighbours seems to satisfy them. Some of the best families I know are trained in this way. They are excellent people. They are disciples of Christ, if there are any such in the world. We cannot say aught against them if we would. They seem to discharge all the external duties of our holy religion with a most scrupulous exactness, and they seem, the whole family, to bear the image of Christ. Whatever is true or lovely is theirs, or appears to be so. And yet, if you examine closely the matter, you will find that much of all this is the result of circumstances. They possess, by inheritance, a happy temper, or they are in circumstances which make virtue easy to them. But the spirit and genius of Christianity require a great deal more than mere inoffensiveness, though that is of itself certainly a great deal. They require continual progress from glory to glory. But this progress can only be made amid self-denial and cross-taking. Quote, Whoso taketh not up his cross, end quote, daily and hourly, is not a true disciple of the great teacher. It is even through much tribulation only that we can enter into the kingdom of our Lord and Saviour. Now, to what self-denials, what tribulations, what taking up of the cross do these easy, lovely families of which I am speaking ever subject themselves? Trained happily, they are generally healthy, and therefore they have few trials from sickness. They live in the midst of abundance, and always have done so, abundance of food, clothing, etc., and what they regard as of the best quality. And of what they regard as of the best quality. They have more than heart can wish. Their eyes, as it were, stand out with fatness. They know nothing of want. They know nothing even of inconvenience, except for some hapless moment, when a neighbour gets a little ahead of them in the fashion of their dress, their equipage, or their tables. That a feeling of envy, peradventure, a half-expressed feeling of detraction, appears to mar for a short time their peace. I have said that these inoffensive people, these do-no-harm Christians, know nothing of want. When and where have they cut themselves short of anything to which they were lawfully entitled for the sake of doing good to others? They have indeed performed works of charity and mercy as much as other people, of their own property and standing in society. But they have given always of their abundance. They have never given as to impoverish the giver, so as to make themselves feel the least privation. They have visited the sick, but when has the time they have given seriously incommoded them? Have they not had time enough left for their own purposes? Have they not, in this respect, given of their abundance? Perhaps they have clothed the poor to some extent, but have they denied themselves to do it? Have not their closets and houses and the neighbouring livery stable been well furnished and supplied notwithstanding? Have they not given, in this respect, wholly of their abundance, and not, like the good woman mentioned in the gospel of their penury? It is exceedingly painful, I say again, to find professedly good people among us living, as Watts calls it, at such a poor dying rate, the professed disciples of a master who became poor for their sake, by giving up not only the luxuries of life, but even many of its necessities, and yet not giving up or denying themselves a single thing all their lives long. Can such people expect to make advances in holiness, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, and yet not act like Him or follow Him? For, be it always remembered, the benefits of doing good are to those who do it more than to those to whom it is done. This is the ordination and arrangement of providence. Quote, it is more blessed to give than to receive. End quote. How sad a mistake, then, is made by those who seem, from their conduct, to think there is little happiness in giving, and that their charities abridge by so much their happiness instead of adding to it. Young woman, should it be your lot to belong to one of these happy and excellent families, for I do not deny they are among our best people, after all, though they are very far from having as yet come up to the self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit of the Lord that bought them and become willing to be poor, and to suffer not a little want of time, money, etc., for even their own apparent necessities, temporal or spiritual, I say, if in the providence of God, 
you have been accustomed to see almost the whole time and labour of a family with the avails of a handsome or at least respectable property used up year after year by that family in eating and drinking and sleeping and dressing comfortably in mere passive enjoyment in one word while the blessedness of active enjoyment in the doing good to others has hardly been known be it yours to break the chain that binds this circle of selfishness and go forth to the work of impoverishing yourself as did your lord and master think not to make any considerable moral progress otherwise the soul must have food as well as the body this continual indulgence of the body while the soul is unfed or only fair just enough to keep it from starving will never do for you if you yield to the influence of this fashionable kind of excellence and strive not to rise higher i will not say that you will live to little purpose but i will say that you will have but very little of real valuable immortal life till you pass beyond the bounds of time and space whereas you ought to begin your heaven here for quote, this is the will of god even your sanctification end quote. and it was the prayer of paul concerning some to whom he wrote quote, the god of peace sanctify you wholly end quote. will you not then o young woman in view of these considerations Seek for deliverance from the spell that bounds thousands and millions of otherwise good people to a narrow, selfish circle in which they continually wander, coming round and round again, every night to the same spot, or nearly the same, but making no considerable progress. Will you not study and labour and pray for more and more the spirit of him who not only strips himself of every glory to which he had been accustomed, but instead of attaining that which was his divine right deprived himself of everything which is calculated to make life comfortable in the common sense of the term and only sought his happiness in perfecting holiness in the fear of god by living and dying for his brethren the whole human family will you not henceforth study to be more and more conformed to the divine image to act less and less in conformity with a world whose predominating motive to action is selfishness. End of chapter 32 End of The Young Woman's Guide to Excellence by William A. Alcott I hope you enjoyed my reading.